Edwin's mind was consumed with thoughts of Roman Dimitri, a figure whose existence seemed to transcend the realms of possibility. He found himself pondering a hypothetical scenario. If he could turn back time, could he have prevented Roman's relentless advance? However, Edwin quickly dismissed this notion as fanciful. His actions had led to the catastrophic downfall of the Hector Kingdom, plunging it into an abyss of despair from which it seemed there was no escape. The weight of responsibility bore heavily on Edwin's shoulders as he contemplated the consequences of his decisions. The memory of Kellen's death haunted Edwin. Kellen had perished in Edwin's stead, a grim reminder of the toll his choices had exacted upon those he cared about. It was a stark realization that the kingdom now faced its darkest hour, a situation exacerbated by Edwin's own actions. Yet, amidst the despair, Edwin felt a flicker of determination. He knew he could not simply abandon his people to their fate. As Edwin grappled with his inner turmoil, he became acutely aware of the eyes that looked to him for guidance and salvation. The people of the Hector Kingdom, in their hour of need, turned to Edwin as their beacon of hope. He could not bear to disappoint them, nor could he afford to succumb to despair. Suddenly, Edwin was roused from his thoughts by the sound of voices around him. Jackson and Butler stood before him, their expressions grave as they delivered news of the passing days. A week had slipped by since any word had been heard regarding the war, and the silence had only served to deepen the kingdom's sense of foreboding. The news from Cairo only added to their despair, with reports of the infamous Demon of Cairo wreaking havoc upon Hector soldiers and claiming the life of Knight Order Captain Butler himself. It was a devastating blow, a reminder of the cruel realities of their world. The people of Hector, reeling from the news, began to question their place in a world teeming with unseen dangers. They felt like insignificant beings, mere frogs in a well, unaware of the monsters lurking beyond their limited perspective. It was a sobering realization, one that filled them with a sense of profound unease. Amidst the chaos, Edwin found himself standing before his father, the King of Hector, in the grand halls of the palace. The king expressed concern for Edwin's well-being, acknowledging the burden placed upon his son's shoulders. Yet, he reassured Edwin that he would not sacrifice his son's life to solve the kingdom's problems. Edwin, in turn, apologized for any distress he had caused and shared his concerns about the ominous omen spotted in one of the villages. As Edwin surveyed the once thriving land, now tainted by an ominous black hue, and witnessed life itself wilting away, he couldn't shake the feeling that this was the work of a malevolent force, a curse conjured by a necromancer. The gravity of his words struck the king with astonishment, prompting Edwin to delve deeper into his unsettling revelation. Edwin postulated that the recurring famines tormenting the Hector kingdom were not mere acts of nature, but rather a deliberate orchestration by a mysterious figure. This malevolent force, as Edwin described it, wielded dark magic capable of influencing and afflicting the entire kingdom for years. The king, grappling with the implications of Edwin's revelation, sought clarification on whether this force had manipulated Hector into launching an assault on Cairo. Edwin confirmed the king's suspicion, detailing how the hidden instigator deliberately fanned the flames of war between Hector and Cairo for personal gain. The revelation underscored the severity of the situation, leaving both Edwin and the king to confront the unsettling reality that their kingdom had become a pawn in a sinister game. The king, recognizing the complexity of dispelling a curse that had entrenched itself across the entire kingdom, noted that Hector would need the services of an archpriest, a resource they could no longer afford. Edwin, however, recalled a pivotal moment from his past. He recounted how, in his youth, the tower master of the heavenly palace had offered him a deal, relinquish his title as prince and join the magic tower in exchange for any desire. In a moment of revelation, Edwin discloses his intention to trade his time to serve the enigmatic magic tower of the heavenly palace. The king's reaction is one of astonishment, his brows furrowing in concern. With a demeanor of utmost seriousness, Edwin meets his father's gaze and explains that committing to this path for a duration of a year is the only viable solution to resolve the pressing issue faced by Hector. Edwin's commitment to finding a solution, even at the cost of personal sacrifice, reflected his unwavering dedication to the well-being of his people. Meanwhile, at the Southern Training Camp, Mac Burney grappled with his own fate. Despite his desire to meet his end on the battlefield, the harsh reality of his lost arm cast a shadow of doubt on his prospects. It was in this contemplative moment that Roman, an unexpected figure, approached Mac Burney. Roman cut straight to the point, posing a proposition that could alter the course of Mac Burney's destiny. Join Dimitri. Mac Burney, appreciative yet pragmatic, acknowledged his gratitude for the offer but couldn't overlook the physical hindrance of his missing arm. 
MacBurney stood before Roman, his doubts weighing heavily upon him. As a man who had lost his arm, he couldn't shake the feeling of being a liability rather than an asset to Roman's cause. He voiced his concerns aloud, questioning what use he, a crippled swordsman, could possibly be to someone like Roman. There was a fear gnawing at him, a fear that he would only hold Roman back in their endeavors. To MacBurney's surprise, Roman's response was not one of dismissal, but rather a knowing smile. He remarked that MacBurney's words didn't sound like a rejection to him. Instead, they seemed to hint at an underlying willingness, a spark of potential that Roman was quick to recognize. It was then that Roman shared a tale from the annals of history, the story of the legendary left-handed swordsman named Song Beck. Despite once serving as a royal bodyguard, Song Beck's life took a drastic turn when he lost his right arm in service to his country during wartime. Despite being showered with wealth and honor by the imperial family, Song Beck found himself unable to adapt to a life of peace. Instead, he harbored a burning desire to die as a true martial artist, to meet his end on the battlefield rather than in the comforts of civilian life. Determined to honor his warrior spirit, Song Beck embarked on a rigorous journey of self-discovery. He spent years training with his remaining arm, mastering the art of left-handed swordsmanship through sheer determination and relentless practice. With time, he developed a unique fighting style characterized by his slanted body orientation and irregular attack patterns. What others perceived as weaknesses, Song Beck transformed into strengths, using his unorthodox techniques to overcome formidable opponents in countless duels. Despite his prowess, Song Beck's journey ultimately led him to a fateful encounter with another skilled swordsman named Beck Jung Hyuk. In a climactic showdown, Song Beck met his end at the hands of his formidable adversary, fulfilling his lifelong quest to die as a martial artist on the battlefield. Roman's recounting of Song Beck's tale held a profound significance for MacBurney. It served as a beacon of hope, a testament to the indomitable spirit of warriors who refused to surrender to their circumstances. Inspired by the story, Roman made MacBurney an offer that would change the course of his destiny forever. With unwavering determination, Roman pledged to teach MacBurney the art of left-handed swordsmanship. Moreover, he promised to utilize MacBurney's skills and talents to their fullest potential, surpassing any expectations that MacBurney might have harbored. It was a gesture of trust and camaraderie that resonated deeply with MacBurney, filling him with a newfound sense of purpose and belonging. In that moment, MacBurney felt a surge of hope coursing through his veins. He realized that Roman could be the salvation he had been seeking, the catalyst for his redemption as a warrior. Determined to prove his worth and reclaim his identity, MacBurney bowed before Roman and swore his allegiance to him. Amidst a whirlwind of change, figures like Edwin Hector, MacBurney, and the underestimated Henry Albert found themselves swept along. Henry couldn't help but feel overwhelmed by the sheer presence of Sir Roman, a figure he had weathered hardships with. He wondered why Roman couldn't have taken him along for the journey. Upon returning to the Albert territory, Henry anticipated a life of adulation from the locals. However, his expectations were shattered when he realized they celebrated his return as a hero of Cairo, despite his negligible role in the war against Hector. Merely being in Roman's company during the conflict elevated Henry's status significantly. To Henry's astonishment, an invitation from the Cairo Royal Academy arrived, requesting him to lecture on his experiences at the southern front line. Viewing this as a chance to enhance his reputation, Henry eagerly accepted. He recognized that by praising Roman's virtues, he could boost his own standing among the nobility. As Henry embarked on his mission to spread Roman's renown, he found himself at a critical juncture in his seemingly insignificant noble life. Meanwhile, in Cairo's capital, Roman prepared to depart for Dimitri. A crowd gathered to bid him farewell, a testament to his burgeoning influence. Roman contemplated his next steps, knowing that upon his return to the capital, he would face pivotal decisions. Until then, he resolved to consolidate his power by pacifying the northeastern region, laying the groundwork for his eventual showdown with the central government. As Roman traversed through a forest en route to Dimitri, he stumbled upon a group of distressed farmers, their tear-streaked faces telling tales of ruined fields. Curious, Roman turned to Chris, seeking an explanation for their plight. Chris speculated that these individuals were likely farmers from the Dimitri territory. Roman questioned why they were in Conrad territory, prompting Chris to explain that Dimitri lacked sufficient cultivatable land, compelling some farmers to lease plots in Conrad territory. Learning this, Roman insisted on speaking with the farmers himself, eager to understand the details of their situation. As they approached, the farmers recounted a troubling ordeal, 
Despite having a 10-year lease agreement with the Conrad family, they were abruptly ordered to vacate the land just a week before the anticipated harvest. When they refused, Conrad agents destroyed their crops. The farmers pleaded their case to Roman, highlighting the injustice of being denied the opportunity to reap the fruits of their labor. Chris shares with Roman his understanding of the farmer's unfortunate situation, acknowledging its gravity. However, he gently underscores Roman's constrained role in offering direct assistance. Chris elaborates on the intricate dynamics, highlighting that the land leased by the farmers is under the ownership of the Conrad family. He emphasizes the potential ramifications, cautioning that any intervention could potentially exacerbate tensions between the two families, thus complicating matters further. Chris elaborates further, highlighting that the Conrad family has forged a crucial alliance with the nobles of the northeastern region. He describes this alliance as a collective effort, where several smaller groups have come together, resembling a protective fence. These groups, while individually not large, unite to shield each other from external threats. Chris draws a comparison, likening their collaboration to that of a bat, relying on mutual support for survival. Upon hearing this, Roman expresses concern, emphasizing to Chris that failure to take action could exacerbate the problem. Recognizing the need for action, Roman emphasized the importance of addressing the root cause of the issue before the Conrad family's power grew unchecked. Despite the risks involved, he was determined to confront the injustice and restore fairness to the farmers. As per the hierarchical structure, it falls upon the subordinate to abide by their superior's decisions. Therefore, Chris concurs with Roman. As they ventured into Dimitri territory, Chris fell into agreement with Roman's decision, recognizing the traditional obligation of subordinates to follow their lord's lead. Upon their arrival, Roman was greeted with fervent enthusiasm from the Dimitri people, who hailed him as the hero of Cairo and the pride of their land. Roman's father, Romero Dimitri, welcomed him with open arms, expressing his joy at seeing his son return. Roman, in turn, inquired about his father's well-being, prompting Romero to reassure him that all was well in Dimitri and that he had prepared a grand celebration to mark Roman's homecoming. However, before festivities could ensue, Roman requested a private audience with his father to address a pressing matter. They retreated to Romero Dimitri's office, where Roman broached the topic of the farmers in Conrad territory. Romero acknowledged his awareness of the situation but lamented the inevitability of the Conrad family reclaiming their land. He cautioned against interference, citing potential repercussions for the farmers' future prospects in Conrad territory. Roman, adopting a grave demeanor, posed a hypothetical scenario, questioning whether the outcome would differ if Dimitri were aligned with the influential Benedict family instead. He proposed that Marquis Benedict's formidable authority would serve as a deterrent against any encroachment on their land. With the recent decline of the Barco family, Roman asserted that Dimitri now stood as one of the strongest factions in the northeastern region. While acknowledging the validity of Roman's perspective, Romero urged caution, emphasizing the importance of maintaining harmonious relations with neighboring factions. He advised against needlessly provoking conflict with their allied forces, stressing the significance of avoiding unnecessary entanglements. Roman approached his father with a determined air, adamant that action was necessary. He argued that Dimitri held true power in the northeastern region, a fact overshadowed by the complacency and arrogance of the Conrad family and other nobles. To them, Dimitri was merely another family, lacking the protection of a formidable entity like the central government as the Barco family once enjoyed. Consequently, the Conrad family's disregard for Dimitri's farmers was evident. With a furrowed brow, Roman pressed his father for his thoughts on this discrepancy. Despite the Conrad family's claims that Dimitri was the strongest in the region, their actions suggested otherwise. It was time, Roman asserted, for Dimitri to assert its dominance and prove to the Conrad family who truly held sway in the northeastern territories. Roman further elaborates to his father emphasizing that Dimitri holds both the power and the moral justification to come to the aid of their citizens. He questions why Dimitri is standing idly by while the Conrad family tramples upon their people's rights. Roman passionately implores his father to grant him the authority to take action, assuring him that he is prepared to shoulder the burden. He pledges to be the one to execute any necessary measures, even if it means getting his hands stained with blood. Later that day, the scene transitions to Dimitri seated in his chair deep in thought, pondering over Roman's words to Romero. He couldn't help but acknowledge Roman's growth, remembering the days when his son had toiled alongside him as a farmer. There was a soft spot in Romero's heart for Roman, 
born from their shared experiences. Perhaps, Romero mused, Roman's current demeanor was a response to being labeled a lesser noble. Deep in thought, Romero realized that what the Dimitri territory needed wasn't just power, but wise leadership decisions. Roman's impassioned plea signaled the dawn of a new era for Dimitri, one where the strength of character and strategic thinking would guide them forward. Days later, the Dimitri palace buzzed with activity as the family hosted a lavish party to welcome Roman back. Nobles from all corners of the northeastern region, including the esteemed Volt and Grizel families, gathered to pay their respects and offer congratulations. In the realm of nobility, acknowledgement of power often takes precedence over recognition of leadership. Such was the case in the northeastern region, where Dimitri's authority was disregarded by other noble families despite its undeniable influence. Amidst this dynamic, a chance encounter brought Lady Sophia of the Grizel family to Roman's attention. Recollecting their previous interaction, Roman recognized her, though he noticed a shift in Sophia's demeanor, suggesting she viewed him differently now. A notion that subtly lingered in her mind as she contemplated the prospect of marrying someone of Roman stature. The ambience altered once again as Viscount Conrad made his entrance, extending his respects to Roman, whom he hailed as the hero of Cairo. However, Roman's response to Conrad's greeting carried a weighty tone, as he introduced himself not just as Roman but as Roman Dimitri, a declaration infused with the pride and authority of his family name. Conrad, in turn, acknowledged Roman's impressive triumph over Butler, a renowned swordsman, expressing astonishment at Roman's youthfulness juxtaposed with his extraordinary achievements. He envisioned Roman's potential to ascend to even greater heights within the ranks of warriors, a sentiment echoed by many present. Yet, Roman's demeanor shifted subtly as he took control of the conversation, surprising Conrad with his perceptiveness, which defied the expectations typically associated with his humble origins. Conrad couldn't help but acknowledge Roman's acumen, recognizing the sharpness of his mind despite his commoner upbringing. He graciously encouraged Roman to pose any question he desired, unaware of the profound impact his response would have on the gathering. With unwavering resolve, Roman seized the opportunity to confront Conrad regarding his unilateral actions against the farmers of Dimitri, questioning the rationale behind the confiscation of their lands, a query that reverberated through the room, leaving those present stunned by its audacity. Conrad, caught off guard by Roman's boldness, attempted to justify his actions by citing the lucrative offer made by a merchant for the disputed lands. However, Roman's disappointment was palpable as he condemned Conrad's callous disregard for the livelihoods of the farmers, emphasizing the gravity of the situation amidst the festive atmosphere. As the tension lingered, Conrad sought to redirect the conversation, emphasizing his presence at the gathering to extend congratulations to Roman and partake in the festivities. Conrad, visibly perturbed, reminded Roman that the gathering was intended to celebrate his return, not to tarnish Conrad's reputation in front of their peers. Feeling slighted by Roman's actions, Conrad's facade of congeniality wavered, his smile replaced by a mask of discomfort. Conrad, eager to extricate himself from the situation, made a move to depart, only to be halted by Roman's firm command. Roman's tone left no room for negotiation as he cautioned Conrad against leaving abruptly, hinting at potential repercussions for Dimitri should Conrad choose to escalate the situation. With a commanding presence, Roman demanded Conrad's presence before him once more, unwilling to let the matter rest until it was addressed to his satisfaction. In the midst of the gathering, Viscount Conrad's utterances reverberated through the room, leaving an air of frustration in their wake. Visibly irked by the unfolding exchange, Viscount Conrad turned sharply towards Roman, delivering a spirited retort. He insisted that, although he had indeed driven away the farmers inhabiting the Dimitri territory, that particular expanse of land was unequivocally the rightful domain of the Conrad family. In his eyes, he was merely reclaiming what was inherently theirs, an act justified by the familial connection to the contested soil. Furthermore, Viscount Conrad made it clear that the Conrad family, not being subservient to the Dimitri, bore no obligation to seek Roman's approval or report their actions. This declaration, laden with familial pride and territorial entitlement, hung heavily in the room. The sentiment found resonance among other nobles present, who voiced their agreement in a chorus of supportive murmurs. Amidst the growing tension, the suggestion surfaced that Baron Romero Dimitri should take the reins and orchestrate a meeting to mediate the escalating discord between the two families. The nobles, questioning the appropriateness of Roman intervening, reminded him that the gathering was meant to be a celebration of his return, 
not a platform for territorial disputes. The implicit inquiry lingered. What right did Roman possess to arbitrate on this issue? In response, some nobles went a step further, emphasizing the position of Viscount Conrad as the head of the Conrad household, asserting that he deserved due respect. They admonished Roman for addressing Viscount Conrad in what they deemed an unruly manner, considering his familial standing. Roman contemplated whether the nobles would react similarly if the roles were reversed, envisioning a scenario where the Dimitri family were replaced by the Barco family. In his estimation, such a reaction would never materialize. He attributed this to the prevailing perception among countryside nobles, particularly those in the northeastern region, who historically regarded the Dimitri family as easily manipulable and subject to coercion. Roman faced a critical decision, whether to wield his authority to bring these nobles in line or to tread the path of coercion, transforming them into obedient subordinates of the Dimitri family. Contemplating these choices, he resolved to assert his intentions unequivocally. Stepping forward, Roman positioned himself squarely in front of Viscount Conrad, his gaze unwavering. With a measured tone, Roman addressed the heart of the matter. He questioned the ethics of one territory asserting dominance over the citizens of another, emphasizing the principles that govern the relationships between territories within the Cairo kingdom. He laid claim to the farmers disturbed by Conrad's actions, branding them as his people who dwelled within the Dimitri territory, dutifully paying taxes to Dimitri and pledging their unwavering loyalty. The atmosphere crackled with tension as Roman questioned the propriety of maintaining formalities while addressing Viscount Conrad. The Viscount's stunned expression betrayed his surprise at Roman's directness. Roman pressed on, revealing that the issue at hand had already undergone internal discussion within the Dimitri household. Furthermore, he asserted that Baron Romero had granted his approval for Roman to take charge of resolving the incident. There was no intention on Roman's part to sweep the matter under the rug. Viscount Conrad's disbelief was palpable in the air. Undeterred by Viscount Conrad's reaction, Roman persisted, pointing out the apparent reluctance of the Viscount to offer any form of apology. His words echoed throughout the gathering, commanding the attention of all present. Roman's warning reverberated. Any transgressions by individuals from other territories within Dimitri's domain would be met with swift and severe repercussions. With a wry smile, Roman challenged those who had previously criticized his stance, daring them to now downplay the significance of the matter. The other nobles in attendance were taken aback by Roman's unwavering resolve, realizing the potential ramifications should he follow through with his threats. Viscount Conrad contemplated Roman Dimitri's prowess not merely as a swordsman but likened it to the cunning of a fox. He admired Roman's ability to lay traps from which others found no escape, employing sheer force to overwhelm his adversaries. Viscount Conrad felt compelled to hold his ground. He viewed this confrontation as an opportunity to rally support from the Alliance Association. However, any hopes Viscount Conrad harbored of garnering support were dashed as Viscount Lawrence, a member of the Northeastern Alliance Association, stepped forward. His unexpected intervention sided unequivocally with Roman, laying blame squarely at Viscount Conrad's feet. Viscount Lawrence emphasized the paramount importance of adhering to proper procedures, especially when it pertained to the welfare of the citizens residing within Dimitri's territory. He questioned Viscount Conrad's unilateral actions, highlighting the absence of prior notification to Dimitri regarding his intentions. Viscount Lawrence's stern admonition left no room for ambiguity. Viscount Conrad was urged to acknowledge his misstep and extend a formal apology to Roman. Additionally, Viscount Lawrence subtly reminded Viscount Conrad of the lack of solidarity from the Conrad family during Lawrence's own trials against the Barco family. In the tumultuous aftermath of Viscount Lawrence's surprising declaration of allegiance to the Dimitri faction, the Northeastern Alliance Association found itself reeling. Viscount Lawrence's abandonment of their cause signaled a significant blow to their collective influence, leaving the once united front in disarray. As Viscount Lawrence called upon the other nobles to align themselves with Dimitri, a palpable unease settled over the room. Slowly, one by one, the nobles began to acquiesce, their initial resistance crumbling in the face of Lawrence's persuasive rhetoric. They voiced their agreement with Roman stance and demanded Viscount Conrad extend an apology, an unexpected turn of events that Viscount Conrad interpreted as a calculated maneuver to undermine his authority. Faced with the sudden shift in allegiance and the mounting pressure from his peers, Viscount Conrad found himself at a crossroads. He realized that continued defiance would only exacerbate his isolation within the noble circles. Swallowing his pride, he bowed before Roman, 
offering a begrudging apology and vowing to exercise greater caution in the future. Though the words left a bitter taste in his mouth, Viscount Conrad recognized the necessity of compromise and maintaining his standing within the aristocracy. Meanwhile, in Romero Dimitri's office, Roman's father expressed concern over the repercussions of his son's bold actions. He questioned the wisdom of antagonizing the Northeastern Alliance Association, fearing the potential backlash that could ensue. In a conversation with his father, Roman articulates the necessity of establishing a clear hierarchy. He explains that for this purpose, he requires his opponents to exert their utmost effort. Roman envisions a scenario where all adversaries gather, striving to challenge the Dimitri name to its fullest extent. Through this collective effort, the Northeastern Alliance would come to grasp their powerlessness in the face of the Dimitri family's distinction. Only then, Roman believes, can his overarching plan come to fruition. The scene then transitions to the meeting room of the Northeastern Alliance. As tensions continued to simmer within the Northeastern Alliance, frustration boiled over among its members. Roman's audacity in defying their authority sparked outrage, with accusations of arrogance hurled in his direction. The nobles lamented the potential damage to their reputation should they capitulate to Dimitri's demands, fearing that such acquiescence would render them a laughingstock in the eyes of the Northeastern region. Viscount Conrad, grappling with the weight of his diminished influence, turned to his fellow members for guidance. Yet, Faced with the enormity of the situation, they found themselves at a loss for viable solutions. Viscount Conrad openly questioned the effectiveness of the Northeastern Alliance Association, expressing doubt about its significance given Dimitri's overwhelming military strength. He acknowledged the prowess of Roman Dimitri, especially after his victory over the formidable butler of Hector. This acknowledgement led him to believe that conventional methods would fall short in challenging Dimitri's dominance. In light of this, another member suggested reaching out to the central government for assistance. Viscount Conrad agreed, seeing the potential in leveraging the central government's authority to exert pressure on Dimitri. He pointed out that since the downfall of the Barco family, the Northeastern Alliance had been diligently forging connections with the central government. He believed the time was ripe to capitalize on these connections to tip the scales in their favor. With this in mind, Viscount Conrad hoped to involve the central government in their conflict with Dimitri. Acting swiftly, Viscount Conrad initiated contact with Count Parchus, a prominent figure in the central government. Presenting his request, Viscount Conrad was met with an affirmative response from Count Parchus, who was open to hearing more. As Viscount Conrad began to explain the recent conflict with the Dimitri family and his desire to apply pressure with the central government's support, the call abruptly ended, leaving Viscount Conrad frustrated and bewildered. Determined to salvage the situation, Viscount Conrad instructed his assistant to reconnect the call promptly, fearing the consequences of Count Partridge's abrupt dismissal. After a brief delay, the call resumed, and Viscount Conrad wasted no time in apologizing for the earlier interruption, attributing it to unstable communication. However, Count Partridge's response was less than receptive. He chastised Viscount Conrad for his apparent ignorance, questioning whether living in the borderlands had dulled his senses. Count Parchus expressed disbelief at Viscount Conrad's request to pressure Roman Dimitri, dismissing it as misguided and out of touch. Viscount Conrad's frustration mounted as he attempted to defend his position, but Count Parchus remained unmoved. His refusal to entertain Viscount Conrad's plea served as a harsh reminder of the complexities of political influence and the challenges they faced in challenging Dimitri's authority. Count Parchus delivered a sobering message to Viscount Conrad, shedding light on Roman Dimitri's privileged position as Marquis Benedict's favored potential son-in-law. In light of this revelation, Viscount Conrad's plea for Count Parchus to pressure Dimitri seemed futile and misplaced. Count Parchus swiftly terminated the call, advising Viscount Conrad to redirect his efforts towards appeasing Dimitri rather than antagonizing him. Viscount Conrad was stunned by the news of Marquis Benedict's intentions for a political alliance with Roman Dimitri. The prospect of such a union underscored the complexity of the situation and prompted Viscount Conrad to reassess his approach. Suggesting an alternative strategy, the noble who had proposed contacting the central government recommended initiating an apology to Dimitri as a gesture of goodwill. Following this advice, Viscount Conrad extended apologies to the affected farmers and assured them of non-interference for the remainder of their contract period. As the scene unfolds, farmers express their gratitude to Roman for successfully resolving their issue. Their joy is visible upon learning of Roman's advocacy on their behalf. In a heartwarming moment, a farmer assures Roman that henceforth, they are at his service, 
pledging their unwavering support for any task he may require, regardless of its nature. With a gentle smile, Roman humbly assures the farmers that he merely fulfilled his duty as a member of the Dimitri family. Internally, he reflects on the outcome, noting the expected submission of the Northeastern Alliance Association. Roman surmises that while they may have contemplated seeking aid from the central government, the current circumstances dictate their acquiescence to his position. However, Roman sees the association akin to a flock of bats, foreseeing potential treachery in the future despite their apparent subservience. He understood the need to navigate the intricacies of noble politics with caution, preparing for potential conflicts with both friends and foes alike. As Roman departs from his encounter with the farmers, his mind delves into strategic contemplation. He muses that if the initial phase involves provocation, then the subsequent stage necessitates confronting stark reality. Later, at the palace, Roman made a public announcement regarding an upcoming swordsmanship competition to be hosted by Dimitri. The allure of a substantial prize, 100 gold. In the interest of fairness, Roman made it clear that neither he nor Captain Jonathan would be participating in the upcoming competition. The announcement sparked excitement among the crowd gathered, eager to hear more about the event. Expanding on the details, Roman revealed that the participants would be divided into six groups, with a total of six winners to be chosen. Drawing upon the knowledge gained from their experiences waging war on the southern front line against the Hector Kingdom, Roman emphasized how these trials had broadened their understanding of the world and strengthened their resolve. He intended to showcase this newfound strength through the competition. To ensure a fair contest, one of Roman's trusted subordinates would be assigned to each of the six groups. Roman declared that if anyone managed to defeat his subordinate and emerge victorious, they wouldn't just receive a reward, but also have one of their wishes granted by Roman himself. A voice from the audience interjected, questioning whether individuals from other families could participate. Roman responded affirmatively, stating that as long as someone could demonstrate their skill as a swordsman in the northeastern region, they would be welcome to compete. With the competition scheduled to take place in one month's time, Roman urged all present to make thorough preparations. He expressed his hope for a diverse array of challengers to test their mettle in the upcoming event, fostering a spirit of camaraderie and friendly competition among the attendees. The narrative then transitions to the conference room of the Northeastern Alliance Association. Within its confines, members engage in a discussion centering around a forthcoming swordsmanship competition hosted by the illustrious Dimitri family. Recognizing the potential advantages, Viscount Conrad articulates that should a swordsman from their association emerge victorious, the Northeastern Alliance Association stands to attain a wish as a prize. In a departure from merely seeking an apology, Viscount Conrad proposes a more gracious approach, urging a reconciliation and fostering collaboration between the Northeastern Alliance Association and the Dimitris. Such a strategic move, he contends, would not only mend the strained relationship but also elevate the association's tarnished reputation. The crux of the matter, however, lies in the association's ability to clinch victory in the competition. Members express concern, highlighting the diverse array of contenders beyond their association expressing interest. The specter of formidable opponents, such as Chris and Kevin, renowned for their single combat duels with the Barco family, participating adds an additional layer of complexity. Winning, they argue, would prove challenging. Viscount Conrad counters by proposing a tactical approach. He envisions the competition divided into six groups. Acknowledging the presence of formidable adversaries like Chris and Kevin, Viscount Conrad reasons that if the Northeastern Alliance Association strategically allocates its forces across the six groups, excluding those featuring the formidable duo, they stand a chance of securing victory in at least one group. The members, finding merit in this reasoned plan, express agreement with Viscount Conrad, recognizing it as a viable strategy for success. Viscount Conrad's voice resounded with urgency as he addressed the gathered members of the Northeastern Alliance Association. With a tone tinged with gravity, he impressed upon them the imminent nature of the competition, scheduled to unfold a mere month hence. He emphasized the significance of seizing this opportunity bestowed upon them by fate itself. In solemn words, he warned that failure to capitalize on this chance could spell doom for their association, consigning it to obscurity under the shadow of the formidable Dimitri forces. Underscoring the gravity of the situation, Viscount Conrad proposed a radical solution. An external combat expert hired clandestinely to masquerade as a member of their ranks. His directive was clear. They must secure at least one victor, even if it meant resorting to unorthodox means. In the heart of the Dimitri training grounds, the atmosphere buzzed with anticipation as Roman, 
the commanding figure of the Dimitri army, gathered his soldiers. The focus shifted to an upcoming swordsmanship competition, a revelation that caught the soldiers by surprise. With a commanding presence, Roman addressed his soldiers, ensuring they were aware of the impending challenge. He spoke with an air of confidence, declaring that in the coming month, every soldier would participate in a fierce competition. The stakes were high, as only six soldiers would be selected to represent the prestigious Dimitri army. Roman's directive was clear. Past evaluations were irrelevant. The soldiers' performance in the coming month would define their ranks. The soldiers, initially taken aback by this unexpected turn of events, absorbed Roman's words. The announcement carried weight, resonating with the warriors who had returned from the front lines but now found themselves thrust into a new battle. Roman envisioned his subordinates as sharp swords, ready to be drawn at any moment. Roman emphasized the importance of his subordinates' pursuit of strength, making it clear that his current endeavors were aimed at instilling within them a fervent desire for self-improvement. Addressing the soldiers, he assured them that those who represented the Dimitri and brought honor to their name would receive suitable rewards. Furthermore, Roman announced that if any of the six chosen swordsmen emerged victorious in the upcoming competition, they would be granted the opportunity to learn advanced techniques. He reiterated his commitment to aiding his subordinates in their advancement, whether in cultivation or swordsmanship, promising to support them in reaching new heights. Pucky, a thoughtful soldier among the ranks, saw this as a chance for personal growth. The idea of acquiring knowledge directly from their esteemed leader, Roman, ignited a spark within him. He envisioned accelerating his growth and mastering advanced techniques that could set him apart on the battlefield. The sentiment echoed among the soldiers, they recognized Roman's prowess and viewed the opportunity as a life-changing prospect. While the soldiers contemplated the rewards, Roman delved into the deeper objectives of the competition. For him, it served a dual purpose. Firstly, he aimed to enlighten the Northeastern nobles about the harsh realities of their situation. The competition would act as a showcase, revealing the true nature of their ongoing battle. Secondly, and perhaps more importantly, Roman saw this as a comprehensive training opportunity for his subordinates. As the soldiers absorbed Roman's vision, the training grounds transformed into a crucible of ambition and aspiration. Roman envisioned a cohort of skilled and disciplined warriors emerging from the competition. He anticipated that. By the end of this intense period, his soldiers would not only elevate their skills but also gain a deeper understanding of the challenges they faced. With a sly smirk, Roman anticipated that the unfolding events in the northeastern region would indeed be a spectacle. As the soldiers commenced their myriad competitions, Roman contemplated the significance of the upcoming month. Reflecting on his past life as the heavenly demon Beck Jung Hyuk, he acknowledged that his very existence had been shaped by life or death crises. Despite his familiarity with navigating through crises, Roman recognized the imprudence of needlessly endangering himself. Acknowledging that the looming challenges weren't exclusive to his subordinates, he understood the imperative for personal growth within this month. While crises were not unfamiliar territory for Roman, he was determined not to underestimate the potential dangers. In his quest for strength, Roman sought to avoid unnecessary risks, realizing that self-improvement was a journey he had to undertake alongside his subordinates. In the midst of this, Lucas, now the leader of the Hau clan, approached Roman. Roman shared his intention to retreat into isolated training for the duration of the month, entrusting Lucas with a significant task. Handing over his sword, Roman instructed Lucas to sell it, renaming it Blaze in the process. However, Roman emphasized the necessity of secrecy, cautioning Lucas not to reveal the true identity of the sword's owner to any potential buyers. Lucas examined the sword with admiration marveling at its craftsmanship and quality. He couldn't help but question Roman's decision to part with such a remarkable weapon. Nevertheless, he respected Roman's wishes and set out to find a suitable buyer. With Roman's permission to sell the sword however he saw fit, Lucas contemplated various avenues, ultimately considering the possibility of auctioning it anonymously. He was confident that those who recognized the sword's true worth would be willing to pay a high price for it. As Lucas pondered the best course of action, the scene transitioned to Adelian, a bustling city characterized by flourishing business activities. Its prosperity was not solely a product of happenstance. Rather, it was greatly enhanced by the presence of the Warp Gate in the northeastern region. At the bustling auction center, Lucas, shrouded in a cloak to conceal his identity, hands over the sword to an attentive auction worker. With a trained eye, the worker examines the blade, immediately struck by its remarkable quality. A soft, Azure glow emanates from the artifact, hinting at its extraordinary nature. 
Intrigued, the worker queries Lucas about his preferences for the upcoming auction. Maintaining secrecy, Lucas requests a free bidding process, opting to keep the seller's identity anonymous. The worker, well-versed in auction proceedings, explains that such a format entails a 10% processing fee but assures Lucas it's a standard practice. Accepting the terms, Lucas follows the worker into the depths of the auction house for the item's evaluation. Inside the appraisal room, Lucas encounters Morris, the esteemed manager of Adelian's auction house. The worker conducting the assessment commends the sword's craftsmanship, noting its unparalleled strength and sharpness. He muses on the rarity of such a finely crafted weapon in the market, estimating its value to be no less than 30 gold coins. Proceeding with the evaluation, the worker turns his attention to the sword's mana receptivity, a critical aspect of its worth. Mana receptivity, graded on a scale of 1 to 10, measures a sword's ability to absorb mana. Typically, a grade of 3 or higher denotes exceptional quality for artisan swords. However, as the worker tests the sword, astonishment spreads across his face. To his disbelief, the sword displays a grade 10 mana receptivity, an unprecedented revelation. The worker explains to Morris the significance of this finding. Not only does the sword absorb mana, but it also amplifies its power, a feat rarely seen even among the most skilled artisans. Morris, taken aback by the sword's unique properties, realizes the magnitude of what they are about to auction. As the scene transitions to the grand halls of the Adelian auction house, anticipation mounts among the eager attendees. With a commanding presence, the host called upon the assembled audience to seize the opportunity presented before them. Never had the auction house witnessed an item of such extraordinary caliber, setting the stage for an event that would be etched into the annals of its history. From wealthy patrons hailing from the countryside to the elite of the capital, the audience was a testament to the widespread intrigue that had been ignited by rumors swirling around this singular event. As the murmurs of excitement reverberated throughout the room, the host seized the moment to unveil the coveted centerpiece of the day's proceedings, the artisan sword known as Blaze. A palpable sense of awe descended upon the audience as all eyes turned towards the magnificent weapon displayed before them. The host's words resonated with the crowd as he underscored that Blaze was no ordinary sword, its true value lay in its remarkable mana receptivity. To illustrate the significance of this, the host recounted a past auction where a rapier boasting a grade 7 mana receptivity had fetched a staggering sum of 300 gold. However, Blaze transcended all expectations with its unprecedented grade 10 mana receptivity, coupled with its unique ability to amplify absorbed aura. It was a revelation that sent a wave of anticipation rippling through the crowd, igniting a fervor of bidding frenzy. The host declared that while he had auctioned off numerous artisan swords in the past, none compared to the unparalleled uniqueness of Blaze. With an infectious enthusiasm, the host initiated the bidding at a modest 10 gold coins. The atmosphere crackled with excitement as bids quickly escalated, each increment bringing Blaze closer to its inevitable destiny. From 10 to 50 gold coins in mere moments, the bidding war unfolded with a feverish intensity, each participant eager to claim ownership of the coveted artifact. The auction hall buzzed with anticipation as the bids continued to climb, reaching a staggering 600 gold coins. Yet, just when it seemed that Blaze had found its rightful owner, a sudden hush fell over the crowd as number 53 boldly entered the fray with a bid of 1,200 gold coins. The auction host, momentarily taken aback by the audacity of the bid, could scarcely conceal his astonishment. Number 53 was revealed to be Marquis Valentino a figure renowned for operating a merchant empire spanning the entire continent. With vast wealth amassed over the years, Valentino remained neutral in the political arena. However, when it came to acquiring exceptional items, he was known to pursue them with relentless determination. As his bid sent ripples through the auction hall, the true extent of Valentino's influence remained a mystery to the denizens of the Cairo kingdom. The auction host could barely contain his excitement at the prospect of such a formidable bidder. The auction hall crackled with anticipation as the auction host proclaimed Marquis Valentino's bid as unprecedented in the annals of the Adelian auction house. The announcement sent a ripple of astonishment through the assembled audience, each member taken aback by the sheer magnitude of the bid. Marquis Valentino contemplated the true worth of the renowned sword, Blaze, recognizing that its significance went far beyond mere mana receptivity. To Valentino, Blaze symbolized a revolutionary breakthrough a representation of uncharted territory in the elusive mastery of the tenth stage, a realm untouched by any swordsman thus far. In the world of swordsmanship, a dichotomy often existed between famous swords and magic swords. 
While novice swordsmen favored enchanted blades for their efficiency, seasoned practitioners understood the necessity of wielding a pure weapon to fully unleash their aura. For those ranked as famous swordsmen, possessing a blade capable of harnessing their aura to its fullest potential held a measurable value. Such swords were deemed priceless treasures, worthy of any sacrifice, even if it meant relinquishing everything Valentino owned. Valentino contemplated the potential impact of the blacksmith releasing additional swords to the market. He believed that if the same blacksmith crafted a second or third sword, the value of Blaze would skyrocket, as it would retain its status as the original creation. Valentino understood that in the realm of artisans, possessing an item labeled as the first held significant recognition, elevating the entire collection to a higher echelon of prestige and value. Meanwhile, the other audience members, driven by their own desires for rarity and prestige, dared not oppose Valentino's bid. The allure of possessing such a coveted item outweighed any potential risks, and thus, the auction host declared Valentino the victor with his bid of 1,200 gold coins. Later, in the seclusion of a private room, Valentino wasted no time in finalizing the transaction. With a sense of eagerness, he handed over 1,300 gold coins to Morris, the attendant of the auction house, insisting that the extra 100 gold coins be considered a token of appreciation for Morris's service. Gratefully accepting the unexpected gift, Morris was visibly touched by Valentino's generosity. In return for his generosity, Valentino made a simple request, information about the blacksmith responsible for crafting Blaze. As Marquis Valentino expressed his desire to meet the swordsman responsible for crafting Blaze in person, Morris, the attendant of the auction house, couldn't hide his trepidation. He stammered, explaining to Valentino that arranging such a meeting would prove challenging. Apologizing profusely for the inconvenience, Morris's nerves were palpable. Upon hearing this, Marquis Valentino responded with disappointment. That's too bad, he remarked, acknowledging the situation. Valentino expressed his belief that it would be a natural decision for the auction house to make. He instructed Morris to notify him first if the blacksmith were to send another item for auction, emphasizing the importance of staying informed and maintaining a strategic advantage in future transactions. Later, as Marquis Valentino retreated to his carriage, clutching the prized sword in his hands, he couldn't help but marvel at its craftsmanship. The sword's flawless blade and its extraordinary manner reactive properties left Valentino in awe. Despite his vast collection of renowned swords, he had never encountered one quite like Blaze. Determined to uncover the identity of its elusive creator, Valentino resolved to spare no effort in his quest. Turning to his subordinate, Valentino instructed him to begin the search by investigating Dimitri's master blacksmith, reasoning that since Blaze's first trade occurred at the Adelian auction house, it was plausible that its origins could be traced back to Dimitri. Assured of his subordinate's compliance, Valentino prepared to embark on his quest, his heart brimming with anticipation. Meanwhile, at Dimitri's training grounds, Chris, engaged in a sparring match with Henderson, emerged victorious, signaling his prowess. As he contemplated the selection of soldiers for the upcoming competition, Chris's thoughts drifted to potential candidates, including himself, Kevin, Vulcan, and Pucky. However, uncertainty lingered over the remaining two slots. Suddenly, Chris's attention was drawn to a peculiar sensation, a disturbance in the sky that seemed to reverberate through the very air. Stunned, he gazed upwards, sensing an inexplicable turbulence that defied explanation. Meanwhile, Roman, immersed in his swordsmanship, reflected on a recent encounter with Butler. Contemplating the outcome had he engaged in immediate combat, Roman acknowledged the importance of preparation in securing victory. It was a lesson that resonated deeply as he honed his skills preparing for whatever challenges lay ahead. Without the luxury of ample preparation time, Roman acknowledged he wouldn't have been able to handle the Stage 5 aura. His decisions, still colored by the memories of his past life as Bet Jung Hyuk, revealed a lingering arrogance and a struggle to fully accept his current identity as Roman Dimitri. In his previous life, Bet Jung Hyuk had been a formidable force, capable of overcoming any opponent. But Roman understood that the same rules didn't apply in his current existence. Facing adversaries like Butler, Roman realized survival in such battles required unwavering resolve and unshakable determination akin to the unyielding cycle of day and night. Engrossed in the repetitive act of pounding steel before the furnace, Roman endured the scorching heat, his skin reddening and blistering. Despite the physical strain pushing him to his limits, Roman remained steadfast in his focus. He recognized the necessity for transformation, 
not just for himself, but also for the blade he wielded, a process of renewal and rebirth. Harnessing the technique of flame recreation, Roman absorbed the flames and channeled the mana within, using the fusion of sword and fire to mold his body closer to perfection. As he underwent his second metamorphosis, Roman emerged from his training chamber with a newfound confidence, laying the groundwork for his ascent to greater heights. Closing his eyes, Roman visualized facing two imaginary incarnations of Butler simultaneously, a mental exercise to hone his skills and prepare for future confrontations. He contemplated the intricacies of the heavenly demon sword, which divided into three stages, the first half trichotomy, mid-trichotomy, and second half trichotomy. Though Roman had only mastered the first half trichotomy thus far, he sensed a shift on the horizon. With his second metamorphosis completed, he anticipated unlocking new levels of power. Should he achieve the elusive third metamorphosis and gain access to the second half trichotomy, Roman vowed that no opponent would stand in his way. With the unwavering determination and conviction of Beck Jung Hyuk, the legendary heavenly demon, Roman was poised to become an absolute master. Now proficient in utilizing the mid trichotomy, Roman found himself capable of besting even two opponents like Butler simultaneously. However, a lingering uncertainty nagged at him. Was it truly right to emulate the actions of his past life? The operation of aura emitted by the wielder of his sword resembled an explosion, momentarily surpassing even the refined inner power of Miram. Roman pondered whether blindly adhering to the ways of his former self was the correct path. With the realization dawning upon him, Roman understood that he didn't need to conform to the norms of his current world. He resolved to challenge the common belief that the aura operation method of his present life was entirely flawed. Instead, he sought to forge a path that bridged the gap between his current existence and his past life. Summoning the techniques of the heavenly demon sword style mid trichotomy, Roman unleashed a colossal explosion of purple aura. With a single decisive strike, he vanquished the imaginary butlers that stood before him. In that moment, Roman realized the potential that lay within him, a fusion of both his past and present selves, forging a new path forward. The Roman sword glowed with an otherworldly purple aura, capturing the attention of its wielder, Roman. As the ethereal light enveloped the blade, Roman found himself reflecting on the unexpected twist of his current life. He had initially believed that after gaining another chance at existence, his reborn life would lack the extraordinary elements of his past. Little did he know, fate had different plans. Amidst the silent training grounds, Roman couldn't help but smile at the irony of his situation. In this new life, he mirrored the actions of his previous existence, finding joy and fulfillment in the familiar yet novel experiences. His thoughts meandered through the memories of his past life, and with a renewed sense of purpose, Roman realized the profound beauty of his current existence. The heavenly demon sword style, the very essence of his combat prowess, underwent a mysterious transformation. The familiar techniques now bore a completely different direction, leaving Roman both intrigued and exhilarated. With anticipation building within him, Roman unleashed a singular, mighty strike. To his amazement, the force created a colossal hole in the ground, a testament to the newfound power coursing through him. In the aftermath, Roman contemplated the untapped potential of the heavenly demon sword style. The realization dawned that the path of mastery stretched out before him, promising further progression. In this realm of possibilities, Roman yearned for unexpected events, challenges that would push him to the limits and test the very essence of his being. As Roman surveyed the landscape altered by his singular attack, he understood that the challenges of this world were not obstacles but stepping stones. Each trial became a driving force, a catalyst propelling him towards the zenith of his capabilities. Despite starting anew, Roman harbored an unwavering determination to ascend to the peak once again. The echoes of his feet reached the ears of his companions, Chris, Kevin, and Pucky. Concerned by the unfamiliar sound, they hurried to the training grounds, fearing an attack on their comrade. The sight that greeted them was beyond comprehension. Roman stood amidst the aftermath, a nonchalant expression on his face, as if creating a massive hole without magic was an everyday occurrence. Shocked and bewildered, Chris, Kevin, and Pucky questioned Roman about the spectacle. Roman dismissed their concerns, instructing them to return as he was unharmed. The trio, still processing the inexplicable event, reluctantly left Roman to his training. As they departed, Chris couldn't shake off the astonishment. In his eyes, Roman's achievement was a testament to an unyielding spirit and unmatched dedication. The once weak human, frozen in awe at insurmountable walls, now grappled with the realization that Roman had progressed yet another step beyond their comprehension. 
Chris, grappling with his frustration, contemplated the stark contrast between his own actions and Roman's ceaseless pursuit of improvement. The looming sword fighting competition intensified his resolve to not merely win, but to triumph with an overwhelming superiority over his adversaries. The trio left the training grounds. Feeling the urgency to bolster their strength, the narrative shifts forward by a month. Roman, having diligently toiled away, proudly presents his newly forged sword. Contemplating a suitable name for his creation, he seeks one that would resonate with his current self. Reflecting on his past swords, Salamander and Blaze, which symbolized fresh starts, Roman aims for his third sword to embody his present essence, a weapon that strikes fear into the hearts of his adversaries. Thus, he settles on the name Darkness. Chris arrives with a detailed report on the month's activities. Over the preceding weeks, they and their soldiers engaged in battles at regular intervals, meticulously documenting each skirmish. From this rigorous training regimen, Chris identifies several standout swordsmen with impressive win records. Presenting the list to Roman, Chris points out the top contenders, himself, Kevin, Vulcan, Pucky, and the unexpected selections of McBurney and Henderson. Roman, though slightly surprised by the inclusion of the last two names, trusts Chris's judgment and endorses the choices. In a quiet moment between Roman and Chris, Roman shares his perspective on the concept of meaningful loss. He expresses to Chris his belief that such a notion doesn't truly hold weight in the grand scheme of things. With a glint of determination in his eyes, Roman emphasizes that the competition bearing his name serves as a platform to showcase the caliber of his soldiers. Chris nods understandingly, affirming his commitment to the cause. A faint grin graces Roman's lips as he eagerly anticipates the forthcoming challenges, knowing that they will only further validate the strength and prowess of his esteemed warriors. As the day of the competition draws near, all participating swordsmen assemble. Among them, a soldier with striking purple hair exudes confidence, vowing to demonstrate the skills honed on the front lines. Their companion, with features blurred by a veil of anonymity, expresses hope that the former will join Kevin's group, acknowledging Kevin's formidable reputation. The conversation turns to the strengths and weaknesses of various competitors, with Pucky and Vulcan emerging as notable adversaries. For some, the prospect of facing these formidable opponents evokes both apprehension and determination. The announcement of the competition's groupings elicits a range of emotions among the participants. Each grouping is scrutinized, with individuals assessing their chances against fellow contenders. Amidst the anticipation, Baron Liam, a nobleman from the Northeastern Federation, voices his unease at the prospect of facing Chris, recognizing the daunting challenge ahead. Within the Northeastern Alliance, Baron Liam grapples with a wave of apprehension as the day of the competition looms nearer. Yet, his fellow Alliance members rally around him, offering words of solace and reassurance. They remind him of the distinguished lineage of skilled swordsmen from which he hails, urging him not to succumb to despair. Count Conrad, in particular, delivers a stirring speech, imploring Baron Liam not to relinquish hope or motivation. With unwavering conviction, Count Conrad declares his belief that victory will inevitably grace the Conrad bloodline. This conviction is reinforced by the fact that one of his own members is set to face MacBurney, a renowned one-armed swordsman, instilling further confidence in their chances. Count Conrad underscores the paramount importance of the competition for the Alliance's survival, vowing to lead the Conrad bloodline to triumph. His impassioned words ignite a fervent sense of excitement among the Alliance members, who respond with resounding cheers and applause. As the day of reckoning arrives, the arena swells with anticipation as eager spectators gather to witness the unfolding spectacle. Inside, Baron Liam finds himself consumed by the weight of expectation, acutely aware of the scrutiny from the Federation. Turning to his loyal soldier, Max, Baron Liam offers words of caution, advising him to tread carefully and avoid unnecessary risks. Yet, Max's unwavering resolve offers reassurance, as he pledges his unwavering dedication to the pursuit of victory. Max acknowledges the formidable reputation of their opponent, Chris, but steadfastly maintains his own prowess as a two-star swordsman, bolstering Baron Liam's confidence in their capabilities. Encouraged by Max's steadfast determination, Baron Liam fervently implores him to face Chris on the battlefield without reservation. He offers his unwavering support and pledges to intervene if Max's safety is ever imperiled. Max, emboldened by the trust placed in him by Baron Liam, sees this as a defining moment to leave an indelible mark. As he steps onto the arena floor, Max is driven by a burning desire to prove himself not only to his lord, but to the watching audience as well. 
However, upon locking eyes with Chris, Max finds himself momentarily transfixed by the palpable aura of menace emanating from his opponent. Yet, summoning all his courage, Max steadies himself and focuses on the task at hand. As the clash of swords commences, Max charges forward with unyielding determination, his every movement fueled by an unwavering resolve. However, with a composed demeanor, Chris effortlessly maneuvers his sword, causing Max's weapon to slip from his grasp. In a swift motion, Chris strikes with precision, swiftly incapacitating his opponent. The first match concludes in a mere three seconds, with Chris from the Dimitri bloodline emerging victorious and advancing to the second round. Baron Liam, taken aback by the vast disparity in skill between Chris and Max, can only watch in shock. Meanwhile, Kevin, also hailing from the Dimitri bloodline, secures victory in his match, effortlessly advancing to the second round. Vulcan and Pucky follow suit, easily triumphing in their respective bouts and securing their places in the next round. The other participants are left astonished by the dominant performances of these four formidable contenders. Whispers spread among the onlookers, affirming the rumors of the unbeatable nature of Chris, Kevin, Vulcan, and Pucky. With these four seemingly invincible, the remaining participants pin their hopes on defeating Henderson and McBurney in the upcoming matches, recognizing them as their only chance to upset the balance of power. Then the scene shifts to, after the group announcements, the focus shifts to a cluster of soldiers who are taken aback by the revelation that Henderson is representing the Dimitri family in the competition. They knew Henderson as part of the Lawrence family, and his reputation as a mere farmer and capable of wielding a sword properly baffles them. They question how Henderson, with his humble background, managed to secure a spot in a prestigious swordsman competition. Among the six representatives of Roman, opinions vary, especially concerning Chris and Kevin, known respectively as the Flash and Devil of Cairo for their renowned skills. Participants are eager to avoid confrontation with these formidable opponents. Similarly, the intimidating physiques and mercenary past of Vulcan and Pucky make them formidable adversaries. In contrast, Mac Burney and Henderson, labeled as a one-armed swordsman and a former farmer, pale in comparison, with Henderson considered the weakest link among them. In the audience, whispers and mockery about Henderson's past embarrassments ripple through the crowd. Being grouped with Henderson is seen as an advantageous stroke of luck, sparking envy among the participants. The scene then transitions to Baron Romero Dimitri, who questions Roman about the necessity of organizing a competition solely to assert the Dimitri family's dominance in the northeastern region. Baron Romero suggests that while hosting such an event might project an image of goodwill from the Dimitri family, the nobles of the Northeastern Alliance harbor no true intention of submitting to Dimitri's authority. However, Roman provides insight to his father, explaining the vital importance of the competition. He argues that the Northeastern Alliance Association may be overly confident in their ability to challenge Dimitri independently. Roman believes that if they come to realize their inability to breach Dimitri's defenses, they may be more inclined to capitulate to Dimitri's rule without resistance. As the first round for Group 5 commenced, all eyes turned to the match between Henderson and Taylor. Henderson's opponent, Taylor, was known among the audience as an adept aura swordsman, prompting doubts about Henderson's chances. Despite the skepticism surrounding him, Henderson exchanged cordial greetings with Taylor as Taylor engages in conversation with Henderson, reminiscences of their past encounters flood Taylor's mind. Taylor recalls the day spent aiding Henderson on the farm, never anticipating the drastic shift that would unfold. With a hint of disbelief, Taylor expressed astonishment at Henderson's transformation from a humble farmer to a formidable swordsman. Drawing his sword with a practiced hand, Taylor addresses Henderson, acknowledging their prior acquaintance. Taylor, having recently achieved a significant milestone by attaining a two-star status following a profound revelation, offers counsel to Henderson in their shared moment. With sincerity in his voice, Taylor conveys to Henderson that this encounter marks their final opportunity as acquaintances. He stresses the futility of engaging in a one-sided conflict that would only lead to senseless bloodshed. Urging Henderson to reconsider, Taylor implores him to abandon the impending fight, opting instead for a resolution devoid of unnecessary violence. Upon hearing Taylor's plea, Henderson responds with a firm resolve, urging Taylor to discard any preconceived notions of the Henderson he once knew. With a steely gaze, Henderson warns Taylor that any attempt to show leniency will be swiftly seized upon, exploited as an opportunity to secure victory. Undeterred, Taylor acknowledges Henderson's stance with a somber acceptance, expressing a heartfelt hope that Henderson will not come to rue the path he has chosen. 
As the match began, Henderson launched himself at Taylor with unrelenting force, his determination palpable in every strike. Taylor, taken aback by the sheer intensity of Henderson's attack, recognized the use of aura in his opponent's movements. Despite the initial surprise, Taylor remained composed, understanding the gravity of the situation. With a swift and decisive motion, Henderson unleashed the Azura Sword technique, infusing his blade with aura as he struck at Taylor with precision. In that crucial moment, Henderson's resolve shone through as he vowed to do whatever it took to honor his commitment to Lord Roman and surpass his former self. In the realm of aura manifestation, Henderson found himself trailing behind his peers who swiftly brought forth their aura. Sensing mana and materializing it demanded substantial effort and time from Henderson. The journey was akin to being a tortoise amidst hares, with him consistently at the back of the line. Despite this apparent slowness, Henderson remained diligent, pushing forward with unwavering determination. During the first round of Group 5, Henderson faced Taylor, an adept aura swordsman. Observers speculated that Henderson stood little chance against such a formidable opponent. However, Henderson's perseverance and hard work were about to redefine expectations. In the heat of the match, Henderson's relentless effort nearly led to Taylor's defeat, surprising everyone, especially Taylor. Even though Henderson's progress seemed slow, his resilience and commitment were undeniable. Taylor, astonished by Henderson's tenacity, couldn't fathom losing to him in this manner. Determined to conclude the fight decisively, Taylor employed his own aura to halt Henderson's charge. Despite not wanting to resort to aura against Henderson, Taylor knew it was time to bring the match to an end. With a yellow aura enveloping him, Taylor charged at Henderson with full force, setting the stage for a climactic confrontation. Amidst the clash of auras, Henderson's mind wandered to a conversation with Chris from a month ago. Chris, acknowledging Henderson's initial weakness, had witnessed a transformation within him. Henderson's newfound desire for victory, challenging himself instead of succumbing to defeat, had changed the course of his life. Chris assured Henderson of his worthiness to stand beside Lord Roman, a promise that resonated deeply with him. Returning to the present match, both Henderson and Taylor unleashed their auras, colliding in a clash that would determine the victor. In a surprising turn of events, Taylor found himself defeated on the ground, unable to anticipate Henderson's unexpected prowess. Seizing the opportunity, Henderson stood tall with his sword pointed at Taylor's head, securing his first win in the competition. The audience erupted in excitement as Henderson's triumph unfolded before their eyes. Cheers and chants of Henderson's name filled the arena. The unexpected victory over an aura swordsman by someone who once toiled as a farmer captivated the spectators. Within the Northeastern Alliance, disbelief and shock spread as they witnessed Henderson's unexpected triumph. Questions arose about Count Conrad's earlier assessment of Henderson as a weak link in the group of six. Count Conrad, however, urged his members to maintain composure, confidently stating that the ultimate winner would undoubtedly emerge from the Northeastern Alliance Association. Now, it's Group 2's turn, and Kevin steps into the arena, contemplative as he walks. He can't shake the feeling of being consistently slower than Chris by a whole five seconds. Whenever the question arises of who is the sword of Lord Roman, the unanimous answer is always Chris. Yet, Kevin harbors a stern resolve to prove his own value to Lord Roman in his unique way. His opponent, Miles, hails from the Northeastern Alliance. Miles regards Kevin as the Devil of Dimitri, anticipating a fierce battle. Without hesitation, Miles launches into an aggressive assault, charging at Kevin with full force. However, Kevin remains composed, swiftly evading Miles' attacks and delivering a precise punch to his stomach. Undeterred, Miles continues his onslaught, believing that persistence will eventually land him a blow. Yet, Kevin effortlessly dodges each strike, countering with a series of rapid attacks using his knife. As Miles struggles to keep up, his resolve wanes, and he ultimately surrenders. The members of the Northeastern Alliance are left in shock as they witness their fellow soldiers' defeat. Conversely, for Kevin, the victory solidifies his worth by shattering his opponent's will to fight. In that moment, Kevin proves that true strength isn't just about speed or aggression but also about determination and strategy. The scene unfolds before the commencement of the highly anticipated tournament, where Jonathan, the captain of the renowned Dimitri Knights, rallies his soldiers. They stand in disciplined formation, Jonathan addresses them with a grave tone. He begins, as you are all aware, this competition is hosted by none other than the esteemed young Master Roman. Jonathan continues, and among the competitors stands Chris, the ex-vice captain of the Knight Order, a formidable opponent. He implores his soldiers to watch Chris closely, 
to learn from his techniques and strategies, recognizing the opportunity to elevate themselves as knights of the Dimitri Order. The soldiers respond in unison, their voices ringing out in affirmation, Yes, sir. In the arena, Chris, having already triumphed in the first round, prepares for his next challenge. Jonathan observes from the sidelines, a mix of surprise and admiration flickering across his features as he witnesses Chris's skill firsthand. He marvels at how Chris has grown stronger since his days in the Night Order. Meanwhile, Chris stands poised and focused, seeing himself not just as a participant, but as a representation of Lord Roman's authority. He is determined to vanquish any opponent who dares to stand in his way, ensuring that none shall question the supremacy of his lord. As the rounds progress, Chris's dominance becomes increasingly evident. With each victory, he pushes himself further, feeling a relentless drive to excel. Yet, despite his remarkable performance, he remains unsatisfied, craving more challenges to overcome. Jonathan watches in astonishment as Chris dispatches his opponents with breathtaking speed and precision. He wonders silently how Chris has attained such formidable strength, pondering the influence of young Master Roman on his protege. Meanwhile, among the other participants, a sense of resignation begins to spread. Some soldiers, faced with the daunting prospect of confronting Chris, choose to concede defeat rather than risk humiliation. They rationalize that it is better to withdraw gracefully than to suffer a humiliating defeat on the battlefield. However, one soldier, Farrell, refuses to yield to despair. Despite his doubts about his ability to defeat Chris, he resolves to face him head-on, if only to prove his worth. Farrell sets himself a modest goal to last just one minute against the formidable opponent. As the match begins, Farrell braces himself for the inevitable onslaught. But before he can even mount a defense, Chris charges forward with unparalleled speed, delivering a devastating blow that ends the match in a matter of seconds. The arena falls silent as Jonathan and the other spectators watch in awe at Chris's unparalleled skill. Chris's dominance in the tournament was nothing short of extraordinary. After securing victory in the first round, he proceeded to blaze through the following rounds with astonishing speed. In a mere 27 seconds, he had conquered five rounds, leaving spectators in awe and opponents in dismay. The Northeastern Alliance Association could only watch in horror as Chris's unstoppable momentum seemed to defy all expectations. As Chris surged ahead, other competitors also showcased their formidable skills. Kevin's ferociousness earned him victory in Group 2 while Vulcan and Pukey relied on their immense physical strength to overpower their opponents in groups 3 and 4. Henderson, against all odds, surprised everyone with an unexpected victory in group 5, further adding to the intrigue of the tournament. Yet, amidst the flurry of victories, there remained one last hope for the Northeastern Alliance Association, facing off against MacBurney in group 6. The scene then shifted to Count Conrad, who, with a keen eye, assessed the readiness of his knight, Gabriel. Gabriel, displaying unwavering confidence, assured Count Conrad of his peak condition, a testament to the rigorous training he had undergone since childhood under the Conrad family's guidance. Count Conrad reflected on Gabriel's journey, recognizing him as the family's secret weapon. As a three-star swordsman, Gabriel possessed unparalleled skill and expertise. Despite the absence of aura, prohibited in the competition, Gabriel's prowess was undeniable, setting him apart from his competitors. As Count Conrad observed Mac Burney's advancement to round three, he couldn't help but attribute it to mere luck. However, he was certain that the end was nigh for Mac Burney, or rather, for Roman Dimitri. Addressing Gabriel, Count Conrad reminded him of the fate that had befallen all other swordsmen of the Northeastern Alliance Association, leaving Gabriel as the sole contender standing. He cautioned Gabriel against any sense of pity, emphasizing the need to relentlessly crush Mac Burney, despite his one armed status. Gabriel, upon hearing Count Conrad's words, resolved that there was no conceivable way he could lose to a one-armed opponent. As Gabriel entered the arena, his gaze fell upon Mac Burney, whose diminished sense of balance betrayed the loss of his limb. Gabriel pondered how a commoner knight like Mac Burney, who had once seemed incapable of ascending to knighthood even with two arms, could now vie for victory in a competition that epitomized a knight's honor and pride, despite his newfound handicap. As the match commenced, Gabriel charged forward, confident in his abilities and choosing not to rely on Aura to prove his superiority. He launched a barrage of attacks, each aimed at overwhelming Mac Burney. Yet, to Gabriel's surprise, Mac Burney skillfully blocked every strike that came his way. Gabriel's keen anticipation led him to predict Mac Burney's next move, a necessary dodge to the right to evade the impending attack. As Gabriel had foreseen, 
Mac Bernie swiftly shifted in the anticipated direction, unwittingly leaving one side vulnerable. Recognizing the opening, Gabriel seized the moment, swiftly launching his strike toward Mac Bernie's exposed flank. But Mac Bernie, defying expectations, managed to thwart Gabriel's attack with ease. This unexpected defense left Gabriel puzzled, struggling to comprehend the unorthodox movements of his opponent. Mac Bernie relentlessly countered, launching a barrage of strikes at Gabriel, who skillfully parried each blow. Witnessing Gabriel's unwavering defense, frustration seeped into his veins. In a moment of impatience, Gabriel summoned his inner strength, channeling his aura to forcefully repel Mac Bernie backward. In that charge moment, Gabriel's mind churned with a realization. Mac Bernie's journey to the third round wasn't a stroke of luck, it was a testament to his cunning. Despite the apparent imbalance caused by the absence of an arm, Mac Bernie wielded it to his advantage, leveraging it as a strategic tool rather than a hindrance. The scene then shifted to a memory of Roman, imparting wisdom to Mac Bernie. Roman emphasized the fundamental importance of balance in swordsmanship, revealing the existence of the left arm sword art, a technique devised by a one arm swordsman. Roman marveled at the creator's resilience and determination, contrasting it with Mac Bernie's initial sense of hopelessness. Through flashbacks, Mac Bernie's journey unfolded, a journey fraught with feelings of inadequacy and despair. He grappled with his disability, struggling to find purpose and meaning in his life. However, as time passed, Mac Bernie refused to succumb to despair. Instead, he clung to a flicker of hope, a hope that ignited a fire within him, propelling him to overcome his limitations and master the left arm sword art. In a solemn oath to his lord, Roman, Mac Bernie vowed to emerge victorious in the competition, declaring that his life as a swordsman was far from over. Returning to the present moment, Mac Bernie skillfully parried Gabriel's attack before swiftly launching himself into the air. With precision, he delivered a decisive strike to Gabriel's chest, bringing him down with a triumphant smile. In that moment, Mac Bernie credited Roman for granting him a newfound sense of purpose and vitality, breathing new life into his journey as a swordsman. The arena echoed with the resounding victories of Dimitri's swordsmen, each triumph solidifying their dominance over the Northeastern region. Their success left the members of the Northeastern Alliance Association at a loss for words, their defeat glaringly evident. Count Conrad, a key figure in the association, found himself stunned by the turn of events. The once formidable reputation of the Alliance now lay shattered at their feet, shattered by the overwhelming might of Dimitri. As Count Conrad grappled with the realization of their defeat, he couldn't help but wonder when Dimitri had become so formidable. Shocked and shaken, he questioned the nature of the adversary he had provoked, realizing that even with the support of the central government, victory against Dimitri was far from assured. The other members of the Alliance looked to Count Conrad for guidance, seeking direction in the wake of their crushing loss. Acknowledging the defeat of all their swordsmen, Count Conrad grimly accepted the harsh reality that the Alliance would now be reduced to mere followers in the region. With a heavy heart, they made the decision to withdraw from the arena, their hopes of reclaiming their former glory dashed by the overwhelming strength of Dimitri. Meanwhile, among the spectators, whispers of astonishment and speculation filled the air. Many marveled at the sudden rise and strength of Chris and his comrades, pondering the role of Roman Dimitri in their transformation. Among them, a brown-haired soldier offered insight into the significance of leadership within a reputable swordsman family. He explained that every such family had a standout leader, whose skill and leadership abilities propelled them to greatness. In the case of Dimitri, it was Roman Dimitri himself who had risen to become the preeminent swordsman, elevating the family's status through his own strength and leadership. This revelation shed light on the clear direction in which the swordsmen of the northeastern region were now headed. To succeed in the competitive world of swordsmanship, the soldier emphasized, one had to pledge their loyalty to Dimitri. It was evident that the once dominant force of the Northeastern Alliance Association had been eclipsed by the rising power of Dimitri, and those aspiring to greatness as swordsmen would need to align themselves with the formidable family. The scene then shifted to Roman himself, who stood tall amidst the jubilant participants from Dimitri. He offered his congratulations to each of them, recognizing their outstanding performance in the tournament. Roman acknowledged that among those who had sworn loyalty to him, there were those who did so out of necessity, driven by the need for strength, while others did so out of genuine respect for his leadership and prowess. Amidst the myriad complexities of human relationships, Roman harbors a distinct aversion to entanglement. While recognizing that some may find themselves with limited options, Roman maintains a preference for simplicity. 
Emotions, Roman believes, can forge a bond as tight as any, yet his vision of an ideal relationship transcends mere sentimentality. For Roman, the pinnacle of companionship lies in a reciprocal exchange, where both parties bring something of value to the table. In Roman's realm, this reciprocity ensures a steadfastness that endures the test of time. The soldiers under Roman's command yearn for something from their leader, and in turn, Roman seeks something from them. It's a symbiosis that fortifies their connection, enabling it to weather even the most prolonged passages of time. Roman holds in high regard the ambition of his soldiers to grow stronger, viewing it as a testament to their dedication. He implores them never to lose sight of this pursuit. After all, each soldier is handpicked by Roman himself, a testament to his unwavering faith in their abilities. Just as Roman has never doubted their capacity for victory, he urges them to harbor the same unyielding belief in themselves. In a gesture of appreciation and recognition, Roman generously rewarded the victors of the competition with ten gold coins and three days of well-deserved respite. He hoped that they would relish their rewards, expressing heartfelt gratitude for their unwavering dedication and allegiance. The scene transitions to Roman's office, where Lucas delivers his findings on the Alliance Association's movements. He informs Roman that, in line with his expectations, the Association has abandoned any plans to confront Dimitri. Lucas asserts that they are unlikely to challenge Dimitri again unless a golden opportunity presents itself. Roman acknowledges the inherent limitations of control in the world. He reflects on the inevitability of dissent, even under the rule of a wise leader. With the uncertainty surrounding Dimitri's potential conflicts with the central government, Roman stresses the importance of minimizing losses in the northeastern region. Thus, he deems the Northeastern Association Alliance a necessary evil. Considering his strategy, Roman concludes that he has successfully provoked the alliance, forcing them to confront reality. He resolves that the next step is to employ power to overcome power. With determination, Roman instructs Lucas to proceed with the plan. Meanwhile, the narrative shifted to the northern outskirts of Cairo, where Count Douglas, a prominent figure with a reputation to uphold, found himself seething with frustration. His anger was directed at his workers, who, despite their efforts, had failed to apprehend a group of bandits and retrieve a crucial slush fund. The worker explained to Douglas that although the bandits in the vicinity had been subdued, locating the hidden fund proved elusive. The origin of this fund traced back to Count Barco, who, foreseeing potential conflicts like the one with the Lawrence family, had gathered funds from sources beyond the Golden Bank. Barco, backed by financial support from Count Douglas and other allies, had prepared for unforeseen situations, bringing along a powerful ally named Homeros as his ace card. However, the tides turned against Barco in the conflict with Roman, resulting in his defeat. Barco's escape attempt in the dead of night led to his demise, leaving Douglas with the grim reality that the only person who could recover the borrowed money had vanished from the world. In a moment of despair, Douglas recalled confidential discussions over meals with Barco. From these conversations, he gleaned information about the hidden slush fund. Driven by desperation, Douglas enlisted the services of the Black Moon, a clandestine group, to locate the fund. Yet, their efforts were thwarted when a group of audacious bandits intercepted the transport, making off with the valuable gold bars. The audacity of a mere bandit group absconding with such a significant treasure confounded and frustrated Douglas. Despite the setback, Douglas remained resolute in his determination to reclaim the stolen funds. He issued an impassioned decree to his men, demanding an exhaustive search throughout the northeastern region until the gold bars were recovered. As frustration loomed large, a breakthrough emerged. A worker rushed in, announcing the arrival of the Black Moon and the revelation of the gold bar's whereabouts. Anxious to expedite the recovery process, Douglas instructed his men to bring in the members of the Black Moon immediately. Among them stood Donovan, a figure draped in a cloak, and the leader of the Black Moon. Donovan bore news of a significant development. Through patient surveillance of the black market, he had uncovered the identity of those responsible for pilfering the gold bars. Douglas, fueled by impatience and a thirst for retribution, demanded that Donovan disclose the identities of the perpetrators without delay. Donovan's revelation left Count Douglas reeling with disbelief. The perpetrators of the audacious theft weren't mere bandits, but members of the Northeastern Alliance Association. As Donovan meticulously unraveled the intricate sequence of events, Initially, it seemed like a routine encounter with bandits, but fate intervened when the bandits crossed paths with soldiers from the Alliance Association. Exploiting the chaos, the soldiers swiftly overwhelmed the bandits and seized the horse carriage containing the stolen gold bars.
Donovan asserted with conviction that the soldiers were cognizant of the carriage's ownership, implicating the association in the brazen heist. To substantiate his claims, Donovan presented a damning piece of evidence, a gold bar discovered within the black market. Its distinctive markings matched those of Barco's slush funds, confirming the association's involvement. Further investigation revealed the damning connection. The servant responsible for the illicit sale was affiliated with the alliance. Donovan reflects on the pivotal moment when he divulged crucial information to Count Douglas, realizing the pivotal role he played in thwarting what could have been the Alliance Association's perfect crime. Yet, he acknowledges that their descent into crisis was largely self-inflicted, stemming from their ill-advised decision to make him their adversary. Contemplating the shifting dynamics within the Northeastern Alliance Association, Donovan muses that Count Douglas and his cohorts could never have fathomed the magnitude of change that unfolded within the ranks of the Black Moon. As if adding a twist to an already intricate tale, the once-renowned Intelligence Guild has now been assimilated into the House sect under the leadership of Hu Lucas. In its new incarnation, the Black Moon operates as a formidable entity, faithfully executing the directives of Roman Dimitri. Enraged and frustrated, Count Douglas wasted no time in mobilizing his forces. He issued urgent orders to his men, commanding them to contact the Alliance Association without delay. Vowing to ensure that the perpetrators faced swift and severe consequences, Douglas's determination burned with an intensity that matched the fury of a raging inferno. Meanwhile, within the hallowed confines of the Alliance Association's meeting room, an air of palpable tension hung heavy. The members, acutely aware of Count Douglas's fearsome reputation as the Beast of the North, trembled at the prospect of incurring his wrath. Uncertainty not at their collective conscience as they grappled with the magnitude of their involvement in the theft. Attempting to alleviate the mounting anxiety, Count Conrad, a voice of reason amidst the chaos, addressed the assembly. He implored them to consider the broader implications of their actions, emphasizing that Barco's slush fund did not solely belong to Count Douglas, asserted the association's rightful claim to the slush funds lent to the Barco family. He reminded the members that they were creditors with a stake in the matter, and therefore, they should not acquiesce to Count Douglas's demands without question. This stance challenged the notion that Count Douglas held unilateral authority over the funds. Some members expressed apprehension about challenging Count Douglas, known as the formidable Beast of the North. They feared the potential consequences of defying him. However, Count Conrad dismissed their concerns, emphasizing the importance of unity and assertiveness in facing Douglas's unjust claims. Despite their reservations, the members reluctantly agreed to support Count Conrad's approach. They understood the necessity of presenting a united front against Count Douglas's overreach, even if it meant confronting a powerful adversary. Their discussion was interrupted by a worker delivering news of a communication request from the Douglas family. Count Conrad, preparing for a potentially confrontational exchange, accepted the call. On the other end of the line, Count Douglas's anger was palpable as he demanded an explanation for what he perceived as theft. In response, Count Conrad maintained his composure, acknowledging Count Douglas's frustration while reminding him of the shared responsibility for the slush funds. He argued that the funds belonged to all creditors, not just to Count Douglas. Furthermore, he pointed out Count Douglas's own questionable actions, suggesting that Douglas had initially attempted to claim the funds for himself. Count Conrad believed he had presented a compelling case against Count Douglas's claims, hoping to reason with him. However, to his surprise, Count Douglas's anger only intensified. Count Douglas vehemently asserted his family's exclusive right to the funds, rejecting Count Conrad's arguments outright. Despite Count Conrad's attempts to assuage Count Douglas's anger, his efforts fell on deaf ears. Count Douglas adamantly declared his intention to contact the central government and initiate a territorial war against the entire Northeastern Alliance Association. He vowed to expose the perceived weakness of the Alliance in the aftermath of Barco's demise, painting a grim picture of their vulnerability without Barco's protection. Frightened by Count Douglas's words, Count Conrad quickly informed the other members that the Alliance Association was facing serious trouble. The scene transitions to Roman's office where Lucas conveys the news to Roman that, as Roman had anticipated, Douglas has declared war against the Alliance Association. Roman, maintaining his composed demeanor, remarks to Lucas that Count Douglas is a man who stands firm once he has spoken. He reassures Lucas that everything is proceeding according to Roman's meticulously devised plan. Acknowledging Count Conrad's meticulous nature, Roman explains that if Douglas were to take more drastic measures, Conrad would inevitably surrender even if it means relinquishing his pride. 
Roman instructs Lucas to initiate the spread of rumors immediately, emphasizing the importance of cornering Conrad, leaving him no room to retreat or avoid the impending conflict. Roman believes that when Conrad finds himself backed into a corner, he will likely discard his pride as a survival strategy. The scene then shifts to northern Cairo, a vibrant marketplace where an elderly food seller shares with a customer the palpable tension prevailing in the territory. The Northeastern Alliance Association's preparations to attack Count Douglas's country stir surprise among the marketgoers. Subsequently, a beggar, adorned in a worn cap, spreads the confirmed rumors derived directly from a Conrad family servant. The beggar recounts the aftermath of Conrad's call with Douglas, describing Conrad's fit of rage that resulted in the destruction of furniture. According to the beggar, Conrad is resolute in his determination to crush Douglas. The rumors of the Northeastern Alliance Association's alleged ill intentions against Count Douglas begin to circulate widely. The originators of these rumors are identified as merchants and servants, residing in the lowest echelons of society, all affiliated with the secretive house sect. The scene then shifts to Count Douglas, visibly angered by the circulating rumors, setting the stage for the unfolding political drama. Count Douglas, his voice resonating with authority, commands the presence of all his family officials, his demeanor heavy with determination. With unwavering resolve, he swears upon his family name that he will never forgive the Alliance Association for their perceived transgressions. During the magic call with Count Conrad and Count Douglas, the air hummed with tension as Count Conrad sought to soothe his companion's agitation. He reminded Count Douglas to maintain composure, emphasizing that the Alliance Association had not taken any aggressive actions. In fact, they were considering compensation in the form of monetary restitution as a gesture of reconciliation and to implore Count Douglas for forgiveness regarding the unfortunate incident. Count Conrad's voice carried a gentle insistence as he urged Count Douglas to quell his rising agitation, assuring him that the rumors swirling around did not align with the true intentions of the Alliance Association. In response, Count Douglas's tone bristled with indignation, dismissing Conrad's words with a rhetorical question about his perception. He made it clear that his purpose in contacting Conrad was not for negotiation but to declare war on the Alliance Association. Count Douglas scornfully labeled them as pathetic bats driven solely by self-interest, expressing his resolve to crush the association completely. His words echo with defiance, leaving little room for negotiation or compromise. With a decisive conclusion to the call, Count Conrad disconnects, leaving a palpable sense of concern among the other members. They express their apprehension to Count Conrad, acknowledging the gravity of the situation. They recognize the potential consequences of Count Douglas's actions, realizing that innocent civilians may become unwitting casualties in the brewing conflict. Faced with the daunting prospect of confronting Count Douglas alone, they entertain the idea of seeking assistance from the central government. Count Conrad, desperate to avert disaster, reaches out to the central government of Count Parchus in search of support. However, his plea for assistance is met with reluctance. Count Parchus acknowledges the severity of the situation but emphasizes the central government's inability to intervene. He urges Count Conrad to resolve the matter internally, leaving the Alliance Association to fend for themselves. As the weight of their predicament bears down upon them, the members of the Alliance Association grapple with the harsh reality of their circumstances. With external support out of reach, they resign themselves to the inevitability of war. The specter of conflict looms large, casting a shadow of uncertainty over their future. Just when all hope seems lost, a glimmer of opportunity emerges in the form of a surprise communication from Roman Dimitri. Upon receiving the call, Roman addresses Count Conrad, expressing his awareness of the Alliance Association's predicament. Upon hearing the unexpected call from Roman, Count Conrad's initial reaction is guarded, suspecting it to be an opportunity for Roman to ridicule the Alliance Association's plight. However, as Roman's tone proves genuine and his intent to uncover the truth apparent, Count Conrad's skepticism gives way to a sense of intrigue and cautious optimism. Roman's unexpected sincerity prompts Count Conrad to recount the escalating tensions with Count Douglas. Roman, sensing the gravity of the situation, expresses his concern about the impending clash in the northeastern region. He queries Count Conrad about his intentions in this critical moment. With a northeastern force poised to breach their borders, Roman feels a moral obligation to intervene, driven by a desire to prevent further escalation and bloodshed. Count Conrad, surprised by Roman's offer of assistance, questions the motives behind his sudden willingness to aid the Alliance Association. 
He wonders whether Roman's actions are purely altruistic or if there are ulterior motives at play. Nevertheless, Count Conrad remains open to the possibility of cooperation, recognizing the potential benefits of pooling their resources and strengths. Roman, in response to Count Conrad's inquiries, elucidates his stance. He explains that despite any past grievances between Dimitri and the Alliance Association, he cannot stand idly by his trouble brews in the Northeast. Roman's concern extends beyond personal vendettas. He is motivated by a broader commitment to maintaining peace and stability in the region. Count Conrad, realizing the sincerity behind Roman's words, begins to see the potential for collaboration. He acknowledges that Roman's concern for the region's stability aligns with his own interests. With a northeastern force looming on the horizon, Count Conrad recognizes the urgency of the situation and the need for swift action. Putting aside pride and past differences, Count Conrad extends an olive branch to Roman, offering the Alliance Association's cooperation in exchange for assistance. He pledges the Association's willingness to comply with any of Roman's requests, recognizing that their shared goal is to minimize losses and avert further conflict. Roman, weighing his options carefully, deliberates on the potential risks and rewards of extending aid to the Alliance Association. While he acknowledges that there may be short-term gains to be had by refraining from involvement, Roman ultimately prioritizes the long-term stability and unity of Cairo's political landscape. In the northeastern region, the need for cooperation between Dimitri and the Alliance Association becomes increasingly apparent. Count Conrad, initially surprised by Roman's genuine assistance to the Alliance Association, ponders the implications of this unexpected gesture. Roman's request is straightforward. He urges Dimitri and the Alliance Association to reconcile their differences and demonstrate a willingness to collaborate moving forward. He promises assistance to the Alliance Association if Count Conrad agrees to this proposition. Count Conrad, however, finds Roman's proposal somewhat absurd. After all, Dimitri's origins as a commoner family were once a source of disdain for him. Nevertheless, he acknowledges the need to deliberate on the matter thoroughly before offering a response. Several days later, all the Douglas soldiers convene, signaling the gravity of the situation at hand. An official reminds Count Douglas of the necessity to establish clear terms for the post-war landscape. Count Douglas, understanding the weight of the moment, readily agrees, showing his commitment to addressing the aftermath of the conflict. Count Douglas reflects on the recent fall of the Barco family, a development that has left the northeastern region fractured and vulnerable. He recognizes the opportunity presented by this power vacuum understanding the importance of seizing control of such a valuable territory. Amidst the discussions, Count Douglas's officials express their enthusiasm for the prospect of claiming power in the northeastern region. Despite the perception that Douglas is merely a brute devoid of strategic thinking, he proves otherwise by refraining from reckless attacks on his adversaries. Douglas operates with calculated precision, ensuring that any confrontation maximizes his odds of success. This calculated approach has been key to Douglas's survival thus far. He understood the futility of rash action against Barco while they enjoyed the protection of the central government. However, now Douglas is confident in his ability to rally even the territorial lord of the north to his cause, a testament to his strategic acumen and growing influence. Recognizing the weakened state of the Northeastern Alliance Association without Barco's backing, with the absence of their former protectors, the Alliance Association appeared vulnerable their territory ripe for the taking. As Count Douglas confronted the Alliance Association forces, he demanded to speak with their commanding officer, eager to assert his dominance. However, the Alliance Association insisted that it wasn't the designated time for negotiation and asked Count Douglas to wait patiently. Count Douglas, growing impatient, questioned the logic of delaying when all their forces were already assembled, insinuating that they were squandering their efforts on a futile endeavor. Suddenly, a soldier alerted Count Douglas to an approaching figure. Anticipating reinforcements for the Alliance Association, Count Douglas was astonished to see the flag of Dimitri and Roman Dimitri himself leading a troop. His surprise was palpable as he struggled to comprehend Roman's unexpected presence on the battlefield. As Roman steps forward, he presents Count Douglas with a compelling argument regarding Dimitri's sudden appearance on the battlefield. Much like how Count Douglas has rallied the Lords of the North to his cause, Roman suggests that he, too, is mobilizing his forces to aid the Alliance Association. A revelation that stunned not only Count Douglas, but also the Northern Lords who had gathered alongside him. The realization dawned upon Count Douglas that Roman had astutely manipulated the situation, 
leveraging Count Douglas's call for assistance from other lords to justify his involvement in the war. Feeling blindsided, Count Douglas pondered the implications of Roman's strategic maneuver, realizing that his plan had backfired spectacularly. Meanwhile, the northern lords expressed their frustration at not being informed of Roman's participation, lamenting that they would have reconsidered joining the battle had they known about it beforehand. Amidst the rising tension, Count Conrad, ever the voice of reason, urged Count Douglas to prepare for engagement, emphasizing the need to proceed with caution. Count Douglas, feeling a surge of frustration and uncertainty, grappled with the sudden turn of events. Just as the situation seemed to teeter on the brink of conflict, Roman intervened, offering the Northerners a choice, engage in close combat or opt for an all-out battle. Count Douglas found himself stunned at the unexpected turn of events. Roman Dimitri, a figure of formidable repute, was joining the fray. The declaration of war had left Count Douglas feeling compelled to stand firm, yet the prospect of engaging Roman's forces head-on seemed to spell certain defeat. Even considering the alternative of close combat filled him with trepidation. While Count Douglas boasted superior numbers compared to the Northeastern Alliance Association, Roman's prowess as a warrior cast a shadow of doubt over their chances of emerging victorious. Count Douglas was at a loss, grappling with the daunting task of devising a strategy to navigate the impending conflict. With a flourish, Roman presents Count Douglas with a bold proposal. He offers to engage in combat with three swordsmen simultaneously. Should Count Douglas remain concerned, Roman is open to increasing the number of soldiers to five. Count Douglas is taken aback by the audacity of the suggestion. While he acknowledges Dimitri's strength, the notion that Roman would propose something so outrageous leaves him incredulous. Roman voices his earnest wish for a conflict resolution with minimal turmoil, expressing hope for a peaceful settlement. Turning to Count Douglas, he awaits his response. Count Douglas, needing a moment of reflection, requests time to consider the matter. The scene transitions to a tranquil forest clearing, where Count Douglas stands among five northern lords. After careful consideration, he presents his decision to embrace Roman's proposal. He reasoned that with five soldiers from their side, they stood a fighting chance against Roman, despite his fearsome reputation. Count Douglas posited that the combined strength of their forces could potentially overcome Roman's formidable skill in combat. However, two of the northern lords voiced apprehension, citing the danger of underestimating Roman's capabilities. They pointed to Roman's previous triumph over Butler a testament to his prowess as a swordsman, as evidence of the peril they faced. Despite the reservations expressed by some of the northern lords, Count Douglas remained resolute in his conviction to confront Roman head-on. He argued that their options were limited, as regardless of their decision, they would inevitably find themselves locked in battle with Roman. Drawing upon the past successes of his twin swordsmen against a four-star opponent, Count Douglas expressed confidence in their ability to hold their own against Roman. While acknowledging the rumors surrounding Roman strength, Count Douglas remained steadfast in his belief that they could rise to the challenge. The unfolding events presented Count Douglas and the Northern Lords with a strategic opportunity. They viewed Roman's impulsive decision to engage in combat as a chance to exploit his overconfidence. Count Douglas saw a potential route to victory. If they could eliminate Roman during his boastful display of strength, they could seize control of the entire northeastern region. With unanimous agreement from the Northern Lords, they resolved to implement Count Douglas's strategy, determined to make Roman regret his arrogance. As the battle commenced, an observer from the central government arrived to oversee the proceedings, further intensifying the stakes. Now, the odds were overwhelmingly against Roman, with five adversaries poised to confront him. As the scene unfolds just before the impending battle, two twin soldiers, Vinton, the elder brother, and Vintel, the younger, strategize with the other three soldiers. They outline a plan where Vintel and Vintin will approach Roman from opposing sides, targeting his vulnerable blind spot. While the twins divert Roman's attention, they instruct the other soldiers to engage him. Confident in their coordinated attack, the twins assure the group that despite Roman's prowess, their strategy will create openings for a fatal strike. Promising shared fame and wealth, they urge the supporting soldiers to assist them in securing victory. With everyone poised in their positions, the duel commences. The twins channel their energy and charge at Roman in unison, their determination palpable. However, despite their synchronized assault, Roman swiftly incapacitates them with a single, decisive strike. Count Douglas and the Northern Lords watched in stunned silence as their allies fell before Roman's overwhelming strength. After swiftly incapacitating the twins, Roman turns to Count Douglas and the Northern Lords. 
With a composed demeanor, he reveals his inner turmoil since learning of Count Douglas's declaration of war. Roman recounts the days when negotiation was favored during the reign of the Barco family. He questions why dialogue was never attempted with Dimitri in the Alliance Association. Coming to a somber realization, Roman concludes that the Northern Lords, including Count Douglas, underestimated the significance of Roman Dimitri's family legacy. This revelation deeply unsettles him. In a solemn tone, Roman offers Count Douglas and the Northern Lords a final opportunity to reconsider their stance on the impending conflict. He proposes an alternative, either they withdraw from the battle altogether or opt for a conventional engagement. Count Douglas is taken aback by this unexpected proposition. Contemplating the options, he realizes that in a standard war scenario, numerous soldiers under his command would inevitably perish. Faced with this grim prospect, Count Douglas weighs his choices and concludes that he would prefer to minimize casualties, opting instead to sacrifice only the five soldiers involved in the current strategy. Determined to uphold the rules they had set, Count Douglas resolved to see their decision through to the end. Accepting Count Douglas's resolve, Roman agreed to proceed as planned. However, the remaining three soldiers from Count Douglas's faction recognized that the battle was effectively over. They hesitated, contemplating ending the fight then and there. Observing their reluctance, Roman anticipated their surrender, viewing it as an act of cowardice. In an attempt to level the playing field, Roman dropped his sword, opting to fight unarmed. With unwavering confidence, he invited the soldiers to continue their attack. The soldiers, mindful of the dishonor that would accompany their retreat, decided to press forward. Believing they could overcome Roman now that he was unarmed, they charged at him with determination. In a swift and decisive move, Roman shatters a soldier's sword with a powerful punch, the impact landing squarely on the soldier's face. With fluid precision, he incapacitates the other two soldiers as they attempt to surrender. Ignoring their pleas, Roman relentlessly pummels them into submission, leaving no room for mercy. After subduing the soldiers, Roman fixes Count Douglas and the other northern lords with a stern gaze, his expression unyielding. With a tone heavy with authority, he demands if there are any objections. Count Douglas and the other lords, their heads bowed in acknowledgement, murmur in unison that there are no objections to be made. Returning to Count Conrad, Roman received a gesture of gratitude as Count Conrad bowed and expressed appreciation for Roman's assistance in the war. Roman assured Count Conrad of his commitment to their partnership moving forward. Count Conrad reflected that had the Alliance Association opted for an all-out war against Dimitri, they would have suffered defeat instead. True to Roman's plan, the hierarchy of the northeastern region had now been established clearly. A few days later, the scene shifted to the conference room of the Northeastern Alliance Association. Count Conrad and other members sat around the table, with Roman Dimitri occupying the central seat. Roman announced that his father had granted him full authority in the matter at hand. He inquired if anyone had any objections, but silence prevailed. With a smile, Roman declared that he had news to share with everyone present. As Roman surveyed the faces around the table, his inquiry hung heavy in the air like a veil of uncertainty. Do you believe that the Cairo Kingdom is charting the right course? He asked, his voice carrying the weight of contemplation. It wasn't the invasion by Hector that plagued Roman's thoughts the most, but that alone was a cause for concern. No, what nodded him were the fissures within Cairo itself. The lack of trust from the commanders of the Southern Front echoed louder in his mind than the clash of swords on distant battlefields. Meanwhile, in the hallowed halls of the central government, needless power struggles raged like storms on a turbulent sea. Were it not for Roman and his valiant soldiers, the southern front would have crumbled like a sandcastle before the tide, leaving Cairo at the mercy of Hector's forces. Roman's gaze hardened as he continued, each word etched with a resolve forged in the fires of adversity. Should another conflict arise, at that moment, the central government will not hesitate to conscript soldiers from every corner of our realm casting them into the fray like pawns on a chessboard. And while the nobles mourn their fallen warriors, the aristocracy of the central government will only tighten their grasp on power, their influence swelling like a tide of self-interest within the kingdom. As the tension thickened around the table, it became evident that facing the harsh realities of their situation was imperative. Each count listened intently to Roman, their expressions a canvas of surprise painted with strokes of concern. Addressing them with a measured tone, Roman underscored the necessity for change. We must acknowledge the root cause of this conflict, the unjust treatment we endure, he asserted. His proposal hung in the air like a beacon of hope amidst the storm. Just as the nobles in the capital leveraged the central government for their own gain, why can't we, the northeastern region, 
band together, and protect each other? Roman contemplated the unfolding scenario, recognizing the impending shift in dynamics once Dimitri initiated action. He understood that the central government would seize the opportunity to limit his maneuvering time. It was imperative for Roman to consolidate the northeastern region, unifying its factions. Such unity would not only fortify his position but also serve as a deterrent against hasty actions from the central government. Jonathan's voice cut through the tension, probing the depths of Roman's plan. But will our unity grant us true influence, even in the face of the central government's power? He questioned, voicing the doubts that lingered in the hearts of many around the table. Yet, if Jonathan were to exclude territories like Lawrence's from the fold, the northeastern expanse would reveal its stark reality, a landscape teetering on the edge of desolation. Most families in these lands rely heavily on imports from neighboring regions to sustain themselves. Jonathan elaborated, emphasizing the critical point that if the northeastern region dared to defy the central government, it risked severing access to essential supplies. The interconnectedness of northeastern businesses with the central authority created a dependency that seemed insurmountable. Breaking this cycle was essential. Otherwise, the nobles residing outside the capital would find themselves inexorably bound to the will of the central government, with scant opportunity for independent action. Roman addressed the assembled counts at the table, conveying that with unanimous agreement and collaboration, he believed they could, at the very least, find a solution to the pressing issue of rations. Roman shows everyone a paper and states that this is the future development plan of the northeastern region. Our lands may be rugged, but they hold untapped potential, he proclaimed, gesturing to the sprawling mountains that dominated Dimitri's domain. Dimitri's realm boasted an expanse of boundless mountain ranges, a natural fortress, ideal for repelling enemy incursions. Roman envisioned the construction of a formidable stronghold within these rugged peaks, a sanctuary where the people could seek refuge in times of strife. Once reclaimed, these mountains would not only serve as a bulwark against external threats, but also as fertile grounds for cultivation, fostering the region's self-sufficiency. Count Conrad voiced his skepticism, questioning the feasibility of such ambitious plans. Roman assured Count Conrad, it is indeed possible. Roman reflected on his past experiences. The case of the heavenly demon divine cult stood out as a formidable fortress, capable of enduring relentless assaults from the orthodox Murim for several years. Nestled within the 10,000 mountains region, its defenses were bolstered by sprawling mountain ranges stretching hundreds of kilometers. Roman drew parallels between this legendary stronghold and the terrain of Dimitri's domain, noting the abundance of blacksmiths within its borders. Was it mere coincidence, or the hand of fate guiding their path? Roman laid out the plans before the assembled nobles, each sheet of paper a testament to his vision. Marked areas signified where reclamation efforts were underway, a tangible sign of progress amidst uncertainty. With a measured tone, Roman assured them of the time and dedication required, yet promised that their efforts would yield the strength needed to stand firm against the central government's encroachment. As the counts scrutinized the documents, they marveled at the meticulousness of Roman strategy. Jonathan's astonishment was palpable, noting the intricate detail woven into both the reclamation plans and fortress blueprints. It was evident that Roman's suggestion was more than mere conjecture, it was a blueprint for action. Viscount Lawrence pledged his family's allegiance to Dimitri's cause, a sentiment echoed by the Conrad family. With unanimous agreement, the nobles aligned themselves with Roman's vision. With a sense of finality, Roman christened their union the Dimitri Alliance, symbolizing the region's newfound unity under Dimitri's leadership. The scene transitions to Romero Dimitri's office, where he contemplates Roman's plan, relayed to him by Jonathan. Despite harboring a twinge of regret for Rodwell, who had dedicated himself tirelessly, Romero acknowledges that Roman has become an irreplaceable figure within the Dimitri family. Standing before the window, he remarks on the brilliance of the moon, a silent observer to the unfolding events below. Meanwhile, Marquis Valentino finds himself consumed by frustration in his own domain. For weeks, he has been plagued by unanswered questions, sparked by a letter from Dimitri's esteemed blacksmith, Hendrix. In it, Hendrix reveals that none of his crafted swords have ever graced the auction house. Perplexed, Marquis Valentino embarks on a fruitless quest to uncover the elusive artisan behind the legendary blade, reaching out to countless blacksmiths to no avail. As Marquis Valentino delves deeper into his quest for answers, a worker enters his chambers bearing unexpected news. Someone has reportedly spotted a sword resembling blaze in the possession of a master blacksmith from the Dimitri estate. 
Astonished by this revelation, Marquis Valentino wastes no time in issuing orders to hasten his journey to the Dimitri estate. Upon arrival, he is greeted by Hendrik, Dimitri's master blacksmith, who inquires about the purpose of Valentino's visit. Cutting straight to the heart of the matter, Valentino recounts his acquisition of Blaze at the Adelian auction house a month prior. Hendrik confirms having read Valentino's letter regarding the sword. Valentino wastes no time in presenting Blaze to Hendrik, emphasizing its extraordinary craftsmanship and unique ability to channel mana flawlessly. Convinced that the artisan behind Blaze must be among the finest in Cairo, Valentino eagerly awaits Hendrik's reaction as the master blacksmith lays eyes on the remarkable blade. Observing Hendrik's expression, Marquis Valentino's confidence in his suspicions grows. He informs Hendrik that it appears he indeed possesses a sword akin to Blaze, citing a recent report he had received. Hendrik takes a moment to mull over Valentino's words before agreeing to retrieve the sword. Valentino's anticipation swells as he waits, his excitement palpable. Hendrik, meanwhile, considers the implications of Valentino's interest. Surely, a collector of Valentino's stature would appreciate the significance of the sword he is about to unveil. With a sense of ceremony, Hendrik presents the blade to Valentino, revealing its name, Salamander. As Valentino lays eyes on the sword, a shiver runs down his spine. His intuition tells him that Salamander is none other than the magnum opus of the artisan responsible for Blaze. Hendrik confirms Valentino's suspicion. Both Blaze and Salamander were indeed crafted by the same skilled hand. However, he clarifies that Salamander was the initial creation, predating Blaze. Valentino's mind whirls with the implications of this revelation. He desires to possess the Salamander sword. Carefully broaching the subject, Valentino inquires if Hendrik would consider selling Salamander. Hendrik's response dashes Valentino's hopes. The sword is not for sale. It was a gift, and as such, holds sentimental value beyond its craftsmanship. Valentino is taken aback by this revelation, realizing that Hendrik not only possesses knowledge of the sword's artisan but also has a personal connection to them. Valentino's thoughts raise as he considers the implications. Could the retired Baron Romero be the elusive artisan behind these extraordinary swords? The pieces of the puzzle begin to fall into place fueling Valentino's determination to unravel the mystery surrounding Blaze and Salamander. Hendrik's revelation stuns Marquis Valentino. Salamander was not the creation of Baron Romero, but rather the handiwork of Roman Dimitri, the eldest son of Dimitri. Valentino's mind races as he processes this information. Roman Dimitri, the youngest ranker in Cairo and the creator of the kingdom's finest sword, this changes everything. Valentino understands the significance of the story behind each masterpiece. If a sword is merely crafted by an artisan, its value is judged solely by its quality. However, a sword forged by the youngest genius swordsman of the kingdom carries a different weight. Its rarity alone could drive its value skyward. Realizing the potential implications, Valentino knows he must meet with Roman Dimitri at once. The scene transitions to the training grounds of Dimitri. Chris and Roman engage in a practice match, their blades dancing in the air with calculated precision. Chris, with a ferocity fueled by determination, launches a relentless assault upon Roman. Yet, with a grace born of experience, Roman effortlessly evades each of Chris's strikes, his movements fluid and precise. However, amidst their spar, Roman's keen eyes catch sight of a figure standing beside Hans, a glimmer of opportunity amidst the chaos. Seizing upon this opening, Chris channels his aura into a powerful strike, unleashing a surge of energy that erupts into a formidable explosion. As the dust settles and the echoes of the blast fade away, the assembled soldiers gaze in astonishment at the scene before them, Roman standing tall, victorious over his adversary. Acknowledging Chris's formidable tactic, Roman offers words of praise tempered with wisdom. He advises Chris that while such sudden bursts of power may be effective, they also leave one vulnerable to counterattacks. Encouraging Chris to consider a strategy that disrupts their opponent's balance more subtly, Roman's guidance underscores his depth of understanding in combat. Observing the exchange from the sidelines, Marquis Valentino cannot help but marvel at the strength and skill displayed by Roman Dimitri. Indeed, Roman's name has become a topic of fervent discussion throughout the kingdom, particularly following his recent victory over the second-ranked fighter from Hector. Lost in contemplation, Marquis Valentino muses on the potential accolades that await Roman within the ranks of Cairo. Having witnessed Roman's prowess firsthand, he ponders the implications of Roman's rise to prominence, recognizing the shifting tides of power and influence within the kingdom. 
Marquis Valentino's mind churned with newfound respect as he observed Roman in person. It was clear that Roman surpassed the mere rumors and whispers that circulated about him. The notion of someone like Roman, a humble blacksmith from the depths of the Cairo kingdom, potentially being the most gifted individual on the entire continent, was a revelation that stirred Marquis Valentino's thoughts. His musings were interrupted by Hans's announcement of a guest. Roman turned to see Marquis Valentino enter, and without hesitation, extended his hand in greeting. Marquis Valentino couldn't help but marvel at the thought that this was the very hand that had forged the legendary blade. Blaze. With a smile, he reciprocated the handshake and introduced himself in turn. Moving to a more private setting, Marquis Valentino revealed the purpose of his visit, Blaze. Roman's eyes fell upon the sword, recognizing it as the very weapon he had entrusted to Lucas. Marquis Valentino explained that he had marshaled the considerable resources of his family to uncover the truth behind Blaze's creation. With a directness born of his reputation as the wealthiest man in the Cairo kingdom, Marquis Valentino asked Roman the pivotal question, was he truly the artisan who had forged Blaze? Meanwhile, Roman couldn't help but ponder the irony of the situation. Here stood Marquis Valentino, known far and wide as the greedy collector, Valentino stood as a figure of considerable influence among the neutral factions, commanding the most formidable troops named Mong and holding sway over Cairo's bustling commerce. His wealth was a force to be reckoned with, capable of tilting the delicate balance of power in any direction. Yet, despite this potential for upheaval, Valentino had demonstrated unwavering determination in maintaining equilibrium among the four factions. To Roman, Valentino was a fascinating character, a man whose actions spoke volumes about his shrewdness and foresight. As their conversation unfolded, Roman confirmed to Valentino that indeed, he was the master craftsman behind the creation of Blaze. The admission seemed to elevate Valentino to the status of a fervent admirer, as he expressed his profound gratitude for the opportunity to meet the renowned blacksmith. Valentino recounted his relentless pursuit of Roman, describing the electrifying moment when he first laid eyes on Blaze at an auction house, a moment that felt akin to being struck by lightning. He praised Dimitri as the hallowed ground of blacksmiths, prompting him to inquire about Roman's lineage and the source of his remarkable talent. With a sense of reverence, Valentino requested to see the sword that had captivated his attention mere moments ago. In response to Valentino's inquiry, Roman offered a nod of assent before presenting his blade. Valentino's eyes widened in astonishment as he beheld the sword in his hands. With a mixture of curiosity and admiration, he inquired about the name of the blade. Roman, with a hint of pride in his voice, revealed that he had christened it Darkness. Valentino's mind whirled with thoughts as he processed this revelation. He reflected on the legendary status of swords like Salamander and Blaze, acknowledging their unprecedented craftsmanship and power. Yet, in the presence of darkness, a blade infused with intense darkness, he recognized a whole new level of artistry and mastery. The notion of Roman's continuous growth as a blacksmith intrigued Valentino. He pondered the potential of future creations, wondering just how much more formidable Roman swords could become. With a gleam of excitement in his eyes, Valentino presented Roman with a special proposition. His conditions were straightforward. Firstly, if Roman ever decided to sell his swords, Valentino wished to be given the opportunity to purchase them. Secondly, Valentino expressed a desire to be the first to witness each new creation forged by Roman, regardless of location or circumstance. Marquis Valentino's determination to reach Roman was palpable, his expression brimming with enthusiasm as he addressed him. With a sense of urgency, he conveyed to Roman that if he could offer his assurance on two pivotal points, the entire Valentino family would throw their support behind Dimitri henceforth. Roman's surprise was evident as he processed the gravity of Valentino's words. Was Valentino, known for his neutrality, truly considering abandoning that stance? Valentino, sensing Roman's astonishment, emphasized the significance of his proposal. By aligning with Dimitri, the Valentino family would be relinquishing the neutrality they had upheld for so long, a decision not to be taken lightly. Curious about Valentino's motives, Roman pressed for an explanation. In response, Valentino admitted to feeling mounting pressure from the four factions in recent times. Recognizing that neutrality could not be maintained indefinitely, Valentino had begun contemplating which faction to support when the time inevitably came. Learning of Roman's role in founding the Dimitri Alliance and his prowess as the artisan behind Blaze only strengthened Valentino's inclination towards him. To Valentino, the logic was clear. 
With Roman's leadership and expertise, aligning with Dimitri seemed not only logical but also advantageous. Marquis Valentino couldn't deny the financial stability of the Dimitri family. Yet the allure of greater wealth remained irresistible. With a wry smile, he confessed to being truly captivated by Roman Dimitri's proposition, recognizing the potential benefits of aligning with such a formidable force. Roman's reaction was swift and resolute. Rising to his feet, he reaffirmed the loyalty pledged by the nobles of the Dimitri alliance to their family name. With a stern expression, he posed a critical question to Valentino. Was the Valentino family prepared to stand alongside Dimitri? Valentino's smile was genuine as he bowed in deference to Roman, assuring him of the unwavering commitment of the Valentino family. He pledged that they would follow Roman's lead without hesitation, even if it meant braving the flames of adversity. Roman couldn't help but be surprised by Valentino's unwavering loyalty and unexpected ally in their midst. With a warm smile, Roman expressed his gratitude for Valentino's support, acknowledging the significance of their newfound alliance. From that moment on, Roman made it clear that he would depend on Marquis Valentino's steadfastness. In a moment of transparency, Valentino sought Roman's permission to reveal the truth about his role in forging Blaze. With a grin, Valentino expressed his excitement over acquiring such an extraordinary sword. He playfully remarked that he would be overwhelmed with frustration if he couldn't boast about it to everyone he encountered. Roman couldn't help but marvel at Valentino's unique charisma, granting him permission to share the news with the world. The scene then shifted to the grand halls of the Valentino family palace, where Marquis Valentino proudly displayed the fabled artisan sword to a gathering of nobles. He regaled his friends with tales of its remarkable abilities, asserting that even a swordsman of modest skill could repel the aura of a more seasoned opponent. Intrigued, Valentino's friends sought confirmation of the sword's capabilities. With a twinkle in his eye, Valentino assured them that he had never misled them about his collections before. Moreover, he emphasized the illustrious pedigree of the sword's creator, the same artisan who had famously driven away Hector, earning him the title of Cairo's hero, Roman Dimitri of the blacksmith family. Excitement rippled through the gathering as Valentino's friends connected the dots. This was the very sword Roman had wielded to defeat Butler, a fact that added to its mystique. Valentino continued to share insights, revealing that Blaze was just one of three remarkable swords crafted by Roman thus far. In light of this revelation, the assembled individuals began to affectionately refer to them as the Roman Dimitri Collection. As Roman's fame soared, the Dimitri blacksmiths experienced an unprecedented surge in business, straining to keep pace with the newfound demand. One night, within the opulent halls of the Dimitri Palace, Roman strolled through the corridors deep in thought. Suddenly, a figure cloaked in secrecy emerged from the shadows. Mackin, an agent of Valhalla Intelligence, approached Roman with a solemn message. Not only had Roman vanquished Hector, but he had also emerged victorious against Butler, a feat that had not gone unnoticed by Valhalla. Mackin confessed that Valhalla had underestimated Roman's influence and power, especially with the recent formation of the independent organization known as the Dimitri Alliance in the northeastern region. In Mackin's eyes, Roman had become a significant threat to the future plans of the Valhalla Empire. Mackin asked Roman to decide whether he would follow Valhalla or become its enemy. With a smirk and a gleam in his eyes, Roman asked Mackin, Why should I obey Valhalla's orders? In the dimly lit chamber, Mackin's words hung heavy in the air as he confronted Roman. Mackin, with a steely gaze, warned Roman of his anticipated hostility towards Valhalla. But Roman, unfazed, stood his ground. Let's get things straight, Roman retorted, his voice laced with determination. He reminded Mackin that it was Mackin himself who had initiated the threat against him. Roman made it clear that he harbored no intention of coercing anyone into swearing allegiance to him. His principles remained steadfast even in the face of looming conflict. As Mackin's words lingered, Roman's mind raced. He couldn't shake the conviction that the Cairo Kingdom was a prime target groomed by the Kronos Empire for years. The prospect of Valhalla's aggression against Cairo ignited a spark of concern within Roman. He knew all too well that such actions would not go unanswered by the formidable Kronos Empire. With a grave expression, Roman leveled a serious gaze at Mackin. He conveyed a warning veiled in determination, urging Mackin to reconsider his stance. If Mackin dared not to become Roman's adversary, he needed to exercise patience. Roman assured Mackin that the group he had assembled would ascend to the pinnacle of Cairo's power, with Dimitri emerging as the linchpin of change. Mackin, taken aback by Roman's resolve, acknowledged his boldness. 
Mackin's words resonated in the air as he cautioned Roman against carrying himself with undue pride. He warned Roman that such arrogance would inevitably attract challenges and adversaries. Even someone like Butler, whom Roman had struggled to overcome, was considered insignificant in the grand scheme of Valhalla. Mackin emphasized the vastness of the continent, implying the multitude of potential threats lurking within it. Before disappearing into the shadows, Mackin granted Roman a reprieve, promising him additional time to contemplate his next moves. Mackin expressed genuine hope that Roman would exercise wisdom in his decision-making. With the formation of the Dimitri Alliance, the political landscape of Cairo shifted. Each faction reached out to Roman, beseeching him to make a decisive choice. The weight of their expectations bore down on Roman's shoulders as he contemplated the path ahead. Meanwhile, in the opulent confines of Marquis Benedict's office, tension simmered beneath the surface. A concerned worker dared to question Marquis Benedict's intentions regarding Roman. Marquis Benedict's response dripped with calculated ambiguity. If Roman were to align himself with Marquis Benedict, all past transgressions would be forgiven. However, should Roman opt for any faction other than the one Marquis Benedict represents, he solemnly pledges to ensure that Roman faces the repercussions of his decisions and actions. Back in Roman's quarters, he found himself gazing out of the window, lost in thought. As the Dimitri alliance had deftly exploited the delicate balance of power, yet Roman understood that their time was limited. The upcoming year would be crucial, a fleeting window of opportunity that must be seized with precision. The looming specter of war cast a shadow over the Dimitri alliance, signaling inevitable losses and sacrifices on the horizon. Roman, cognizant of the impending conflict, realized the urgent need to fortify his skills, particularly in mastering magic, an indispensable asset in the impending turmoil. In the vast expanse of the continent lay thirteen formidable magic towers, each a bastion of arcane power. Among them, the magic tower of the Heavenly Palace stood as a pinnacle of magical prowess. Here, a grand conference convened, gathering representatives from each tower to showcase their achievements and advancements. Despite the Phoenix Tower's impressive display of Fifth Circle magic, it was met with apathy from the attending mages. The reason behind the Phoenix Tower's subdued reactions stemmed from a fundamental issue plaguing them, a crisis of identity. This unique dilemma afflicted only the Phoenix Tower, stemming from the loss of their ancient grimoire, a cherished artifact passed down through generations. Within the confines of the Phoenix Magic Tower, Felix, acting as the tower's proxy, grappled with the weight of responsibility. Three years prior, Felix had unexpectedly assumed the mantle of leadership, thrust into a position for which he felt ill-prepared. His mentor's disappearance left a void, compounding the challenges he faced. The inability to inherit the burning grimoire, a revered artifact of the Phoenix Tower, further underscored Felix's inadequacy in the eyes of his peers. As disillusionment spread among the Tower's members, the once-thriving community dwindled, exacerbated by the loss of funding from the Frank Empire. In the midst of despair, a glimmer of hope emerged in an unexpected form, a letter bearing the seal of Roman Dimitri. The missive bore a proposition that stirred both surprise and intrigue within Felix's troubled heart. In exchange for the Dimitri Alliance's assistance, Felix was offered a role as Roman's sparring partner for the next six months, with a generous stipend of 1,000 gold coins granted monthly. The offer, though distant, presented a lifeline amid the encroaching darkness. In the realm of necessity, Felix found himself devoid of the luxury of choice. Despite any reservations or hesitations, his path led directly to Dimitri, a journey he must undertake. As he journeyed in a carriage towards his destination, Felix contemplated the renown of the Dimitri family, known as the Sacred Land of Blacksmiths. It was a place seemingly uninterested in the arcane arts, contrasting sharply with the prominence of magic towers scattered across the continent. Among these towers, the Heavenly Palace Tower stood as a beacon of magical prowess, while seven others resided within the Kronos Empire, revered as sacred lands for mages. In contrast, Cairo, and by extension, Dimitri, were often regarded as barren lands for magic. Yet, despite this perception, Dimitri held a reputation as a formidable force, situated in the remote northeastern reaches of Cairo. Roman's invitation was the sole catalyst propelling Felix towards Dimitri's gates. The Phoenix Tower, facing its own existential crisis, focused solely on acquiring the necessary funds to sustain its survival. With this imperative driving him forward, Felix's journey culminated in the sight of Dimitri's entrance, a scene marked by meticulous order and efficiency. Approaching the entry point, Felix encountered a guard whose stern demeanor belied the precision of his duties. 
Halting Felix's progress, the guard inquired about his purpose. Felix, composed yet eager, identified himself and disclosed his purpose, an invitation from Sir Roman Dimitri. Observing the scene, Felix couldn't help but marvel at the systematic and orderly nature of Dimitri. The precision in the movements of the guards and the strategically placed magical devices, along with the imposing fortress walls in case of war, led Felix to conclude that Dimitri's defense was flawless. Despite being a remote territory, Dimitri had earned its reputation as a formidable force that demanded recognition. Within Dimitri's confines, Felix finally met Roman face to face. Roman's commanding presence and aura of authority were unmistakable. With a firm handshake and a direct gaze, Roman welcomed Felix into his domain. In Roman's presence, Felix couldn't help but feel a sense of reverence. There was something about him that transcended the ordinary, a quality that commanded respect and admiration. Gathering his thoughts, Felix wasted no time in getting to the heart of the matter. Felix inquired of Roman, seeking assurance about the terms set forth in the letter Roman had dispatched to him. Roman reassured Felix about the terms laid out in the letter he had sent, confirming that Felix would indeed receive 1,000 gold per month for six months as compensation for serving as his sparring partner. This amounted to a total of 6,000 gold, a significant sum by any measure. However, Felix couldn't help but express his confusion. He questioned why Roman had singled him out for this role when there were likely numerous candidates eager to spar with someone of Roman stature. Roman's response shed light on his decision-making process. He acknowledged the formidable reputation of the Phoenix Tower's flame magic, recognizing Felix's exceptional skills in this domain. Moreover, Roman acknowledged the challenges currently faced by the Phoenix Tower, implying that Felix's assistance was particularly valuable during this precarious time. In Roman's eyes, compensating Felix appropriately was a means of securing the expertise and time of a mage as skilled as Felix. Furthermore, Roman made it clear that he bore full responsibility for any harm that might befall him during their training sessions. As long as Felix committed to giving his utmost effort in every bout, he wouldn't be held accountable for any adverse outcomes. With a serious demeanor, Felix contemplated whether Roman truly understood the implications of their agreement or if he was perhaps underestimating the abilities of mages in general. The scene then shifted to the training grounds of Dimitri, where Roman and Felix faced off against each other. Roman generously offered Felix the first move, a gesture that Felix eagerly accepted. With determination in his eyes, Felix unleashed his formidable fire lance magic, triggering a powerful explosion. As Roman deftly evaded Felix's attack, Felix found himself face to face with Roman behind him. Undeterred, Felix unleashed his inferno spell, directing a blaze towards Roman. However, Roman found himself hemmed in by walls of fire conjured by Felix's spell on both sides. Undeterred, Felix launched his final spell, Rune Flare, with all the force he could muster. As the spell hurtled towards Roman, Felix was convinced that he had successfully immobilized his opponent. Yet, to his astonishment, Roman emerged and scathed, standing behind him with a hint of amusement in his eyes. Roman's casual remark about Felix's reluctance to employ fifth circle magic left Felix momentarily speechless. Felix watched in disbelief as Roman emerged and scathed from the flames. Roman's calm demeanor amidst the inferno unsettled Felix, prompting him to spring into action. As Roman reached out, Felix instinctively activated his blink magic, sidestepping Roman's grasp and creating a brief respite. But Roman was swift. In the blink of an eye, he closed the distance between them, catching Felix off guard. With a surge of determination, Felix unleashed his hold spell, hoping to restrain Roman momentarily. Despite Roman's efforts to break free, Felix maintained his grip, buying himself precious seconds to strategize. Felix knew it was time to prove his worth. With a steely resolve, he unleashed his inferno burning spell, sending waves of fire in all directions. Yet, to his astonishment, Roman effortlessly evaded each flame, reappearing before Felix with a knowing smirk. Their sparring session concluded. Roman announced their meeting for the following day. Surprised and defeated, Felix found himself sprawled on the ground after his encounter with Roman Dimitri. Contemplating his defeat, Felix couldn't shake the feeling that Roman had somehow anticipated the magic he would employ. Knowing that there were no techniques capable of foreseeing magic, Felix was left wondering how Roman had managed to do so. Frustration welled up within Felix as he pondered the prospect of facing Roman in battle again. Doubt crept in as Felix realized that, under the current circumstances, he stood little chance of defeating Roman. Recognizing the need for a new approach, 
Felix resolved to engage in deeper contemplation and strategic planning. Since the disappearance of the Phoenix Tower Master, Felix had dedicated himself to mastering the secrets of fire magic. Despite the tower's looming demise, he remained undeterred, driven by an unyielding determination to keep its legacy alive. His relentless pursuit had earned him admiration from his peers, who regarded him as a beacon of strength and resilience in the face of adversity. As dawn broke on the next day, Felix found himself once again facing Roman. With a sense of urgency, he cast another spell, as Felix mulled over Roman's seemingly preternatural ability to anticipate his magical maneuvers, he resolved to shift his strategy. Convinced that confounding Roman's predictions could provide an edge, Felix summoned a towering cliff using his Stone Age spell, blocking Roman's path. Roman's reaction, a serene smile, prompted Felix to reflect on the inherent advantage of magic. Unlike physical combat, magic offered a fluidity that didn't hinge on pinpoint precision. This observation emboldened Felix as he launched a fire wave spell at Roman. Yet, Roman effortlessly dodged the fiery onslaught, evading with a nimble leap into the air. Unfazed by the evasion, Felix pressed on, unleashing a barrage of fire cannons aimed directly at Roman. But once more, Roman deflected the attack, erecting a barrier with his sword in a display of remarkable skill and precision. Felix's mind raced, contemplating whether Roman's defense was aided by some magical artifact. However, Upon reflection, he concluded that Roman had likely crafted the barrier himself, a testament to his formidable abilities. In a swift counterattack, Roman closed the distance between them, delivering a punishing blow to Felix's abdomen, sending him crashing to the ground. As Felix grappled with the pain and frustration of yet another defeat, he realized that his current approach was insufficient to overcome Roman's prowess. Sensing Felix's inner turmoil, Roman extended an unexpected offer. He granted Felix carte blanche to employ any means necessary in their future encounters, including enlisting aid from his fellow mages. Additionally, Roman adjusted the stakes of their battles, offering a substantial reward of 10,000 gold for each victory Felix achieved. The magnitude of the offer left Felix stunned. The realization dawned that such a sum could sustain countless individuals for an entire year. Felix concluded that Roman had never regarded him as an equal from the beginning. However, Roman posed a question to Felix. Would he accept Roman's offer? Without hesitation, Felix accepted the proposition. With a sense of determination and pride, Felix vowed to make Roman Dimitri yield and to deplete the gold reserves of Dimitri. It had become a matter of personal pride for Felix, and he was determined to emerge victorious. In the days that followed, he approached each confrontation with renewed focus and vigor, using every defeat as a lesson to refine his tactics. By the eighth encounter, Felix began incorporating spells designed to restrict Roman's movements, such as slow, mist, and magic traps. Felix watched in dismay as none of his attacks seemed to have any effect on Roman. After losing 30 consecutive fights against him, Felix realized he had to come to terms with reality. His pride, once unwavering, now seemed meaningless in the face of Roman's unstoppable power. Felix knew he couldn't defeat Roman alone. Desperate for a solution, Felix reached out to a fifth circle mage named Knox. He implored Knox to join him in facing Roman Dimitri. However, Knox hesitated, expressing concern about the uncontrollable power of their combined magic in a duel against Roman. Additionally, Knox questioned why the proxy of the magic tower was involving himself in matters outside his jurisdiction. Knox feared the repercussions if anything were to happen to the eldest son of the Dimitri family. Despite Knox's reservations, Felix emphasized the substantial reward awaiting them if they were to defeat Roman together. He promised Knox a generous share of the reward, half of the 10,000-fold sum, if they succeeded. Upon hearing this, Vox remarked to Felix that they only needed to defeat Roman once, correct? To which Felix responded affirmatively, though he cautioned Vox that it wouldn't be as straightforward as Vox might believe. Felix explained to Vox that Roman seemed to be a natural adversary of mages, emphasizing the necessity of a strategic meeting before taking action. However, Vox reassured Felix, telling him not to worry, as Vox and his subordinates would handle the matter. A few days later, Knox and his subordinates stood before Roman, ready to engage in battle. Roman, ever confident, offered them the first move. Knox and his companions unleashed a barrage of spells upon Roman, hoping to overpower him with sheer force. From the sidelines, Felix observed, realizing that Knox and his subordinates were making the same mistakes he had made in his previous encounters with Roman. Despite their concerted effort, Roman effortlessly defeated all four of them, 
standing firm in the face of their onslaught. As Roman emerged victorious once again, standing with unwavering resolve, Roman reflected on the transformation brought about by his second body reformation. This metamorphosis had bestowed upon him a newfound immunity to both heat and cold. Roman understood that this enhancement rendered many heat-based attacks ineffective against him. Vox and his subordinates lay on the ground, battered and injured, questioning the enigma that was Roman Dimitri. Felix, taking charge, reassured them to wait, promising to return after a conversation with Roman. Inside the palace, Roman stood regally as Felix approached with an honest admission. Felix conceded that he doubted his ability to defeat Roman. However, curiosity burning within him, Felix posed a question that had been gnawing at him. How did Roman possess the uncanny ability to predict and dismantle magic? Hoping for insight, Felix anxiously awaited Roman's response. With a confident smile, Roman assured Felix that he would share the secrets of his preparation for battles. Felix, taken aback by this unexpected revelation, couldn't help but be surprised at Roman's willingness to unveil the mysteries behind his formidable skills. As Roman led Felix into the room, Felix couldn't conceal his surprise at the sight before him. What caught his attention most was the array of grimoires neatly arranged on shelves, a testament to Roman's extensive knowledge. Felix's amazement only grew as he realized that Roman had devoured the contents of every single one of those ancient tomes. Roman, noticing Felix's astonishment, began to explain the intricacies of magic. He spoke of mana resonating with the natural elements within a circle, fire, water, wind, all elements intertwined with the very essence of nature itself. What captured Felix's attention most was Roman's revelation that the resonance of mana within this magical circle could be read like a language. A cascade of signals and patterns would emerge, offering a window into the type of magic being cast. Roman elucidated further, emphasizing the importance of three key abilities when dealing with magic. Firstly, the capability to sense and read the resonance. Secondly, the knowledge to recognize the type of magic by interpreting the form of the resonance. And finally, the ability to make swift decisions based on this information. As Roman spoke, Felix found himself stunned by the depth of Roman's understanding and the seemingly effortless manner in which he wielded this magical knowledge. The realization struck Felix that Roman possessed an extraordinary command over the mystical arts. Leaving the room, Felix couldn't shake the feeling that Roman Dimitri transcended the mere label of genius. The word seemed inadequate to describe the marvel he had just encountered. Roman's relentless pursuit of strength left Felix in awe, making him question his own dedication and accomplishments. Contemplating his role as the Tower Master's proxy, Felix admitted to himself that he had been avoiding reality. The disappearance of his master had become a convenient excuse, hindering his own growth. Determined to change this, Felix resolved to prepare rigorously for his impending spars with Roman. Two months later, he felt a palpable difference in his abilities. Despite the Dimitri family being a baronial household on the border, Felix noted the exceptional strength and loyalty of their soldiers. This realization piqued his curiosity about the man known as Roman. The stark contrast between the Dimitri soldiers and those of typical noble families fueled Felix's interest in understanding the roots of Roman's prowess. Yearning for more insights, Felix sought out the blacksmith's workshop. He approached a worker, inquiring about Roman's presence in the forge. The worker confirmed that Roman frequented the workshop but shared that Roman preferred using his personal forge for sword crafting. Intriguingly, the worker recounted stories from the master blacksmith describing how, during Roman's forging sessions, the flames would engulf his entire body, the worker's vivid description painted a mesmerizing picture for Felix, leaving him in awe of the sight of Roman engulfed in flames. The flames, the worker claimed, were so intense that one might think the god of fire himself stood in front of them. As Felix absorbed this tale, memories flooded back, his master's words echoing in his mind. His master had advised him to forge a connection with fire daily urging Felix to find his unique way to embrace it. The burning magic, his master had emphasized, required an extraordinary affinity with fire. It wasn't a skill one could simply learn at will. Moreover, the master had imparted a peculiar notion. If Felix could endure the engulfing flames without feeling pain, he could be reborn as an incarnation of fire. Returning to the present, Felix ruminated on Roman Dimitri's apparent lack of fear toward fire and heat. A family entrenched in generations of familiarity with the flame's brazier likely held a secret method to coexist with the fiery element. With a determination to unveil this mystery, as Felix approached Roman on the training ground, he couldn't resist the urge to inquire about a rumor he had heard. 
With a curious expression, Felix posed his question to Sir Roman wondering if there was any truth to the tales of Roman's ability to handle the flames of the brazier with ease during forging sessions. Eager for knowledge, Felix sought to uncover whether there was a special technique or method behind Roman's remarkable feat. Roman, confirming the existence of his unique method, left Felix stunned. It was the missing piece of the puzzle Felix had been seeking. In that moment, Felix clenched his fists, ready to cut to the chase. Bowing respectfully, Felix implored Roman to share his technique stressing its vital role in the Phoenix Magic Tower. The three years of hardship and suffering had led Felix to this point, where he saw Roman's knowledge as his last glimmer of hope. However, Roman's response introduced an unexpected twist. With a serious expression, Roman questioned why he should do Felix such a favor. The stark reality hit Felix. Roman expected something in return for his invaluable knowledge. Roman pointed out that Felix had already received compensation for his work, leaving Felix to ponder what he could offer in exchange. Felix found himself grappling with the question of what he could possibly offer Roman Dimitri in exchange for the invaluable knowledge he sought. This internal deliberation set the stage for a pivotal scene, one that unfolded within the meeting room of the Phoenix Magic Tower. Gathering the other members, Felix expressed his intention to hear their perspectives. Among them, Knox emerged as a vocal participant. He painted a stark picture, portraying Roman Dimitri as a formidable adversary to mages. Knox's suggestion was startling yet pragmatic. If the Phoenix Tower couldn't best Roman, perhaps they should consider aligning with him. Given the tower's already precarious position within the Frank Empire's hierarchy, such a move might not be as unthinkable as it seemed. Felix was taken aback by this proposal. However, Knox and the others assured him they were fully cognizant of the circumstances at hand. The idea of the Phoenix Magic Tower breaking away from the traditional model, affiliating with a family rather than a nation, sparked contemplation within Felix. It was a radical departure from the norm, but perhaps therein lay the path to securing the tower's future. In response to this discourse, Felix made a decisive proclamation to the assembled members. He declared that from that moment forward, the destiny of the Phoenix Magic Tower would be entrusted to the Dimitris. With that declaration, the wheels of migration were set in motion, marking a significant shift in the tower's trajectory. The narrative then shifted to Felix's office, where a sudden interruption shattered the tranquility of his contemplation. A worker burst in, breathless with urgency, bearing news of the budget allocated by the Dimitris for the Phoenix Magic Tower. Felix's initial expectation was a reduction in funds, given the impending transition to the Dimitri fold. Yet, to his astonishment, the tower had been allocated a generous sum of 24,000 gold annually. Confusion gripped Felix, for he struggled to comprehend the situation at hand. The perplexity stemmed from the prevalent notion among the masses, labeling mages as voracious creatures devouring wealth. This perception stemmed from the necessity for mages to acquire costly items such as grimoires and mana crystals in their pursuit of advancing to higher magic circles. The worker shared Felix's disbelief, acknowledging the incredulity of the situation. It seemed the Dimitris had not only provided ample funding but also extended an invitation for the tower to propose additional budgetary needs if necessary. This revelation left Felix with a sense of disorientation as he contemplated the implications of such unprecedented support. The workers' insistence that Felix step outside to witness the unfolding events firsthand underscored the gravity of the situation. As Felix stepped outside, the grandeur of the palace designated for the members of the Phoenix Magic Tower left him stunned. Chris, observant of Felix's reaction, explained that the palace was built to accommodate the tower's anticipated expansion, with room for up to a thousand members. Curious about Felix's thoughts, Chris sought his opinion on the impressive structure. Felix, taken aback by the unexpected scale of the palace, confessed to feeling puzzled. The Phoenix Magic Tower hadn't foreseen such lavish accommodations from Sir Roman. Chris reassured Felix, explaining that Lord Roman Dimitri prioritized the welfare of his people above all else. It was a trait Felix would need to adjust to. Surprised by this insight into Roman's character, Felix mulled over the implications of his generosity. Meanwhile, the scene shifted to the Dimitri Palace, where Hans was briefing his replacement, Murphy. Hans emphasized the importance of maintaining young Master Roman's routine in his absence. He instructed Murphy to ensure towels were readily available for Roman to wipe off sweat and warm water was on hand. Despite some concern for Murphy's readiness, Hans took comfort in his graduation from the prestigious Adelian Academy. As Hans prepared to take a day off to attend his granddaughter's birthday celebration, 
he couldn't shake off the uncertainty gnawing at him. Holding a doll tightly in his grasp, a gift for his beloved granddaughter, Hans couldn't help but wonder if she would appreciate his choice. Just as Hans stepped out of the palace, he was greeted by a palace worker who had been patiently awaiting his arrival. Flustered by the unexpected encounter, Hans inquired about the reason for the worker's presence. To his surprise, the worker politely urged Hans to board the waiting carriage. Perplexed, Hans questioned the worker's intentions, only to learn that it was at the behest of young Lord Roman that the worker had been instructed to assist him. The scene then shifted to Harrison House, Hans's only child. Harrison was astonished to find his home bustling with activity as workers busily prepared for his daughter's birthday party. Confused by the sudden flurry of activity, he turned to his wife for an explanation, only to find that she was equally unaware of the preparations. Yet these workers claimed they were dispatched by young Master Roman. Harrison, perplexed, questioned why Roman would send people to his humble abode. Among the workers, Lucas stepped forward, introducing himself to Harrison. Lucas explained that young Master Roman had sent them to express gratitude to Sir Hans for his dedicated service. Attempting to make sense of the situation, Harrison, flustered, expressed his confusion. He questioned why all these workers were present, emphasizing that his father served as a mere servant in the Dimitri family. In response, Lucas clarified that young Master Roman held Sir Hans in high regard, deeming him important. Lucas then asked Harrison if he had never heard of their Lord Roman from his father. Harrison, stunned, reflected on his memories of Roman Dimitri. He remembered a time when Roman was disparaged as a good-for-nothing, someone oblivious to his father's unwavering devotion and sacrifices. Harrison, in contrast, had harbored a lack of trust in Roman, a sentiment starkly different from his father's unwavering faith. Hans had reassured his son, emphasizing that young Master Roman was going through a challenging phase. As Harrison's eyes welled up with tears, he contemplated the significance of his father's dedication. The revelation that young Master Roman recognized and appreciated Hans's efforts brought a profound sense of meaning to his father's hard work. As guests arrived at Harrison's house for his daughter's birthday celebration, they were met with a scene that left them astonished. The spread of food and the transformed appearance of the house led many to question if they were in the right place. Amidst the murmurs of confusion, soldiers suddenly appeared, signaling the imminent arrival of someone important. The guests watched in curiosity as the soldiers lined up, creating a path for the distinguished guest. Their anticipation peaked as Hans, Harrison's father, made his entrance. Overwhelmed with emotion, Harrison rushed to embrace his father, their reunion filled with warmth and affection. After the heartfelt reunion, attention turned to the presents. Harrison, with his daughter at his side, began to unwrap the gifts, starting with one from his father, a beautiful doll that brought joy to his granddaughter's face. The generosity continued as Harrison opened a gift from Count Conrad, a stunning ruby ring, a gesture that surprised the guests, accustomed to nobles typically reserving such lavish gifts for their own kin. The surprises didn't end there. Gifts from Viscount Lawrence and Count Adelian followed a necklace, and a brooch respectively. The guests couldn't help but wonder why these high-ranking nobles were showering Hans's family with such extravagant presents. It soon became apparent that their motives were strategic, seeking to gain favor with Hans, who had been a steadfast supporter of Roman even in the face of ridicule, and had played a crucial role in his upbringing. Hans's position as a trusted ally to Roman had elevated him to a position of influence, coveted by the nobles seeking connections to the enigmatic young master. As the gifts continued to pour in, Harrison found himself feeling overwhelmed. He was grateful for the generosity but unsure of how to manage such abundance. Opening the final gift, which bore Roman's name, at the mention of Roman's name, Hans's curiosity stirred. He couldn't help but wonder what sort of gift Roman might have presented to his granddaughter. Harrison was stunned by its contents, a recommendation letter for the Glory Academy. The significance of the gesture wasn't lost on Harrison. The Glory Academy was renowned as the most prestigious educational institution, a dream for many commoners. In the wake of the overwhelming revelation that young Master Roman had secured a coveted spot for Harrison's daughter at the esteemed Glory Academy, emotions ran high. Harrison, deeply moved by the magnitude of this opportunity, found himself shedding tears of gratitude. The mere notion of accessing the Academy was daunting, even for those with financial means, making Roman's gesture all the more profound. The scene then shifted to the Dimitri Palace, where Hans, in his characteristic humility, approached Roman. He expressed a sense of unworthiness for the lavish presence bestowed upon his family, 
emphasizing that the fulfillment derived from his work and the genuine appreciation shown by Roman were more than sufficient. As Roman contemplated his past life as a heavenly demon, memories resurfaced. Roman turned to his loyal subordinate, Mad Demon, and posed a question that weighed on his mind. With a steady gaze, Roman inquired whether Mad Demon harbored any regrets in pledging allegiance to him. In response, Mad Demon's unwavering loyalty shone through as he affirmed that he held no regrets whatsoever. To Mad Demon, the mere fact that Roman placed trust in him was enough to solidify his commitment to serving Roman for the remainder of his days. Meanwhile, Hans stood as another servant in the service of Roman Dimitri. Roman turned to Hans with a contemplative expression. Reflecting on the years they had spent together, Roman remarked that Hans had been a constant presence in his life, even surpassing the time he had spent with his own father. Despite the disparity in their social standings, Roman emphasized the unique significance of Hans in his life. To Roman, Hans wasn't merely a servant. He was a cherished individual, valued for his unwavering loyalty and genuine sincerity. In a heartfelt gesture, Roman assured Hans that he was considered one of his people, akin to family, owing to his steadfast commitment. With this acknowledgement, Roman conveyed that Hans had every right to accept the gifts bestowed upon him. Overwhelmed by Roman's words, Hans was deeply moved, touched by the recognition of his dedication and the bond they shared. Roman, in turn, extended sincere congratulations on Hans's granddaughter's birthday, solidifying the depth of their bond. Fast forward to a year later at the Cairo branch of the Valhalla Temple, where Willis found himself tending to the flowers with a sense of boredom. Reflecting on the aftermath of Roman Dimitri's return from the southern front line, Willis contemplated the unexpected turn of events. The mention of the ranking battle had triggered a seismic shift in the Cairo kingdom. Rankers, who traditionally engaged in intense battles amongst themselves, had redirected their focus. Instead, they spent a year meticulously preparing for an impending confrontation with Roman Dimitri. Roman's standing in the kingdom remained somewhat elusive. Officially ranked 100 after his duel with Homeros, Roman's triumph over Butler, the second strongest swordsman of the Hector kingdom, Roman's emergence as a formidable force posed a significant challenge. Positioned within the range of ranks 1 to 99, Roman had the potential to target anyone within this spectrum. His mere decision to act could trigger substantial shifts within Cairo's ranking structure, causing a ripple effect of consequences. Across town, a member of the Valhalla Temple delivered news to Willis. Roman had made contact with the temple. Willis couldn't contain his excitement at the mention of Roman's name, interpreting this development as a sign that the long-awaited public ranking battles were finally on the horizon. Meanwhile, within the hushed confines of the central government palace, Marquis Benedict scrutinized a document that hinted at Roman's forthcoming actions. The political climate in Cairo had grown increasingly precarious. Tower masters, including the esteemed Phoenix Tower Master of the Frank Kingdom, had mysteriously vanished. Rumors swirled that the Kronos Empire pointed fingers at other nations, inciting talks of continent-wide conquest. Such whispers fueled anxiety among the smaller neighboring countries, especially those sharing borders with Kronos, knowing that conflict with the formidable empire was inevitable. Marquis Benedict recognized the urgent need for a robust power structure to withstand Kronos' looming threat. A weak ruler would leave Cairo vulnerable during these tumultuous times. The prospect of Roman Dimitri aligning with the aristocratic faction could potentially tilt the balance of power, sparking a response from the established authorities. Frustrated by the ambiguity of the situation, Marquis Benedict sought to uncover Roman's whereabouts, speculating whether Roman had deliberately chosen to start his ascent from the bottom. Meanwhile, at the bustling public ranking battle arena, Willis stood poised to make an announcement, signaling the commencement of the ranking battle. Between Roman Dimitri, ranked 100, and Jaden, who holds rank 99, a tense confrontation unfolds. Jaden grapples with disbelief that Roman would challenge someone of his lower rank, especially when Roman has declared his ambition to claim the top spot. Jaden questions why Roman, if truly as skilled as rumored, would bother with lower-ranked opponents like himself. As Roman stands before Jaden, their faces inches apart, Jaden scrutinizes him closely. Despite expecting a seasoned warrior, Jaden is struck by Roman's youthful appearance. Rumors had circulated that Roman had already set his sights on the next ranking battle, fueling Jaden's perception of Roman as arrogant. The match begins, and Jaden launches into action with full intensity. Gathering his aura, Jaden unleashes a powerful strike aimed directly at Roman. Yet, to Jaden's astonishment, Roman effortlessly evades the attack and swiftly counters, 
incapacitating Jaden with a mere tap of his sword. In the aftermath of a seemingly one-sided battle, Willis confronted Roman, expressing his doubts about the purposefulness of such fights. Was there really a need to engage in this? Willis queried, suggesting an alternative strategy of starting the climb from the top 30 rankers instead. Roman's response was resolute, a testament to his unwavering determination. Despite being hailed as a hero by some, Roman acknowledged the pervasive doubts surrounding his abilities. His resolve was clear. He would prove himself by defeating all rankers using only his own skills. Willis couldn't help but smirk as he listened to Roman's declaration. This was the Roman he had been waiting for, the one who would defy expectations and astonish the world. The media had already cast doubt on Roman's chances of climbing from rank 99 to the coveted top spot. Yet, Roman's swift and decisive victory over the 98th ranker, Delhi, within a mere day, silenced their skepticism. Willis wasted no time in proclaiming Roman as the new 98th ranker, a testament to his undeniable prowess. Roman wasted no time in seeking out his next opponent, his determination unyielding. With a single strike, he dispatched the 97th ranker, leaving spectators in awe of his unparalleled skill. Despite starting from the bottom of the rankings, Roman's opponents were no pushovers. Each one was a formidable three-star ranker, yet Roman defeated them with effortless efficiency, taking less than 10 seconds to triumph over each. The news spread like wildfire, captivating the attention of all who followed the rankings. In just two days, Roman had battled his way to rank 91, defying all expectations and shattering any doubts about his abilities. The sheer speed and precision of his victories were unprecedented, leaving even the most skeptical observers in disbelief. Meanwhile, the scene shifted to Jaden, the 99th ranker, waking up in a daze. Confusion clouded Jaden's mind as they struggled to comprehend their surroundings. A nearby worker approached, offering an explanation for Jaden's disorientation. They had underestimated their opponent, Roman Dimitri, and had been swiftly defeated with a single devastating blow. It had been a full day since Jaden had lost consciousness, yet they were the only one to have awakened after facing Roman. As the reality of their defeat sunk in, Jaden's mind raced with questions. How many opponents had Roman faced? How many had he defeated? The worker's response only deepened Jaden's sense of astonishment. Roman had defeated five rankers in just one day, including Jaden himself. The magnitude of Roman's feat was staggering, leaving Jaden to ponder the implications of such an extraordinary accomplishment. The worker's inquiry pierced through Jaden's bewildered state, prompting him to grapple with the weight of his recent defeat. As the worker elucidated that the other rankers had never truly been Roman's adversaries from the outset, Jaden's mind raced, trying to comprehend the gravity of the situation. Then, a surge of pain shot through his body, leaving him feeling as though he'd been torn apart at the seams. The worker's prognosis was grim. Jaden would be incapacitated for at least a month, courtesy of the havoc wreaked upon his muscles by Roman's mysterious spell. Stunned disbelief gave way to frustration as Jaden grappled with the aftermath of his encounter with Roman. He realized the urgency of halting Roman's relentless advance and issued a solemn warning to his fellow rankers. Drawing from his own harrowing experience, Jaden recounted the sheer force of Roman's strength, which had rendered him defenseless with a single devastating blow. It wasn't merely a matter of losing a duel. Facing Roman meant risking life-altering injury. Meanwhile, Roman's rampage through the ranks continued unabated. In the span of just one week, he systematically dismantled all opposition, vanquishing adversaries from rank 91 to 40 with alarming efficiency. With each resounding victory, the doubts and rumors that had plagued Roman's ascent dissipated like morning mist. Those ranked from 39th to 31st resigned themselves to defeat, acknowledging the futility of resisting Roman's inexorable advance. When Fernando, the 30th ranker, accepted Roman's challenge, skepticism rippled through the ranks. Ranker 32 cautioned Fernando against his rash decision, warning of the formidable opponent he was about to face. Roman, with his unmatched skill and prowess, was deemed by many to be a five-star threat, far beyond the reach of all but the most elite rankers. Yet, Fernando remained steadfast in his resolve, undeterred by the warnings of his peers. As Fernando faced criticism for his decision, he refused to waver, steadfast in his conviction that facing Roman was a challenge worth undertaking. In his eyes, it was not a matter of recklessness but rather a test of his own courage and determination. He refused to cower in the face of fear, steadfastly maintaining his belief that surrendering to Romans might would tarnish their collective image far more than any defeat on the battlefield. 
Despite the doubts and admonitions of his fellow rankers, Fernando stood firm, a beacon of unwavering resolve amidst the swirling currents of uncertainty. As a ranker, he understood the risks inherent in challenging someone as formidable as Roman Dimitri. Yet, he refused to cower in the face of adversity, choosing instead to confront it head-on. For Fernando, the duel with Roman was not merely a test of skill, but a testament to the indomitable spirit that defined him as a ranker. Fernando cared little for appearances. What he sought was the chance to test his mettle against a foe stronger than himself, a chance to hone his skills where talent fell short. As he squared off against Roman in the arena, murmurs rippled through the audience, speculating on the duration of the match. While Fernando was known for his mastery of basic combat skills, he struggled against opponents rated four stars or higher. With determination alone, he had climbed to rank 30, but there he found his limits. In the heat of battle, Fernando believed that Roman might see him as nothing more than a sacrificial pawn. Yet, in return, Fernando hoped that Roman might offer him insights into the world of combat, allowing him to progress even further. As the duel commenced, Fernando launched himself at Roman with full force, his aura blazing around him. However, Roman effortlessly sidestepped Fernando's onslaught, evading each strike with ease. Spotting an opening, Fernando gracefully arced his sword sideways. However, Roman instinctively leaned back, skillfully evading Fernando's strike. Undeterred, Fernando persisted, propelling himself through the air and aiming a decisive blow towards Roman's head. Yet, Roman effortlessly sidestepped the assault, swiftly regaining his stance. But Roman's elusive movements left him frustrated and confused. Was Roman toying with him? Did he think Fernando unworthy of a true challenge? Fernando's pride stung, but he had long ago shed his ego in pursuit of improvement. Then, to Fernando's astonishment, Roman began communicating with him telepathically, guiding him through the intricacies of combat. Roman explained to Fernando that despite being rated as a formidable four-star warrior, his weakness stemmed from an unstable aura output. He warned Fernando that if he continued to fight in the same manner, he would never progress. Roman elaborated that the conventional method of stabilizing aura output involved absorbing mana and channeling it along a specific pathway. This approach was widely adopted by swordsmen across Cairo Kingdom and the Salamander Continent, following a standardized mana path system. However, Roman's assertion left Fernando astonished. He had always believed there was only one mana path and was perplexed by Roman's revelations. Roman took a moment to unravel the complexities of aura manipulation for Fernando. He explained that an outburst of aura occurs when mana surges along its designated pathway, a fundamental principle shared among practitioners. While the specifics of circulation methods may vary from individual to individual, the process of constructing these pathways remains constant, a universally recognized approach. Acknowledging the challenge of forging a new pathway while adhering to an existing one, Roman posed a thought-provoking question to Fernando. Wasn't it worth exploring the possibility of charting a new course? Fernando found himself grappling with Roman's proposition, unsure of what it entailed but willing to embark on the journey nonetheless. Unlike his peers fixated on reputation and honor, Fernando remained indifferent to such concerns, choosing instead to place his trust in Roman, even if doubts lingered about the sincerity of Roman's guidance. Encouraged by Roman's reassurance, Fernando immersed himself in the task at hand. With Roman's guidance, he focused on channeling and containing the energy of his mana, a feat that required both concentration and control. Roman promised that with diligence, a new pathway would reveal itself, a promising avenue for Fernando's growth. As Fernando delved deeper into the depths of his mana, a sense of clarity began to emerge. Guided by Roman's instructions, he navigated the intricate currents of his aura, seeking out the elusive pathway that lay hidden within. With each passing moment, Fernando's connection to his mana strengthened, paving the way for a breakthrough that would alter the course of his journey. In a moment of revelation, Fernando felt the subtle shift in energy, a sign that he had succeeded in carving out a new pathway for his aura. The realization washed over him like a wave, filling him with a sense of accomplishment and newfound purpose. In that fleeting moment, Fernando understood the true extent of Roman's wisdom and the transformative power of his guidance. With a knowing smile, Roman signaled the conclusion of their session. In a display of unparalleled skill, he delivered a single strike that brought Fernando to his knees, a testament to the vast disparity in their abilities. Observers in the audience marveled at the spectacle, recognizing Fernando's pivotal role in showcasing Roman's unparalleled strength. Despite the defeat, Fernando remained undeterred, rising to his feet with a sense of determination. 
As he called out to Roman, signaling his desire for further discourse, a sense of anticipation filled the air. Inside the confines of the waiting room, Fernando sought answers from Roman, eager to understand the source of his newfound insight. With patience and clarity, Roman elucidated the intricacies of Fernando's aura, shedding light on the root of his struggle. He explained that while Fernando possessed the potential for greatness, the instability of his aura's pathway had hindered his progress. Fernando stood before Roman, his mind racing with a whirlwind of emotions. Roman's revelation had sparked a glimmer of hope within him, a faint beacon in the darkness of his uncertainty. With a rare display of honesty, Fernando confessed to Roman the conflicting feelings swirling within him. While he felt encouraged by Roman's words, he couldn't shake the doubt that lingered, the fear that his own strength might not be enough to carry him forward. It was with this vulnerability that Fernando mustered the courage to ask Roman for guidance, to teach him the elusive art of opening his aura pathway. Roman's response was measured yet decisive. He acknowledged Fernando's request, assuring him that teaching the method wouldn't pose a problem. However, Roman made it clear that he preferred deals that yielded mutual benefits, hinting at a deeper layer of understanding between them. Undeterred by Roman's caveat, Fernando implored him to name his terms, a testament to his unwavering determination to learn from the enigmatic swordsman. It was a plea born not out of desperation, but out of a genuine hunger for growth and improvement. In that moment, Roman issued a request that caught Fernando off guard. He asked Fernando to follow him and live for Roman's sake, a proposition that resonated deeply with Fernando's sense of purpose. To Fernando, Roman represented not just a mentor, but a guiding light illuminating the path ahead. Without hesitation, Fernando knelt before Roman, pledging his loyalty with a solemn vow that echoed through the chambers of their shared destiny. The scene transitions to the gathering of the aristocratic faction, where representatives from all four factions have convened. They express concern over the recent actions of Roman Dimitri, recognizing the potential trouble his actions may bring. Speculation arises that Roman might actually pose a significant threat to Count Nicholas. Marquis Benedict interjects, cautioning against premature conclusions. While acknowledging Roman's past victory over Butler, he emphasizes the vast disparity in power, noting that Count Nicholas holds a formidable rank of 80 within the continent. Count Nicholas, a royal knight revered as the strongest swordsman in Cairo, commanded respect and fear in equal measure. Yet, Roman's recent feats had cast doubt upon the established hierarchy, hinting at a paradigm shift that threatened to upend the status quo. As the discussion unfolded, one nobleman dared to voice the unspoken question looming over their deliberations, what would happen if Roman emerged victorious over Count Nicholas? Marquis Benedict's response was swift and unequivocal. He warned of the ramifications of such an outcome, emphasizing Count Nicholas's indispensable role in upholding the royal faction's power. To Marquis Benedict, Roman's triumph would not only undermine the existing order, but herald the rise of a new force that must be stopped at all costs. In the face of this uncertainty, Marquis Benedict laid bare the stark choice that lay before them. If Roman rejected their proposal, the decision had been made within the aristocratic faction, unanimous and resolute. Roman's presence posed an imminent threat that could no longer be ignored. Marquis Benedict's authoritative voice cut through the tense atmosphere as he declared that Roman must be eliminated regardless of the consequences. With urgency in his tone, he instructed all members of the aristocratic faction to mobilize their family's troops secretly within the capital. It was a calculated move, designed to ensnare Roman within their grasp, regardless of his next move. Meanwhile, in the bustling arena where Roman had just emerged victorious against Heron, the 10th-ranked combatant from the Kronos faction, the crowd erupted into cheers. Roman's gaze swept over the audience his voice cutting through the air with a mix of frustration and determination. His unexpected outburst caught everyone off guard. Roman continued, expressing his disappointment in the situation. He recounted how he had initiated a public ranking battle a year ago, hoping that the esteemed rankers of Cairo would rise to the challenge. However, after defeating the formidable rank 10, Heron, Roman came to a stark realization. He declared that the only adversary worthy of his skill was Count Nicholas. Roman declared his intention to forego meaningless formalities, announcing his plan to face off against ranks 9 through 2 in the arena in three days' time. With unwavering resolve, he vowed to emerge victorious against each opponent, culminating in a direct challenge to Cairo's strongest swordsman. His words sent shockwaves through the city, stirring up a frenzy of anticipation and speculation. Meanwhile, among the assembled rankers, Bruno, rank 9 from the Valhalla faction, voiced his intention to concede defeat. 
He reasoned that his skills were too similar to Geron's, and thus Roman would undoubtedly overpower him. However, Oscar, the second-ranked member of the aristocratic faction, vehemently rejected the idea of surrender. Reminding Bruno of Roman's public disparagement of Sir Geron's skills and his bold declaration to defeat all remaining rankers from ninth to first on the same day, Oscar argued that capitulation was not an option. Surrendering now would only invite scorn and mockery from the public. That's why he had convened all the rankers of Cairo to stand united against Roman's audacious ambitions. Urging his fellow rankers to set aside their differences and work together, Oscar implored them to exhaust Roman to the fullest extent possible determined to thwart his plans at any cost. Oscar, fervently loyal to Marquis Benedict, rallied the rankers, promising rewards for their allegiance and vowing to confront Roman with his life on the line to preserve their honor. Inspired, the rankers pledged their support, uniting as the collective strength of Cairo's swordsmen against Roman's challenge. Oscar's smirk revealed his confidence as he prepared to lead them into battle. In the arena, the unified front of rankers from 9 to 2 stirred the audience who cheered at their defiance of Roman's provocation. The display of solidarity left Roman sobered, recognizing the inherent unity among nobles in times of crisis. With time dwindling, Roman braced for the impending clash, understanding that in Cairo, it was a matter of survival, dominate or be dominated. As the battle commenced, Bruno, the ninth-ranked combatant, stepped forward, expecting a protracted struggle. However, Roman swiftly dispatched him with a single strike, shocking both Bruno and the onlookers. This pattern repeated as each ranker fell in rapid succession, Roman's determination growing with every victory. Oscar and his comrades watched in disbelief as Roman's seemingly invincible skill demolished their hopes. With a stern gaze, Roman singled out Oscar, ominously declaring, only one left. The scene transitions to the grandeur of the royal palace, where a soldier rushes in, his demeanor urgent as he delivers news to the king. With a mixture of awe and concern, he announces Roman's staggering victory, recounting how Roman swiftly dispatched rankers nine through two in a single day. This triumph, the soldier adds, leaves the royal faction without any viable justification to bar Roman from challenging rank one. Daniel is visibly troubled by this revelation. He contemplates the implications of Roman's unchecked ascent and turns to Count Nicholas, the esteemed swordsman of Cairo, seeking counsel in this moment of uncertainty. Daniel wonders if there is any way to avert a potentially catastrophic confrontation with Roman. Daniel confided in Nicholas, expressing his trust in him. However, he voiced his concern that if the foremost swordsman of Cairo were to falter at this juncture, Daniel's own standing would inevitably render him vulnerable to the machinations of the aristocratic faction. Nicholas, exuding confidence, reassures Daniel, urging him to place his faith in him once more. With a determined nod, Nicholas vows to demonstrate why he holds the esteemed title of the strongest swordsman in Cairo. As Nicholas exits the king's chamber, he is met by Binner, a loyal companion. Concern etched on his face, Binner inquires about Nicholas's well-being. In response, Nicholas seeks Binner's insight into the character of Roman. Binner paints a vivid picture of Roman as a natural-born predator, endowed with an innate sense of purpose long before the world acknowledged his prowess. He warns Nicholas to proceed with caution, emphasizing the dire consequences should Nicholas fail to thwart Roman's ambitions. With a steely resolve, Nicholas pledges to protect the royal family from any potential threats, assuring Binner that he will not falter in his duty. The following day dawns, and the arena buzzes with anticipation as Roman makes his way toward the battleground, a figure of awe-inspiring determination. Across from him stands Nicholas, the epitome of stoic resolve, his sword gleaming in the sunlight. With a sense of solemnity, Nicholas draws his weapon, ready to face Roman and defend the honor of Cairo. In a resolute voice, Nicholas proclaims himself as the strongest swordsman in Cairo, poised to impart upon Roman the harsh realities of their world. Roman, undaunted, accepts the challenge, his gaze steely with determination. As the match commences, both combatants charge toward each other, their swords clashing in a symphony of steel. Each strike resonates with a power that leaves the audience spellbound their collective breath caught in the intensity of the moment. Willis, among the spectators, watches with bated breath as Roman and Nicholas engage in a breathtaking display of skill and prowess. Willis, watching from the sidelines, couldn't contain his excitement. This was the kind of fight he had been longing to witness, a battle between two titans. Nicholas, known as the strongest swordsman of Cairo, couldn't help but acknowledge Roman's unique approach to combat. Roman, in turn, showed respect for Nicholas's formidable reputation. 
The audience held their breath as the two warriors engaged in a dance of blades, their movement swift and precise. Nicholas launched a fierce strike imbued with his aura, aiming to test Roman's defenses. To the amazement of the spectators, Roman managed to block the attack effortlessly. The sight of two of Cairo's finest swordsmen locked in combat left the audience spellbound, their eyes glued to the spectacle unfolding before them. Seizing an opening, Roman surged forward with his own aura-infused sword, aiming a powerful blow at Nicholas. Although Nicholas successfully parried the attack, he found himself forced backward by Roman's sheer strength. Doubts began to creep into Nicholas's mind as he realized he was struggling to match Roman's power. On the other hand, Roman reveled in the intensity of the battle, his adrenaline pumping as he pushed himself to the limit. Each exchange of blows only fueled his determination further, driving him to test the limits of his abilities. Nicholas understood the precariousness of the situation. If he were to falter, it could spell disaster for the royal family. In that crucial moment, Nicholas lunged forward, aiming a slashing strike with his aura-infused sword at Roman. Yet, with lightning reflexes, Roman evaded the attack, gracefully leaping back onto the arena floor. With this in mind, he steeled himself, focusing his energy to unleash his ultimate technique, demolition. Surrounding himself with a radiant aura, Nicholas launched a precise and devastating attack aimed at Roman. Caught off guard by the sudden onslaught, Roman reacted swiftly. Drawing upon his own mastery of swordsmanship, he unleashed the heavenly demon sword technique, a move he had perfected through years of training. The clash between their energies resulted in a dazzling explosion, engulfing the arena in chaos. As the dust settled, the outcome became clear. Nicholas, once standing proud as Cairo's strongest swordsman, now found himself on his knees, defeated. Despite the shock of his loss, Nicholas refused to yield, his determination unwavering. Rising to his feet, he urged Roman to continue the fight, his resolve unbroken. Roman, taken aback by Nicholas's resilience, couldn't help but question his opponent's motives. Why was Nicholas pushing himself so far? With a smile, Nicholas asserts to Roman that he remains the strongest swordsman in Cairo. Even if he were to fall, his spirit would remain unbroken. Witnessing Nicholas's unwavering resolve, Roman is struck by his remarkable character. Despite the admiration, Roman swiftly moves to strike down the formidable swordsman. In a decisive blow, Roman defeats the titan who had long dominated Cairo. The audience watches in stunned silence as the era of Nicholas's reign comes to an abrupt end. Willis, acknowledging the momentous occasion, declares Roman Dimitri as the new number one swordsman in the Cairo kingdom before departing from the arena. Reflecting on the outcome, Willis ponders whether everyone had underestimated Roman Dimitri or if Roman had simply surpassed all expectations. He contemplates Roman's disinterest in joining Valhalla, recognizing him as a formidable force that must not be left unchecked. In the bustling streets of Cairo, Roman Dimitri strode confidently alongside his soldiers, the eyes of the city's inhabitants following his every move with a mixture of awe and respect. His presence was commanding, his stature imposing, marking him unmistakably as the strongest swordsman Cairo had ever known. As Roman made his way, it was in this moment that Marquis Benedict, a figure of significance in his own right, stepped forth to intercept Roman's path. Benedict's admiration for Roman's unparalleled skills was evident as he praised the swordsman's recent victory over Count Nicholas, a feat that had sent shockwaves through the aristocratic circles of Cairo. Yet, beneath the veneer of admiration lay a subtle challenge as Benedict's soldiers formed a barrier before Roman, blocking his passage and signaling the commencement of a weighty conversation. With a measured tone, Benedict delved into the intricacies of Roman's past endeavors, his words laced with a subtle undercurrent of curiosity and scrutiny. He mused aloud about the year-long preparations Roman had undertaken, a period of intense training and strategizing that had left many wondering about its purpose. It was a question that had lingered in Benedict's mind until this very moment when sudden clarity dawned upon him. It was for the Dimitri family, Benedict declared, his voice carrying a note of realization. To strengthen the Dimitri forces, to secure their position in the ever-shifting landscape of power and influence. With this revelation laid bare, Marquis Benedict inquires of Roman whether he will align himself with the aristocratic faction or diverge from the expected path. Benedict, with a touch of persuasion, expresses his approval should Roman opt for the former. However, he doesn't shy away from cautioning Roman about the potential costs associated with choosing the latter course. Benedict then turns the decision over to Roman, prompting him to reveal his choice. As Roman contemplates Benedict's words, a contemplative silence envelopes the scene, 
eventually leading the narrative into the recesses of Roman's memories. In a tense moment, Beak Hoyle, the elder brother of Roman from a past life and leader of the heavenly demon divine cult, confronts Jung Hyuk, which was Roman's name in his previous life. Their exchange carries weight, for the decision Jung Hyuk makes now will shape the future of their bond. The choice is clear. Will Jung Hyuk embrace the allure of fame and riches, joining his other siblings alongside Beak Hoyle? Or will he instead stake his claim as the rightful heir to the leadership of the heavenly demon divine cult, confronting Beak Hoyle head on? For Roman, the decision had never been an easy one, a choice between duty and desire, between submission and defiance. Yet, as he stood at the crossroads of his fate once more, Roman found clarity in the depths of his soul. In search of what truly serves his own well-being, Roman ascends the staircase, grappling with his inner turmoil. As he reaches his brother, he utters a heartfelt apology before lifting his sword, a symbol of his resolve. With a heavy heart, he addresses his older sibling, expressing his inability to lead a life dictated by the desires of others. Back in the present, Roman echoed those same words to Benedict, who regarded him with a mixture of disbelief and disdain. To Benedict, Roman's decision may have seemed foolish. In the tense streets of Cairo, Marquis Benedict exuded confidence, convinced that he held both power and justification in the unfolding drama. He dismissed Roman's formidable strength, asserting that it would amount to nothing in their current situation. Benedict, with the weight of the central government's leadership behind him, declared the Dimitri family, notorious for their unrestrained attacks, as the culprits behind internal strife. With an authoritative bellow, Benedict commanded his soldiers to arrest Roman Dimitri for a comprehensive investigation. The soldiers, dutifully following orders, advanced towards Roman. However, the situation took an unexpected turn as Roman swiftly incapacitated one of the soldiers. Benedict stood in stunned silence, watching Roman's defiance unfold before him. Benedict questioned whether Roman was defying government orders and staging a rebellion. Roman, unyielding, clarified that his opposition was directed solely at Benedict, not the overarching authority of the king. He went further, asserting that Benedict himself was the one truly orchestrating a rebellion against established order. Benedict, frustrated by Roman's audacity, claimed that such arrogance would lead to the Dimitri family's downfall. He argued that the central government, as the representation of the king's will, held the moral high ground. Roman, however, was resolute in his belief that the king would be the ultimate arbiter of their actions. The situation escalated as Roman, sensing the need for decisive action, ordered his comrades, Chris and Kevin, to open up a path. The duo, loyal to Roman's cause, charged forward, swiftly taking down multiple soldiers in their path. Witnessing this unexpected turn of events, Marquis Benedict is overcome with astonishment. Never in his wildest imagination did he conceive that Roman would have the audacity to openly confront the troops of the central government amidst the bustling streets of Cairo. In a sudden turn of events, Benedict, accompanied by his officials, chose to flee the scene. Fearful of the repercussions, he ordered his remaining soldiers to attack Roman and promise substantial rewards for anyone who could capture the defiant swordsman. As the soldiers of the central government closed in on Roman, he displayed a mastery of combat taking down their commander without hesitation. In Roman's mind, this marked the beginning of a necessary purge, a decisive moment where he would assert his stance against the perceived tyranny of Marquis Benedict and the central government. In the opulent chambers of the Cairo Kingdom's imperial castle, urgency permeated the air as a messenger burst in, breathless and wide-eyed, to deliver dire news to King Daniel. The bustling capital had become a battleground, with Roman Dimitri at its center, unleashing a one-sided massacre against the aristocratic faction. Shocked by the revelation, King Daniel's mind raced, grappling with the unsettling possibility of rebellion within his own kingdom. Reacting swiftly to the imminent threat, the royal knight vice-captain's voice boomed through the hall, commanding soldiers to mobilize all royal knights and imperial security troops. Their paramount objective, fortify the castle defenses and ensure the safety of their sovereign. As the urgent orders echoed off the grand walls, King Daniel couldn't help but ponder the bitter inevitability of such chaos, wondering if it was the destiny of Cairo to be torn apart by internal strife. In an abrupt turn of events, a soldier approaches King Daniel with news of a surprising request. Roman Dimitri seeks an audience with the monarch. King Daniel, taken aback by this unexpected development, watches as Roman steps forward. Roman offers a respectful greeting, but King Daniel swiftly dismisses the formalities urging Roman to delve straight into the heart of the matter, 
eager to hear his explanation for the situation at hand. Roman's account painted a vivid picture of confrontation and defiance. He recounted how Marquis Benedict, backed by a formidable retinue, had attempted to coerce him into aligning with the aristocratic faction following a public ranking battle. However, Roman, fiercely loyal only to Cairo's king, had staunchly rebuffed Benedict's overtures. In a bold gambit, Roman laid out a proposition before King Daniel, if the king would grant his unequivocal support, dubbing Dimitri as the sword of Cairo. Roman vowed to eradicate the aristocratic faction and restore equilibrium to the kingdom's fractured power structure. As King Daniel registers his surprise, he entertains a hopeful thought. Perhaps Roman intends to eliminate the aristocratic faction on behalf of the king's interests. Curiosity piqued, King Daniel directly questions Roman's motives, wondering if Roman is currently seeking to strike a deal with the monarch. In response, Roman recounts his first-hand experience at the southern front line when the Hector kingdom breached Cairo's borders. Despite ample time to prepare for Hector's incursions, the defenses of Cairo crumbled in a sudden and unexpected onslaught. Roman attributed this catastrophic failure to the kingdom's internal divisions, exacerbated by the presence of four conflicting factions vying for dominance. If only the hierarchy of power had been correct, the occupation of the southern front line might have been avoided altogether. Roman posed a question to King Daniel, inquiring if Cairo had witnessed any changes in the past year, noting the tumultuous political landscape of the Salamander continent. He pressed further, questioning how long the king intended to passively observe. Roman asserted that the key figure to unite Cairo was not Marquis Benedict, but rather the individual who wielded control over the central government and acted as de facto king. In Roman's eyes, that person should be King Daniel himself. Upon hearing this revelation, Binder's thoughts race. Could it be that Roman is genuinely inclined to pledge allegiance to the king? The notion takes root in Binder's mind. Perhaps Roman's actions weren't driven by a desire to foment rebellion, but rather by a willingness to serve the monarch faithfully. Roman sought to reassure the king, acknowledging that King Daniel might perceive their actions as suspicious. However, Roman emphasized that Dimitri had committed their lives to this cause. With a sense of urgency, Roman implored the king to seize the opportunity that Dimitri had prepared. Before responding, King Daniel posed a question to Roman, inquiring about what Dimitri sought in return for orchestrating this stage. Roman's response stunned the king. He revealed his aspiration for the independence of the eastern region. By declaring it an independent territory and establishing it as a duchy, Roman argued, Dimitri would remain steadfastly loyal to Cairo, never forgetting their roots. The king grappled with this revelation, visibly taken aback by Roman's bold request for Dimitri's independence. Roman, however, remained resolute, urging the king to consider the greater good of Cairo when faced with difficult decisions. In Roman's view, sometimes sacrifices were necessary to ensure the prosperity and stability of the kingdom as a whole. As Roman's words echoed in the chamber, King Daniel found himself at a crossroads, contemplating the best course of action for the kingdom of Cairo. The weight of responsibility bore heavily upon his shoulders as he considered the implications of Roman's insights. Turning to Roman, King Daniel posed a hypothetical scenario, probing into the potential repercussions of Count Denver and Count Gregory joining forces. Roman's response was measured and astute, reflecting a deep understanding of the geopolitical landscape. He explained that the empire, represented by Valhalla, was unlikely to mobilize immediately due to logistical constraints. Additionally, Kronos, embroiled in conflicts to the south, had more pressing priorities than Cairo at present. Roman's analysis resonated with King Daniel, who recognized the complexity of the situation. Addressing Roman directly, the king remarks on Roman's ambitious plans to confront numerous adversaries within a relatively brief period. He voiced concerns about the unintended consequences of eliminating multiple enemies simultaneously, fearing that such actions could create new challenges for Cairo. It was a sobering reminder of the delicate balance of power within the kingdom. However, Roman remained steadfast in his conviction that decisive action was necessary to secure Cairo's future. With a solemn expression, he assured the king that while risks were inevitable, they must be faced head-on in pursuit of stability and prosperity. King Daniel, impressed by Roman's strategic acumen, couldn't help but smile, acknowledging the young warrior's remarkable insight. Yet, his moment of admiration was short-lived as Royal Knight Vice Captain Simon interjected, voicing opposition to Roman's proposal. Simon raised concerns that the Demetris, including Roman, were seeking to exploit the situation for personal gain under the guise of righteousness. 
Roman met Simon's skepticism with a resolute rebuttal, challenging him to consider the alternatives. He pointed to the atrocities committed by the aristocratic faction and emphasized the Dimitri's willingness to confront them, seeking only fair recognition for their sacrifices. Roman argued that even if granted duchy status, the fate of the Dimitris would remain intertwined with Kairos, as they had deep roots within the kingdom. Simon's frustration was palpable, but Roman remained steadfast in his commitment to justice and stability. He dismissed any insinuation of rebellion. In the intricate dance of power, Roman Dimitri drew lines in the sand, forcing King Daniel to confront the tumultuous reality unfolding within his realm. As Royal Knight Vice Captain Simon voiced concerns about the Dimitri's intentions, King Daniel found himself torn between acknowledging the valid points raised and the gnawing realization that his own incompetence had left him unable to control the fate of his land. King Daniel grappled with the notion that the Dimitris, particularly Roman, had evolved into an uncontrollable force, detached from the grip of the Cairo imperial family. The implications were profound, prompting the king to confront a pivotal choice, accept the current state of affairs or embark on a radical journey to redefine the very essence of Cairo. In a moment of clarity, King Daniel considered the alternative factions vying for influence. He weighed the purported impure intentions of the Dimitris against the manipulative puppetry employed by other factions. The transparency of Roman Dimitri's ambitions resonated with the king, and in a solemn declaration, King Daniel pledged to honor the honor of the Cairo imperial family by conferring the status of a dukedom upon the eastern region, including the Dimitri territory. Baron Dimitri would ascend to the esteemed title of duke, symbolizing a tangible shift in the kingdom's dynamics. With a stern countenance, King Daniel implored Roman to mete out justice by punishing Marquis Benedict, the instigator of chaos within Cairo. This directive underscored the gravity of the situation and the king's desire for a resolution that would restore order and stability. As the scene transitions to the pro Valhalla faction, Count Denver reflects on the formidable nature of Roman Dimitri's actions. With Roman's bold attack on Marquis Benedict in the heart of Cairo, Denver perceives a relentless clash looming between the Dimitri family and the aristocratic faction, each determined to prevail at any cost. Denver speculates that Roman's next destination is the Imperial Palace, where he likely aims to solicit the king's support in a struggle against the aristocratic faction. Envisioning a monumental confrontation between the royal faction and the combined forces of Dimitri and the aristocratic faction, Denver sees an opportunity for Valhalla to exploit the chaos to its advantage leveraging the ensuing conflict to shift the balance of power in their favor. In a sudden interruption, a soldier bursts into Count Denver's presence, signaling trouble. Count Denver swiftly inquires about the nature of the issue at hand. The soldier grimly reports that Roman Dimitri has spearheaded a forceful incursion into the Valhalla mansion. At that very moment, Roman strides into the office, his entrance punctuated by the forceful slam of the soldier onto the floor. In a commanding tone, Roman directs Count Denver to accept the imperial directives. Count Denver is taken aback by Roman's unexpected presence at the Valhalla faction headquarters, considering the ongoing conflict at the aristocratic faction's location. Count Denver realizes the need to compose himself in this surprising turn of events. Count Denver, perplexed, questions the validity of Roman's mention of imperial orders. Roman, undeterred, accuses Count Denver of colluding with Valhalla, alleging the theft of crucial Cairo secrets. According to Roman, the King of Cairo has commanded him to apprehend Count Denver in response to these alleged actions. With a steely gaze, Roman delivers a stern warning to Count Denver. He asserts that any attempts by Count Denver to deceive or manipulate the situation will only result in his classification as an accomplice to the rebellion. In such a scenario, Roman declares his obligation to carry out Count Denver's immediate execution. Frustration and disbelief surged within Count Denver as he vehemently denied the charges of rebellion. Count Denver raises a cautionary point to Roman, questioning whether he comprehends the repercussions of his actions, as Valhalla will assuredly retaliate. In response, Roman issues a chilling warning, advising Count Denver to measure every word henceforth. Drawing his sword, Roman demands Count Denver to lower his voice, emphasizing the gravity of the situation. Roman asserts that Count Denver fails to grasp the full extent of his predicament. This time, Roman declares, the conflict transcends mere suppression of the aristocratic faction. He vows to eradicate all traitors aligned with Valhalla and Kronos. Count Denver is left speechless, stunned by the gravity of Roman's resolve. Meanwhile, in the realm of the Prochronos faction, Count Gregory engaged in a heated exchange with Simon, 
a prominent figure in the royal faction. Count Gregory warned of the repercussions that would befall the royal faction for their actions, hinting at potential retaliation from the powerful Kronos Empire. He underscored the inherent danger in provoking the empire, whose expansionist ambitions posed a significant threat to Cairo's stability. Simon, recognizing the validity of Count Gregory's concerns, approached him cautiously, acknowledging the ever-present specter of Kronos' influence. With the king's decree solidifying Cairo's trajectory, there was no turning back. Count Gregory's realization dawned as he locked eyes with Simon, recognizing the weight of the moment. But before he could fully absorb the gravity of the situation, Simon's forceful push sent him sprawling to the ground. Asserting his authority, Simon vowed to personally confront any threat posed by Kronos should they breach Cairo's borders. His words mirrored Roman Dimitri's earlier sentiments, underscoring the royal faction's determination to eradicate potential adversaries. The scene then shifted to the Benedict territory, where Marquis Benedict grappled with frustration upon learning of the Dimitri's allegiance to the king. While he had anticipated the central government's bid to seize power, the sudden turn of events caught him off guard. Marquis Benedict contemplates that by successfully rallying the majority of the forces within the aristocratic faction, he should be poised to seize control of Cairo with relative ease. Marquis Benedict reflects on Roman's formidable prowess, acknowledging that while Roman may have emerged as the most formidable swordsman following his victory over Count Nicholas, the tides of fortune are not always in his favor. With determination, Benedict instructs his subordinate to assemble all members of the aristocratic faction and urge them to mobilize their forces towards the capital. However, his plans were thwarted when a soldier delivered troubling news. Count Parchus had rebuffed his call to arms. Frustrated by this unexpected setback, Marquis Benedict resorted to a magical communication with Count Parchus, questioning his sanity for defying orders and shirking the scheduled meeting. Count Parchus, however, remained resolute in his defiance, asserting that blind obedience to Marquis Benedict was a thing of the past. He expressed confidence in Roman Dimitri's ability to prevail in the looming conflict, signaling a decisive shift in his allegiances. Despite Marquis Benedict's warnings of potential regret, Count Parchus remained unwavering, convinced of the righteousness of his decision. Count Parchus's confession to Marquis Benedict marked a pivotal moment. As he acknowledged his wrongdoing, he understood that his days were numbered. Yet, despite his initial betrayal, Count Parchus was resolved to stand by Roman's side and do whatever he could for his cause. With a tone of urgency, Count Parchus reminded Marquis Benedict of the rumors circulating about Roman's benevolence towards his people. He emphasized that Marquis Benedict, as the leader of the prestigious aristocratic faction, seemed oblivious to the grim reality facing them, the imminent downfall of their faction. Marquis Benedict's frustration mounted at this harsh truth. Meanwhile, Count Valentino's declaration of support for Roman Dimitri signaled a shift in the political landscape. With neutral forces beginning to align themselves with Roman, the balance of power within Cairo was undergoing a seismic shift. Dimitri, an ally of the Valentino family, has bribed all the mercenaries in Cairo. This move comes in response to the actions of neutral forces led by the Marquis of Valentino. Due to this, the aristocratic faction can no longer be easily dealt with by soldiers. The scene shifts to a meeting hall where King Daniel and Roman, along with others, gather to strategize. Roman informs the group that Paulos, from the aristocrats' faction, along with other families under his command, has decided to join Roman's side. King Daniel reflects that if he hadn't accepted Dimitri's offer, the aristocrats would have likely succeeded in their coup attempt. He acknowledges that Roman and Dimitri are the driving forces behind this war. Roman points to a map, explaining that if the aristocrats had managed to assemble their forces safely, they would have advanced on the capital. However, given the current circumstances, they will be forced into a defensive position. With all factions now mobilized, Roman sees an opportunity for the royal faction to deal with the rebels decisively. King Daniel pledges the full support of the royal family to Roman, stating that Roman's orders will be treated as the king's own. In this war, Roman is appointed as the commander-in-chief, which he accepts humbly. The scene shifts to Benedict's castle, where the remaining members of the aristocratic faction have gathered. Marquis Benedict informs them that the royal troops will likely invade their lands within a week. They must secure the gates, prepare for defense, and await the opportunity to strike back. A member notes the surprising shift of Marquis Valentino from a strict neutral stance to supporting Roman Dimitri. The group discusses their chances of winning the war, with one member expressing doubt, while another suggests they must seize the moment. 
The faction found itself in a precarious position, unable to utilize half of its combat power. Concerned members suggested reaching out to potential allies among the supporters of Kronos and Valhalla. Among them, a yellow-haired member emphasized that leaders from both factions had been apprehended, implying that offering favorable terms could sway them to Mark was Benedict's side. Benedict, the leader of the faction, approved of the plan, his steely resolve evident in his demeanor. However, before proceeding, Benedict sought clarity on the timeline for securing this crucial support. Turning to the red-haired member, he inquired about the feasibility of the endeavor. The red-haired member, known for his meticulous planning, estimated that it would take at least two weeks to persuade and gather the necessary allies. Benedict nodded thoughtfully, acknowledging the gravity of the task ahead. With a sense of trust, he delegated the responsibility to the red-haired member, confident in his ability to execute the plan effectively. As the discussion continued, Benedict reminded everyone of the faction's long-standing preparations for conflict with the royal faction. Despite the sudden eruption of war, Benedict exuded an air of determination, asserting their rightful claim to seize control of Cairo's power. His words carried weight, instilling a renewed sense of purpose among the assembled members. With Benedict's leadership, they stood ready to face whatever challenges lay ahead. Meanwhile, in a secluded chamber within the royal territory, Count Nicholas stirred from unconsciousness. As his senses gradually returned, he assessed his injuries, relieved to find that they were primarily external and not life-threatening. Memories of his recent encounter with Roman Dimitri, the enigmatic figure at the center of the conflict, flooded his mind. Recalling Roman's surprising restraint and assurance of loyalty to Cairo, Nicholas pondered the true intentions behind his actions. Before he could dwell further on these thoughts, Simon, a loyal ally, burst into the room, his expression a mixture of relief and concern. In the aftermath, Count Nicholas directs Simon to recount the events that unfolded while he was unconscious. Simon reveals that the royal faction is set to dispatch troops to the front lines, with Roman Dimitri appointed as their commander. Furthermore, plans are underway within the royal faction to launch an assault on Benedict's faction. Upon hearing this alarming news, Count Nicholas swiftly instructs Simon to escort him to the gathering of troops, recognizing the imperative need for his presence there. The transition occurs swiftly from the opulent interiors of the royal palace to the bustling scene outside, where a congregation of soldiers has assembled. The focal point is Roman, who confidently walks up to a stage. As the anticipation in the air becomes palpable, Nicholas, a figure of authority, presents Roman with a sword. This ceremonial gesture signifies Roman's newfound role as the commander of the royal faction's forces. In that moment, a unique connection is forged, as if the military leader is personally bequeathing Roman the power to lead. Roman, amidst this symbolic exchange, finds a profound sense of trust in Nicholas and the king. Despite the prevailing chaos in the government system of Cairo, the sincerity of these leaders remains unscathed in Roman's eyes. The sword becomes more than a weapon, it becomes a token of allegiance, a reminder that amidst political upheavals, some core values endure. Taking the sword in hand, Roman turns toward the gathered soldiers. In a moment charged with significance, he addresses the hardships Cairo has endured. A steely determination echoes in his voice as he declares it is time to rectify the wrongs, to punish the rebels who have disrupted the peace. The sword becomes a symbol not only of authority but also of justice, a tool to restore balance in a city plagued by turmoil. Roman acknowledges the profound pain inflicted on the populace, the irreversible loss of loved ones. The memory of this pain, he asserts, cannot be erased, but through their collective efforts, they can strive to build a future free from such suffering. The promise of retribution against the rebels carries with it a ray of hope for a beleaguered city. Despite the chaos, Roman perceives an unwavering sincerity in the hearts of Nicholas and the king. As Roman raises the sword, addressing the assembly of soldiers with a commanding presence, Roman declared that in the impending war, he would be positioned at the forefront of the battlefield. With an earnest plea, he sought to instill confidence in the hearts of the royal soldiers, urging them to place their trust in him as their leader. Roman emphasized that, united in purpose, they could collectively anticipate the sweet taste of victory that awaited them on the horizon. A visual cue that signals the commencement of a new chapter, the soldiers respond fervently. The air is filled with the rhythmic chanting of Roman's name, a collective expression of allegiance and readiness. In this moment, Roman transforms from an individual to a symbol, a rallying point for those seeking justice and order. The narrative then shifts gears as Roman, now the commander, leads the assembled forces towards the aristocratic faction's palace. 
The significance of this journey is underlined by Roman's positioning, standing before flare weapons on both sides. This strategic move is not just about the impending battle, but also a display of Roman's calculated approach. The soldiers, now under his command, are entrusted with a crucial mission. Addressing the soldiers, Roman emphasizes the need for speed in this war. He discourages the construction of fortifications, opting for a swift and decisive attack. The more time given to the aristocratic faction, the more choices they will have, he warns. It's a moment where strategy takes precedence over brute force, and Roman positions himself as a leader with a clear vision. On the opposing side, Cameron, the aristocratic faction's commander, anticipates the use of flare weapons by the royal forces. He discerns a potential challenge, a magic shield enveloping Marquis Benedict's castle. This shield, as Cameron understands, is not easily penetrated. It can withstand flare bombs and regenerate its strength through mana stones. A formidable obstacle stands in the way, raising the stakes of the impending clash. Amidst the strategic considerations, Cameron's attention is drawn to a group of individuals in red cloaks near the flare weapons. Cameron's mind swirls with confusion and concern as he observes the mysterious figures clad in red cloaks. Their intentions remain enigmatic, leaving him to wonder what role they might play in the unfolding conflict. Meanwhile, on Roman's side of the battlefield, these enigmatic figures are revealed to be mages from the Phoenix Magic Tower. As they prepare for their part in the siege, Roman reflects on the strategic advantage of having the support of such formidable allies. In anticipation of the impending clash with the aristocratic faction, Roman had secured the aid of the Phoenix Tower, recognizing the pivotal role they would play. Felix, the leader of the Phoenix Magic Tower, rallies his fellow disciples, emphasizing the opportunity they have been given to repay Roman for his previous acts of kindness. With determination, Felix vows to showcase the prowess of the Phoenix Tower, ranked 13th among all magic towers on the continent. With a synchronized effort, the mages from the Phoenix Tower channel their arcane energies into the flare weapons amplifying their power beyond the ordinary. The royal forces unleash the enhanced flare weapon upon Benedict's castle, resulting in a thunderous explosion upon impact with the shield. Cameron, witnessing the devastation, is left astonished by the unexpected turn of events. As the protective barrier around Benedict's castle begins to falter under the relentless assault, a sense of urgency grips Cameron's forces. A soldier rushes in to deliver the grim news that the strength of the defensive circle is rapidly diminishing. It becomes apparent that without intervention, the aristocratic forces will soon succumb to the onslaught. Frustration mounts within Cameron as he struggles to comprehend why the usually neutral mages from the Phoenix Tower have chosen to align themselves with Roman's cause. In a desperate bid to bolster their defenses, Cameron orders the activation of emergency protocols. Mana stones are hurled into the protective magic circle, reinforcing it against the relentless barrage. Every effort is made to safeguard their position and maintain their dwindling defensive capabilities. The unexpected alliance between the Phoenix Tower and Roman's forces presents a formidable challenge, one that Cameron is determined to overcome at any cost. Meanwhile, Simon, a bystander caught amidst the chaos of battle, is bewildered by the sudden appearance of an army of magicians. Chris, a fellow observer, enlightens Simon about the recent establishment of the Phoenix Magic Tower on the lands of Dimitri. Simon is taken aback by this revelation, questioning how a magic tower that professes neutrality could become entangled in the conflict. The establishment of the Phoenix Tower in the heart of Dimitri's territory raises troubling questions about the nature of their allegiance. Simon grapples with the implications of this unexpected development, pondering the motives behind the Phoenix Tower's involvement in the conflict. Chris unfolds the intricate tapestry of alliances for Simon's benefit, elucidating how the mages of the Phoenix Magic Tower had pledged their allegiance to the Dimitri family. This allegiance, Chris explains, was born from the Dimitri's decision to stand as the Sword of Cairo, prompting the Phoenix Tower to align themselves accordingly. As Simon observes the mages diligently preparing the flare weapon for a second assault with their amplification spells, he finds himself grappling with the profound implications of this revelation. The Phoenix Tower, an organization esteemed and respected across the continent, Committing themselves to a noble family signifies a significant shift in the political landscape. Simon's mind races with questions about Roman Dimitri, the mysterious figure at the center of these alliances, and the extent of his influence. Meanwhile, the narrative pivots to Roman's perspective, where he contemplates the burgeoning combat capabilities of the Dimitri family. In Roman's estimation, King Daniel's decision to forge an alliance with the Dimitris proves to be a strategic masterstroke, 
promising victory in the ongoing conflict. With a resolute expression, Roman issues commands to his soldiers, urging them to overcome any obstacle in their path. As the flare weapon is readied for a second strike, Roman's unwavering gaze reflects his unwavering confidence in the righteousness of their cause. As the sun sets and the din of battle fades, soldiers from both factions seek respite, their weary bodies yearning for rest. Amidst the tranquility that follows the chaos of conflict, the scene transitions into the heart of Benedict Castle, where Marquis Benedict, leader of the aristocratic faction, convenes with his comrades to assess their situation. In the dimly lit chambers of the castle, Marquis Benedict's furrowed brow betrays his concern as he queries his fellow aristocrats about their ability to withstand the relentless onslaught of the royal faction forces. A somber silence hangs in the air as one member grimly informs Benedict that if the ferocity of today's attacks persists, their faction may crumble within a mere ten days. Benedict's expression darkens as he grapples with the harsh reality of their predicament. Is this the extent of their strength? Is this all they are capable of? Turning to a yellow-haired member of the faction, Benedict seeks answers regarding the whereabouts and status of Viscount Owen and Baron Winston, key figures in their resistance. The yellow-haired individual solemnly reports that the assembled forces of the aristocratic faction have reached the entrance of the northeastern region. Marquis Benedict presses for further details, his gaze unwavering as he inquires about the likelihood of success in the face of Dimitri's strategy. The yellow-haired member, exuding confidence, asserts that Baron Winston, a revered commander within their ranks, will undoubtedly prevail. He predicts a swift victory within three days, once Winston assesses the gathered soldiers under Dimitri's command. Marquis Benedict weighs these assurances carefully, realizing that the time has come to make a pivotal decision. No longer can they rely solely on the support of the imperial faction. With a steely resolve, Benedict declares his intent to transfer all authority and power to Baron Winston. Victory hinges upon this transfer of command, and Benedict is determined to ensure that Winston leads them to triumph. The scene shifts to the encampment of Baron Winston, where the air is thick with anticipation and tension. A soldier approaches Winston, bearing news gleaned from a map. Upon closer examination, Winston learns of the proximity of Count Adelian's estate, a strategic location within their grasp. The soldier further reveals that, based on intelligence gathered from the main forces, Adelian's estate lies ten days' march away. Even if they were to set their sights on Dimitri's stronghold directly, time would prove a scarce commodity. Winston's brow furrows in contemplation as he absorbs this information. Engaging in a futile conflict, he realizes, would only exacerbate their already precarious situation. In light of this, Winston proposes a calculated approach, advocating for minimal engagement to conserve their resources and maximize their chances of success. As dusk settles over the land, Baron Winston charts a course through three pivotal territories, Adelian, Rollo, and Conrad. These regions, he notes, stand apart from the fervent support for Dimitri found in the Northeast. Unlike many territories swayed by Dimitri's influence, these estates were absorbed into the aristocratic faction's fold during the northern battle, yet their allegiance remains uncertain. Adelian, a bustling commercial hub, typically steers clear of political entanglements, preferring to maintain a stance of neutrality. However, Baron Rollo and Viscount Conrad still nurse grievances against the Dimitri family, complicating the political landscape further. In response to this delicate situation, Baron Winston directs his soldiers to initiate contact with the lords of these territories. Their mission is clear, offer support from the aristocratic faction in exchange for the territory's cooperation. Promising appropriate rewards for their allegiance, Winston hopes to secure their partnership. Within a remarkably short span of time, news arrives that all three territories have accepted the proposal, signaling a significant diplomatic victory for the aristocratic faction. Under the cloak of night, Baron Winston and his forces press onward, navigating the dense forests that cloak these territories. Amidst the shadows, a red-haired soldier voices his concerns, questioning the wisdom of trusting the lords of these lands. What if their acceptance is a ruse, a trap set by Dimitri's forces? Winston, however, exudes confidence in his response. Even if it were a trap, he argues, the bulk of Dimitri's elite forces are preoccupied with Marquis Benedict's siege. Only scattered border ruffians remain to oppose them, hardly a match for the elite troops at their command. Winston's strategic acumen shines through as he explains their tactical advantage. With open terrain on all sides, they possess the ability to swiftly suppress any uprising in the northeast should one arise. The soldiers' doubts begin to dissipate in the face of Winston's assured demeanor, 
marveling at his commander's foresight and strategic prowess. Yet, the tranquility of their march is shattered by the sudden appearance of Dimitri's forces. Emerging from the darkness like phantoms, they issue a demand for surrender. Jonathan, a member of Dimitri's contingent, accuses Marquis Benedict and Winston of rebellion, warning of dire consequences should they refuse. However, Winston swiftly rebuffs the accusation, vehemently denying any treacherous intentions. Marquis Benedict, he asserts with conviction, is no traitor to their cause. Amidst the tension of impending conflict, Winston extends a proposition to Jonathan, urging him to consider their options with a level head. He promises Jonathan that if they allow Winston's forces safe passage, Marquis Benedict will exhibit great magnanimity and welcome him with open arms. However, Winston makes it clear that any display of hostility will be met with swift and decisive action, as he readies his aura sword, prepared for confrontation. On the opposing side, Jonathan confers with Mr. Knox, a fifth-circle magician renowned for his prowess from the Phoenix Magic Tower. With precision and power, Knox unleashes a devastating blast from his fire cannon, swiftly incapacitating a dozen soldiers with a single strike. Bolstered by their initial success, Jonathan wastes no time in ordering the Dimitri soldiers into action, and they swiftly overwhelm Winston's forces. Baron Winston can only watch in shock and disbelief, realizing that he has never before encountered such a formidable adversary on the Western Front. As Jonathan charges forward with determination, his sure sword technique proving lethal with a single, decisive blow, Baron Winston falls, his defeat a testament to the sheer force of their opponent. The scene transitions to a few days later, where the relentless assaults from flare weapons have left Benedict's castle vulnerable. Its protective shield lies shattered, and its walls stand on the verge of collapse, a dire situation that instills panic among the defenders. Seeking answers amidst the chaos, Marquis Benedict turns to a soldier, his voice laced with urgency as he demands updates on the state of their defense. The soldier delivers grim news. The relentless onslaught has left the aristocratic faction teetering on the brink of collapse. Benedict's anxiety mounts as he presses for information regarding Baron Winston's whereabouts and the fate of his forces. The soldier's report delivers a devastating blow. Winston's army, in its daring assault on Dimitri, was utterly decimated, and Winston himself perished on the battlefield. The revelation of Winston's demise sends shockwaves through Benedict's faction, leaving them reeling with a sense of despair. With Winston's army obliterated, they resign themselves to the grim reality that their cause may be lost. The prospect of Benedict's castle falling to the enemy looms ominously, casting a pall of uncertainty over their future. In the midst of this uncertainty, a green-haired member of the aristocratic faction tentatively suggests the unthinkable, surrender. Citing the loss of contact with their allies in the imperial faction and the dire state of their defenses, they argue that surrender may be their only option. However, a dissenting voice rises among them, a brown-haired member who challenges the notion of surrender without a fight. With Roman Dimitri's resounding victory and the opposition vanquished, a member of Marquis Benedict's faction, distinguished by his brown hair, presents a daring proposition. He suggests to Benedict that it's time to shift their allegiance from a mere faction to the empire itself. Confused by this sudden suggestion, Benedict presses the member for clarification. In response, the brown-haired member lays out a stark reality. The battle is effectively lost, and their best chance at survival lies in aligning themselves with the empire, even if it means accepting subjugation as a colony. Benedict wastes no time in ordering immediate contact with Kronos, expressing his intent to personally oversee the negotiations, recognizing the urgency of the situation. Soon thereafter, on the magic call, Baron Charlton from the formidable Kronos Empire arrives to discuss Benedict's proposal. However, Charlton's response is unexpected. He reveals that Kronos is currently in cooperation with Count Gregory, not Benedict, and questions Benedict's motives for seeking Kronos' support. Benedict, undeterred, elucidates the dire circumstances unfolding in Cairo. He paints a picture of chaos, detailing the royal family's ruthless purge and the imprisonment of Count Gregory and his supporters. Benedict argues that aligning with Kronos will not only ensure stability for the Empire, but also serve their mutual interests. Intrigued by Benedict's proposition and recognizing the potential benefits, Charlton agrees to lend support to the central government. In a swift turn of events, Benedict implores Kronos to launch an assault on Cairo's vulnerable western front. Charlton, sensing the opportunity, readily accepts Benedict's offer. Within a mere 12 hours, three front lines on the western front in Cairo were breached, with two of them falling to the enemy's advance. 
Amidst this tumultuous scene, Marquis Benedict appeared on a magical call with King Daniel. With a tone of curiosity, Marquis Benedict asked the king if he was pleased with the gift that had been given to him. However, his hopes are dashed as King Daniel responds with frustration and confusion. The king demands to know why Benedict has embroiled the empire in the kingdom's internal affairs, expressing concern over the potential repercussions of their intervention. Undeterred by the king's skepticism, Benedict calmly explains that he had no choice but to act decisively in order to ensure the survival of his faction amidst the turmoil. He challenges King Daniel to consider the gravity of their situation and make a decisive choice regarding their future. Faced with a pivotal decision that could shape the fate of Cairo, Marquis Benedict presents King Daniel with two stark options, to abandon Cairo and overthrow Benedict himself, or to defend the kingdom by dispatching forces to bolster the Western Front. As the weight of this decision hangs heavily in the air, Benedict urges the king to consider his choices carefully. He expresses confidence that, as a wise and judicious ruler, King Daniel will ultimately make the right decision for the kingdom's future. This assertion leaves King Daniel stunned, grappling with the gravity of the situation and the immense responsibility resting upon his shoulders. In the hushed corridors of the royal palace, King Daniel found himself grappling with a truth that cut deeper than any sword. Marquis Benedict, a man he had once affectionately called uncle, now stood at the helm of Cairo's descent into chaos. The once harmonious kingdom teetered on the verge of destruction, and Daniel knew that drastic measures were imperative to salvage what remained. Daniel's contemplation led him to a pivotal decision, a strategic shift in focus from the impending attack on Benedict's castle and the aristocratic faction to the defense of the beleaguered Western Front. It was a gamble, one that he believed held the key to the kingdom's survival. However, Daniel couldn't shake the gnawing fear that this move would only embolden the aristocratic faction, allowing them to exploit their ties with Kronos, the ominous empire lurking in the shadows. In a dramatic exchange, King Daniel confides in Simon, expressing his desire to maintain a facade of weakness and incapability as a ruler. Despite this, King Daniel adamantly asserts that he refuses to be remembered as a traitor to his homeland. Urging Simon to swiftly reach out to Roman Dimitri, King Daniel underscores the importance of immediate action. Then on the magic call with Roman Dimitri, in a momentous exchange, King Daniel reveals to Roman the unsettling news that Marquis Benedict has solidified an alliance with the formidable Kronos Empire. The second line of the Western Front has succumbed, and the impending fall of the third line looms ominously. Despite the critical importance of dismantling the aristocratic faction, King Daniel emphasizes his reluctance to grant unchecked authority to the Empire's army. Daniel voiced these concerns to Roman, seeking guidance in a turbulent sea of conflicting interests. Roman, pragmatic and seasoned by the harsh realities of warfare, warned Daniel of the repercussions of indecision. He cautioned that regret would become an unwelcome companion if Daniel failed to quell the rebellion swiftly. However, Daniel's focus remained fixed on the impending horror emanating from the West, a force threatening to engulf the entire kingdom. As the weight of responsibility bore down on him, Daniel grappled with the paradox of leadership in times of darkness. Roman, perceptive and insightful, reminded him of their shared commitment to cleansing the kingdom, regardless of the adversaries they faced. He forced Daniel to confront the harsh truth that leaving enemies unpunished would only lead to a future marked by even greater sacrifices. In a moment of reflection, Roman pondered whether Daniel, born in peacetime, could ever be the king the kingdom needed in these tumultuous times. He recognized Daniel's struggle to accept the harsh reality and the sacrifices inherent in leading during dark times. In the dimly lit chambers of the palace, Roman conveyed to King Daniel the critical state of affairs at the Western Front. Unlike the preceding defensive lines, the third stood fortified with a capable army. Moreover, Kronos, hurriedly preparing for the onslaught, had not managed to muster their full might. Roman's assurance to Daniel lay in their commander-in-chief's competence. Roman extends assurance to King Daniel, proposing a strategic plan. If the Western soldiers can hold their ground for a brief duration, Roman pledges to swiftly address the entire faction led by Marquis Benedict within three days. With determination, Roman vows to mobilize to the Western Front and thwart the advances of the Kronos Empire. Daniel, burdened by the weight of his decisions, agreed to Roman's plan, committing to sustaining the defense for three arduous days, regardless of the cost. He implored Roman to swiftly quell any rebellion, demonstrating a resolve to uphold order even amidst chaos. With a heavy heart, Daniel braced himself for the sacrifices ahead, knowing that the fate of Cairo hung in the balance. As night cloaked the land, 
Roman sprang into action, orchestrating the movement of troops under the cover of darkness. The element of surprise was their ally as they swiftly maneuvered into position, catching the aristocratic faction off guard. With strategic precision, Romans' forces severed the retreat path from Benedict's castle, effectively trapping their adversaries within. While the enemy slept, oblivious to the impending doom, Roman's troops awaited the inevitable moment when the magical shield protecting Benedict's fortress would reach its breaking point. Every passing minute was fraught with tension as they bided their time, knowing that their decisive strike would come when the enemy's defenses faltered. With dawn's light heralding a new day, Roman addressed his assembled soldiers, his voice steady and resolute. He informed them of the imminent failure of the shield enveloping Benedict's castle, signaling the dawn of their final assault. Yet, amidst the anticipation of battle, an unexpected figure stepped forward, eager to claim his place on the front lines. Count Parchus, once a member of the aristocratic faction, now stood before Roman, a testament to the shifting allegiances wrought by the turmoil of war. In a poignant moment of redemption, Parchus revealed his past defiance of Benedict's orders, choosing instead to ally himself with Roman's cause. His request to lead the charge was not merely a bid for glory, but a heartfelt plea to prove his unwavering loyalty. Roman, taken aback by Parchus's transformation, couldn't help but see a reflection of a figure from his distant past. Memories of a blood demon, driven by unyielding devotion and tempered by the passage of time, flooded his mind. This enigmatic figure, known for his insatiable thirst for power, had undergone myriad transformations before ascending to a position of authority. Yet, beneath the veneer of strength lay the essence of an eccentric old soul, unchanged by the passage of ages. In the crucible of conflict, the blood demon fought with unwavering tenacity until the bitter end, standing shoulder to shoulder with the ultimate victor, Zhang Hyuk. Theirs was a tale of resilience etched in the annals of battle. Meanwhile, Roman turned his attention to Parchus, urging authenticity in their interactions. He assured Parchus that there was no need for pretenses, offering a conditional reprieve for past misdeeds if Parchus could prove his mettle in the impending war. Amidst the chaos, Roman, with a commanding gesture, singled out Parchus among the frontline warriors, declaring him the traitor of the aristocratic faction. Undeterred, Parchus, with a fierce determination burning in his eyes, pledged to lay down his life in service to Roman Dimitri. This proclamation marked a poignant moment of loyalty and commitment in the face of impending turmoil. As the sun dawned on a new day, whispers of support from the formidable Kronos Empire reached the ears of the soldiers in the aristocratic faction. The news, like a gust of wind beneath their wings, lifted their spirits and swelled their pride. In the midst of this heightened morale, Felix, standing alone before Benedict's imposing castle, contemplated his debt to Lord Roman. Felix saw an opportunity to repay Roman's faith and trust in him, and he resolved to employ the formidable Phoenix Magical Tower's secret weapon. Felix, invoking the spell named Combustion, summoned a majestic dragon into existence above him. The soldiers of the aristocratic faction, Witnessing this spectacle, were left bewildered and confused by the lone figure's mysterious actions. Unveiling the full force of his spell, Felix unleashed a fiery rain onto Benedict's castle. The magical shield, once impervious, crumbled under the relentless assault, sending shockwaves through the enemy ranks. Pandemonium erupted as soldiers scrambled in desperation to escape the blazing onslaught. The castle walls, once standing tall and defiant, now succumbed to the fiery deluge. Amidst the chaos, Count Parchus, leading his troops, charged through the breached fortress walls. He plunged into the fray, displaying remarkable agility and skill as he swiftly dispatched numerous adversaries. Parchus, defying expectations, employed an acceleration spell that allowed him to take down foes with unparalleled speed. In a battlefield where others sought safety, he embraced perilous tasks that would have been shunned by the faint-hearted. The gamble paid off, and Parchus, risking life and limb, proved his loyalty and worth to Roman on the battlefield. Having fulfilled his pivotal role, Count Parchus paused to reflect on the significance of his actions. He recognized that the time had come for Roman Dimitri to step onto the stage and play his own decisive role. As Roman strode into Benedict's castle, the aristocratic soldiers recoiled in alarm, branding him as the feared Demon of Cairo and rallying to eliminate him by any means necessary. Yet, Roman welcomed the epithet with a wry smile finding a strange sense of pride in the moniker. With a swift and calculated grace, he dispatched his adversaries with ease, leaving a trail of defeated foes in his wake. Meanwhile, in a clandestine magical communication, an aristocratic soldier delivered grim tidings to the faction's leaders. The castle walls had been breached, 
the defensive shield depleted, and Roman Dimitri's forces had routed the soldiers sent by each noble family. Before the soldier could finish, Roman seized control of the communication device, his voice resonating with steely resolve. Addressing the assembled traitors, Roman's words dripped with disdain as he assured them of their impending demise. He dismissed any hope of mercy, declaring that they would face the full extent of his wrath for betraying their homeland. Even if they were to beg for clemency, Roman vowed to mete out justice upon them and their descendants for generations to come. Marquis Benedict, stunned into silence, could only listen as Roman delivered his chilling ultimatum. With a final warning, Roman promised that their paths would cross soon, leaving Benedict to ponder the inevitability of their reckoning. A decade prior, the corridors of power in Cairo bore witness to a pivotal exchange between King Daniel and Marquis Benedict. King Daniel, cognizant of the precarious situation with the empire, implored Benedict to consider the lives of those valiantly battling against imperial forces. Frustrated by what he perceived as the king's incompetence, Benedict discerned that Cairo's inability to make swift decisions had allowed pro-imperial factions, aligned with Valhalla and Kronos, to expand their influence, gradually gaining control over the city. The funeral of the queen, who also happened to be Benedict's sister, became a somber backdrop for contemplation. A disquieting thought gnawed at Benedict's mind, wondering if Cairo could endure under the continued rule of the seemingly ineffective king. This contemplation stirred a profound dissatisfaction within Marquis Benedict, prompting him to express his lack of trust in Cairo's royal family to other nobles. A collective sentiment resonated among the discontented nobles, leading them to forge an alliance that marked the inception of the aristocratic faction. While their initial focus was born out of dissatisfaction with the monarchy, the faction's objectives evolved over time. Marquis Benedict, in particular, began to harbor ambitions of ascending the throne, setting in motion a series of clandestine maneuvers that would culminate in a bid for power. Fast forward to the present, and Marquis Benedict found himself in a state of panic, reeling from the impact of Roman's ominous words during the magical communication. As he reflected on the intricate web of events that had led to this moment, Benedict realized that Roman Dimitri had effectively dismantled his carefully laid plans to seize control of Cairo. A sense of impending doom gripped Benedict, realizing that his life hung in the balance if he remained entangled in this mess. Faced with the urgency of the situation, Marquis Benedict, driven by fear and desperation, rallied the remaining members of the aristocratic faction. In a desperate bid for survival, he urged them to scatter and seek refuge while appealing to the Kronos Empire for assistance. Chaos erupted as the faction members, once united in their descent, now scattered like leaves in the wind, each seeking refuge and salvation. Amidst the chaos, the unexpected figure of Kevin, one of Roman's formidable soldiers, emerged as the harbinger of doom for Benedict and his fleeing comrades. Positioned strategically at the gates, Kevin intercepted the retreating faction members, swiftly taking down the soldiers tasked with guarding the escape routes. In a futile attempt to resist the inevitable, Benedict commanded his remaining soldiers to attack Kevin, hoping to turn the tide in their favor. However, Kevin, a force to be reckoned with, effortlessly neutralized the attacking soldiers with a single, decisive strike. The sight left Mark was Benedict stunned and disoriented prompting him to abandon his futile attempt at resistance. In a desperate bid for self-preservation, Benedict hastily retreated, racing toward the other end of the corridor. In the unfolding drama of betrayal and pursuit, the narrative took a dramatic turn as Chris emerged from the shadows, boldly positioning himself in front of Marquis Benedict. With a decisive strike, Chris swiftly incapacitated the soldiers attempting to shield their leader. Witnessing this unexpected intervention, Benedict's survival instincts kicked in, propelling him into a frenzied sprint for his life. As he darted through the perilous terrain, the urgency of the moment eclipsed any other considerations in Benedict's mind. Thoughts of vengeance simmered beneath the surface, about to settle scores in the future once he had eluded the immediate threat. Spotting a concealed cave entrance, Benedict seized the opportunity for temporary respite, vanishing into the refuge of its shadows just as the royal soldiers spilled from the castle, determined to track him down. Within the hidden sanctuary, Benedict, while contemplating the tumultuous events, couldn't shake the bitter realization that everything had gone awry due to the meddling of Roman Dimitri. Despite the throne of Cairo beckoning tantalizingly close, it seemed an unattainable dream, overshadowed by the chaotic repercussions of Roman's interference. Benedict's aspirations pivoted from seizing power to a fervent desire for revenge, a commitment to redress the perceived insults he had suffered. However, amidst the echoes of Benedict's contemplation, 
a member of the aristocratic faction emerged with somber news. Their escape routes were blocked, and the possibility of evasion seemed extinguished. As Viscount Owen approached, Benedict tensed, anticipating the worst. The air was thick with tension, the outcome hanging in the balance. Yet, before Viscount Owen could execute his next move, the dynamic shifted once more with Roman's sudden intervention. With strategic precision, Roman incapacitated Owen. The cave's entrance now harbored an unexpected visitor, as Roman entered and issued a stern command for Benedict to reveal himself. In the dim recesses of the cave, Benedict faced a pivotal choice. Comply with Roman's directive or resist, risking further escalation. The weight of the decision pressed heavily on Benedict's shoulders as he emerged from the shadows, his fate now inextricably tied to the whims of the enigmatic Roman. The scene transitioned to the bustling streets of Cairo, where Benedict, now in handcuffs, was paraded before the public eye under Roman's watchful gaze. Frustration and indignation boiled within Benedict as he confronted Roman, protesting vehemently against the perceived injustice. He argued passionately, highlighting his sacrificial efforts in defense of Cairo during the reign of the perceived incompetent King Daniel. Benedict questioned the fairness of his treatment, grappling with the notion that his allegiance to the kingdom should have shielded him from such a humiliating fate. In a desperate attempt to assert his worth, Benedict challenged Roman's understanding of loyalty, probing whether Roman could truly serve a king like Daniel with undivided devotion. Benedict's tirade extended to the recurrent border breaches by the Kronos Empire, laying blame squarely on the shoulders of traitors within Cairo's borders. Marquis Benedict, plagued by doubt, turns to Roman, seeking validation for his actions. Roman, though understanding, points out the lack of tangible results from Benedict's endeavors. Despite Benedict's formation of the aristocratic faction, Cairo remains unchanged in its power dynamics, and the kingdom's security hasn't improved. Roman urges Benedict to consider serving a greater purpose beyond personal gain. Stunned by Roman's insight, Benedict reflects on his choices. Roman reassures him that protecting the weak is commendable, but cautions against disregarding the consequences. Benedict, repentant, offers allegiance to the royal family, but Roman deems it too late. With a single decisive blow, Roman ends Benedict's reign, extinguishing the once mighty giant of Cairo. The scene transitions to the royal palace, where a soldier informs King Daniel of Roman's triumph over Benedict and the aristocratic faction. Daniel, recognizing Roman's accomplishment, prepares to celebrate. However, his focus remains on the looming threat from the Kronos Empire advancing towards the western front lines. Daniel urges Roman's immediate deployment to confront this danger. Promising Roman the highest reward in due time, Daniel underscores the urgency of Roman's task and the paramount importance of securing the kingdom's borders against external threats. In the ethereal realm of the western third defense line, a commander's voice echoed through the magic call, announcing a crucial message by the decree of his majesty. The fate of the rebellion lay in the hands of this defense line, and the commander conveyed the king's command. If they could endure for a mere three days, the rebellion would be quelled, and Roman Dimitri would be dispatched to reinforce the western front. The call held an air of urgency, emphasizing the pivotal role the defense line played in the unfolding drama. The focus shifted to the figure of Flora. The commander's proclamation hinted at her earlier prediction, marking her as a noteworthy figure on the Western Front. Flora had emerged as a standout persona after her meeting with Roman Dimitri and her subsequent departure from Lawrence to enroll in the Royal Academy. Flora's journey did not end with her enrollment. Instead, she delved into the intricacies of tactics, evolving into a formidable force. Flora carved her path, becoming the first female staff officer in Cairo. The acceptance of Flora's appointment was not immediate. The decision sparked various opinions, with many questioning the unorthodox choice. However, as Flora demonstrated her strategic prowess and leadership skills, doubts began to dissipate. Her capabilities became increasingly evident, and she earned recognition not merely as a female officer, but as a competent and skilled leader. The scene seamlessly transitioned to a meeting within the confines of the Western Third Defense Line, where the head of staff, Baron Noel, addressed a gathering of officers. Baron Noel, a seasoned strategist, painted a pragmatic picture. He declared the impracticality of quelling the rebellion within the stipulated three days and urged the officers to brace themselves for a prolonged battle. The air hung heavy with uncertainty as Baron Noel highlighted the logistical challenges, even if the Western forces successfully quelled the rebellion using warp gates. Travel time alone would consume a day or two, 
making the three-day deadline seem like an impossible feat the prospect of failure loomed over the room, casting a shadow on the confidence of the assembled officers. However, amidst the gloom, the voice of reason emerged in the form of Flora. With unwavering confidence, she expressed a dissenting opinion, challenging the prevailing narrative. Flora speculated that Roman Dimitri had set the three-day deadline, but she confidently asserted that the timeline wouldn't exceed five days. Count Vandenberg, the Western Front commander, sought clarification from Flora, prompting her to draw from her direct experiences with Roman. She painted a nuanced portrait of Roman Dimitri, emphasizing his unpredictability and the inadequacy of judging him by common standards. Flora's conviction in her assessment of Roman's character resonated through her words, instilling a sense of cautious optimism within the gathering. Count Vandenberg remained skeptical, questioning the foundation of Flora's judgment. Undeterred, Flora pointed to the external pressures faced by Roman and the looming collapse of Duke Benedict, indicating a sense of urgency that transcended conventional expectations. Kronos, the formidable aggressor, had breached Cairo's western borders, leaving turmoil and uncertainty in its wake. As the citizens of Cairo grappled with the imminent threat, Flora, a seasoned strategist, took charge, revealing a map that meticulously outlined Kronos' attack patterns. It was a grim testament to the ruthless efficiency of their enemy. Flora's eyes scanned the faces of those gathered, her voice steady as she relayed crucial information. She elucidated Kronos' tactics, highlighting their penchant for melee combat upon invasion and the subsequent deployment of war mages for pivotal engagements. It was a pattern they had observed, a pattern that had led them to the precipice of their current predicament. Count Vanderberg, a stalwart leader amongst them, listened intently as Flora continued. With a keen understanding of the enemy's strengths, he voiced concerns about Kronos' possession of mage towers, foreseeing their potential to amplify the mage's power. Flora acknowledged the gravity of the situation, emphasizing the vulnerability of mages during spellcasting. Eliminate the mage variable, Flora urged, her tone resolute. She proposed a strategy wherein Cairo's forces would anticipate the mage's movements and lay traps accordingly. It was a bold plan, but Count Vanderberg balked at its feasibility. How could they possibly discern the precise location of the elusive mages, especially when they could sense mana fluctuations? Flora's response was unwavering. Force their hand, she declared. By orchestrating a grand warrior battle, Cairo could compel Kronos to mobilize their troops, thereby exposing the mages' positions. It was a risky gambit, but one that held the promise of turning the tide in their favor. Count Vanderberg pondered the implications, his mind racing with possibilities. The plan had merit, but there remained a crucial question. How would they evade detection by the mages? Flora's answer was as ingenious as it was audacious. Warriors, she explained, could manipulate the surrounding mana to obscure the traps, rendering them undetectable even to the keen senses of the mages. The realization dawned on Count Vanderberg a glimmer of hope amidst the encroaching darkness. Flora's proposal was nothing short of brilliant, offering a tangible path to victory in the face of overwhelming odds. But there was one final hurdle to overcome, finding a warrior bold enough to assume the mantle of the Grand Warrior, a beacon of hope in their darkest hour. As tension hung thick in the air, a voice broke through the silence. Rodwell Dimitri, a figure previously relegated to the periphery, stepped forward with unwavering resolve. I will do it, he declared, his voice ringing with determination. In the face of impending conflict, Rodwell felt compelled to step up and participate in the Grand Warrior battle. Turning to his commander, he made his request known, his determination evident in his eyes. Count Vanderberg, recognizing the inevitability of Rodwell's involvement, affirmed his pivotal role in the forthcoming confrontation. Afterwards, outside the confines of the command center, Flora sought out Rodwell, her curiosity piqued by his unwavering eagerness to take on perilous tasks. She couldn't fathom why Rodwell, whose service time had long expired, continued to linger amidst the chaos of battle. To Flora, Rodwell appeared less a patriot and more a desperate soul clinging to life, unwilling to accept his own mortality. Despite her skepticism, Flora conceded the necessity of Rodwell's involvement, particularly considering his potential as a future leader within their ranks. Rodwell, however, confided in Flora a deeper motivation, his burning ambition to surpass the legacy of the Romans. This revelation caught Flora off guard. Initially resistant to change, Rodwell now aspired not only to emulate but to surpass the renowned Romans, a pursuit that fueled his continued service to Cairo. Flora, in turn, shared her own reasons for remaining in the fray, 
a desire to learn from past mistakes and prevent their recurrence in the future. Their conversation took on a somber tone as Flora implored Rodwell to emerge victorious at any cost, expressing a genuine hope for his survival. With their exchange concluded, they prepared themselves mentally for the impending battle, stealing their resolve for what lay ahead. The following day dawned with a palpable tension in the air as Rodwell stepped forward, his gaze unwavering as he issued a bold challenge to the Kronos Empire. Across the battlefield, his opponent, Osperd, a formidable three-star aura swordsman, stood ready to accept the challenge. In that moment, Rodwell grappled with the stark reality of his situation. In Cairo, achieving a three-star rank was considered prestigious, yet in the eyes of the Kronos Empire, even the lowest-ranking soldiers boasted four-star prowess. It was a testament to the formidable nature of their adversary, a reminder of the daunting odds they faced. As the duel commenced, Osperd surged forward with a fierce determination, his aura ablaze with intensity. In the midst of the intense battle, Rodwell found himself struggling to fend off his opponent's relentless assaults. As Kronos soldiers rallied behind Osperd, their cheers echoing across the battlefield, Rodwell couldn't help but feel the gaping disparity between their worlds and his own in Cairo. Despite his valiant efforts, he couldn't bridge the chasm separating him from his brother. Yet, undeterred by the odds stacked against him, Rodwell remained resolute, determined to fight until the bitter end. As Osperd launched a fierce attack, his aura blade aimed squarely at Rodwell's face, a surge of urgency pulsed through Rodwell's veins. Dodging meant conceding defeat, but failure to evade the strike risked losing his sight. In a split-second decision, Rodwell abandoned caution and charged headlong towards Osperd, his sword poised to strike. With a swift and decisive maneuver, Rodwell overpowered his opponent, sending Osberg crashing to the ground. As victory was declared, Rodwell stood triumphant, a victorious smile etched upon his face, despite the injuries sustained from Osberg's final assault. As Rodwell returned to the camp, his heart pounded with anticipation, seeking confirmation from Flora about the success of their meticulously crafted plan. Flora's assurance washed over him like a soothing bomb, relieving the tension that had gripped him since the onset of their daring strategy. The weight of uncertainty lifted from his shoulders, replaced by a glimmer of hope for their besieged city. Meanwhile, amidst the ranks of the Kronos forces, Count Fabius, a commanding figure with an aura of authority, issued swift directives to his soldiers. Their arsenal, including the ominous flare weapon and the formidable war mages, stood poised for action. Across the battlefield, the sight of these imposing assets sent a shiver down the spines of the Cairo defenders, reminding them of the daunting task that lay ahead. Sensing the impending confrontation, Count Vanderberg, a stalwart leader among the Cairo forces, turned to Flora for guidance. His inquiry regarding the timing of the magic trap detonation revealed his trust in Flora's strategic acumen. Flora's response was measured and insightful, emphasizing the importance of precision in triggering the traps. She highlighted the vulnerability of the Kronos mages at the peak of their spellcasting, underscoring the need for meticulous timing to ensure maximum impact. With Flora's expertise guiding their actions, Count Vanderberg nodded in understanding, entrusting her with the pivotal task of signaling the detonation. His confidence in Flora's judgment bolstered their resolve, strengthening their resolve to face the impending onslaught with unwavering determination. As the Kronos mages began their incantations, a tense silence descended upon the battlefield, broken only by the crackling energy of anticipation. Flora's signal rippled through the Cairo ranks like a ripple on a pond, prompting Count Vanderberg to issue the command for the magic traps to be unleashed. In an instant, the air was rent asunder by a deafening explosion, engulfing the Kronos mages in a maelstrom of arcane energy. As Fabius, the esteemed commander of Kronos, surveyed the battlefield, his expression twisted into one of surprise. He issued a resolute command to his soldiers, urging them to unleash their might upon the forces of Cairo. With audacity, Cairo dared to oppose the empire, and Fabius vowed that Kronos would demonstrate the true extent of its power. In a synchronized onslaught, the Kronos soldiers surged forward, their determination palpable as they charged towards the Cairo forces. Despite their relentless advance, the Cairo soldiers stood firm, steadfastly defending their city's walls. They repelled the Kronos soldiers, pushing them back with unwavering resolve. Amidst the chaos, a sudden intervention from Flora disrupted the fray. With precision, she loosed an arrow, felling one of the Kronos soldiers. Her voice rang out, rallying the Cairo soldiers to maintain their focus. She reminded them of their advantage, now that the Kronos forces had lost their magician. Amidst the chaos of battle, Flora's voice rose above the din, rallying the Cairo soldiers with unwavering resolve. 
Families huddled in fear within the confines of Cairo, their safety threatened by the relentless advance of the Kronos Empire. The battle raged on relentlessly, each passing moment bringing the besieged city closer to the brink of collapse. Kronos forces, seemingly on the verge of breaching the fortified walls, began to falter under the weight of prolonged conflict. Then, on the third day, a glimmer of hope emerged on the horizon as the army led by Lord Roman Dimitri arrived at Cairo's western front. The sight of Roman's forces sent shockwaves through the ranks of the Kronos Empire, prompting a hasty retreat. Inside the war room, the commanders of the Cairo forces convened to assess the situation. Count Vanderberg marveled at the swiftness with which the rebellion had been quelled, expressing gratitude to Roman for his timely intervention. However, Roman cautioned that the war was far from over, urging the Cairo forces to remain vigilant. Count Vanderberg, puzzled by the need for further mobilization, questioned Roman's rationale. Roman, gesturing towards the map, pointed out the audacity of Kronos' intrusion into Cairo's territory. He emphasized that Cairo could no longer afford to passively endure Kronos' aggression and must instead adopt a proactive stance. With the king's authority backing him, Roman declared his intent to lead the charge against the retreating Kronos' forces. He instructed the commanders to prepare the troops to pursue and drive back the invaders, signaling a shift in strategy that caught many by surprise. Among those taken aback was Rodwell, who struggled to reconcile the image of the man before him with his memories of Roman. Recollections flooded Rodwell's mind of a different Roman, one consumed by vice, detached from the honor of swordsmanship, and frequently embroiled in tavern brawls. In disbelief, Rodwell marveled at the profound transformation that had taken place within his elder brother in such a short span of time. Roman's voice and demeanor bore little resemblance to the wayward soul Rodwell once knew, yet there was no denying his identity. For Rodwell, who had dedicated his life to upholding the family name on the Western Front, Roman's sudden emergence overshadowed his own achievements, leaving him questioning the significance of his endeavors. Rodwell, once hailed as the future hope of the Dimitri family, found himself grappling with a sense of disillusionment. The weight of his past ambitions now felt like burdensome shackles, leaving him questioning the purpose of his ongoing struggle. As he reflected on his journey, doubts crept in, and he couldn't help but wonder if it had all been in vain. Baron Neal's voice cut through the somber atmosphere, questioning the tangible benefits of engaging in relentless conflict with the Kronos Empire. His inquiry struck a chord with Rodwell, echoing the doubts that had been festering within him. Flora, ever pragmatic, added her voice to the conversation, expressing concern for the soldiers who had endured the grueling schedule of the past few days. Her words painted a stark picture of the toll that continuous warfare had taken on their ranks, prompting her to caution against hasty decisions that could lead to further devastation. Count Vanderberg, known for his strategic insight, offered a perspective that sought to balance caution with necessity. He underscored the strategic importance of the Western Front, emphasizing that their mission was not simply to vanquish the Kronos forces but to safeguard the safety and security of Cairo. His words resonated with a sense of pragmatism, advocating for a measured approach that prioritized the long-term interests of their city. In contrast, Roman's presence brought a solemn gravity to the discussion. With a seriousness in his gaze, he challenged the group to consider the broader implications of their actions. He reminded them of the ongoing conflict between Kronos and the Southern Kingdom's alliance, suggesting that their enemies were currently unable to commit their full forces to the confrontation. Roman's words carried a weight of conviction, urging his comrades to rise to the occasion and confront the atrocities perpetrated by the Kronos Empire. The revelation of Roman's unwavering resolve left the gathered commanders reeling, prompting Count Vanderberg to seek guidance on their next steps. As the scene shifted to a few moments later, Flora found herself contemplating Roman's steadfast commitment to their cause. Despite his transformation from his reckless past, she couldn't help but feel a sense of awe at his unwavering determination. Her thoughts were interrupted by the unexpected sight of Roman and Rodwell standing together. Roman, ever perceptive, acknowledged Rodwell's recent injuries sustained during the warrior battle. With genuine gratitude, he credited Rodwell with playing a pivotal role in dealing with the Kronos mages and ensuring the defense of the Western Front until his own arrival. His words carried a sincerity that resonated deeply with Rodwell, leaving him flustered by the sudden shift in their dynamic. Roman pondered the relationship between himself and Rodwell Dimitri, his brother. Despite forming new bonds in his current life, Roman felt compelled to approach Rodwell. With a sense of caution, Roman acknowledged that Rodwell might not yet be ready to welcome him back into his life. However, 
he imparted a solemn reminder to Rodwell, urging him to consider one crucial fact. If Rodwell chose to stand by Roman's side tomorrow, they would together unleash the full force of the Dimitri name upon those who dared to harm them. With a steely gaze, Roman conveyed the gravity of their shared plight. As retribution for the loss of Rodwell's eye, Roman vowed that the Kronos Empire would pay a heavy toll in lives. He emphasized the bond between them, urging Rodwell to remember their brotherhood despite the trials that lay ahead. The narrative unfolds in the Kronos camp, where Baron Charlton, a figure of the diplomatic corps, delivers a disheartening message to Count Fabius. The rebellion, led by Benedict, has crumbled entirely, and the arrival of the royal army at the Western Front prompts Baron Charlton to suggest that Count Fabius consider a strategic retreat. The news catches Count Perius by surprise, leaving him incredulous at the speed of Benedict's failure. Count Fabius, although taken aback, stands firm. Fleeing is not an option for him, and he articulates that his honor and commitment to his troops prevent him from abandoning his post despite considerable losses. Baron Charlton, however, emphasizes the broader ramifications of their actions, highlighting the Empire's primary focus on the conflict with the Kingdom Alliance. He urges Count Fabius to carefully weigh the consequences of losing even a fraction of their forces, as it could impact the larger southern territories. Frustrated but ultimately conceding to Charlton's counsel, Count Perius agrees with the proposal to order a retreat at the break of dawn. The scene transitions to the next day, where all Kronos' forces are in the process of withdrawing. A soldier suggests leaving scouts behind to prepare for potential threats, but Count Fabius dismisses the idea, expressing confidence in facing any pursuing Cairo forces head-on. As the Kronos forces strategically withdraw, a sudden development occurs. A vigilant soldier spots an approaching enemy army from the rear. Count Fabius, displaying a sly smirk, is not surprised. Instead, he sees this as an opportunity for a strategic trap. Quickly, he orders his soldiers to turn and face the approaching enemy, eager to exploit the situation to crush the Cairo forces and potentially bring about the collapse of the Western Front. The tension mounts as both Cairo and Kronos forces clash in a fierce and unexpected battle. Meanwhile, the narrative shifts to the previous night at the Cairo strategy camp. Leaders gather to discuss their expectations as they prepare for the anticipated retreat of the Kronos Empire's army. Their strategy was simple yet bold, divide and conquer. With the enemy stretched out in a long column, the Cairo forces devised a plan to split into two groups and launch simultaneous attacks on both the center and rear of the Kronos ranks. Roman, alongside Rodwell and Chris, would lead the assault on the center, while Duke Vanderberg, Baron Neal, and Flora would coordinate the attack on the rear. Despite the apparent riskiness of dividing their forces, especially with potential dangers lurking in the rear, the Cairo commanders remained undeterred. Roman reassured Baron Neal, explaining that once the center attack gained traction, reinforcements would be dispatched to bolster the rear assault. Their goal was clear, sow chaos among the Kronos ranks and secure a decisive victory for Cairo. Roman's unwavering confidence in their success resonated with his comrades as they prepared to execute their plan. As the scene shifted back to the battlefield, the Kronos vice commander rallied his troops, reminding them of their allegiance to the Empire and urging them not to falter in the face of the Cairo onslaught. Empowered by his words, the Kronos soldiers regained their footing and began to push back against the Cairo forces. Count Vanderberg, observing the resilience of the Kronos troops, recognized the formidable nature of an empire accustomed to invasion. Concerned by the shifting momentum, Vanderberg rallied his own troops, encouraging them to stand firm and press on against the imperial soldiers. In the heart of the conflict, a stark dichotomy unfolded. While Vanderberg's forces struggled to maintain their ground, a one-sided massacre ensued in the center of the battlefield. Chris and his fellow Roman soldiers executed their attack with ruthless efficiency, swiftly overwhelming the Kronos forces. Witnessing the ferocity of their assault, Rodwell found himself in disbelief. The soldiers of the Dimitri lineage, once considered formidable but now transformed into seemingly unstoppable warriors, left Rodwell awestruck. As the battle raged on, Rodwell's thoughts drifted back to a pivotal moment shared with his brother Roman. Reflecting on the night when Roman had urged him to join their cause, promising to reveal the true strength of the Dimitri legacy, Rodwell struggled to comprehend the significance of his brother's words at the time. Rodwell's mind churned with newfound understanding as Roman outlined their next move. Roman directed Chris to split their forces, with Chris assuming command and leading a unit to the rear while Roman intercepted the approaching Kronos Empire forces from the side. Rodwell, taken aback by this sudden decision, 
grappled with the realization that Roman might be leaving him behind. As Chris departed with the second unit, Rodwell couldn't shake the feeling of uncertainty lingering in his mind. Meanwhile, at the rear of the battlefield, the Cairo forces found themselves on the defensive, steadily being pushed back by the relentless advance of the Kronos troops. Flora, sensing the urgency of the situation, signaled to Count Vanderberg, prompting the Cairo soldiers to form a shield wall. The Kronos forces, caught off guard by this unexpected maneuver, attempted to breach the defensive line, but the Cairo soldiers held firm, leaving no openings for their adversaries. Just as the Kronos forces intensified their efforts to break through the shield wall, Chris arrived at the rear with the second unit, injecting a surge of hope into the embattled Cairo ranks. Count Vanderberg wasted no time, instructing the soldiers to break formation and launch a counterattack. Chris, rallying his unit, urged them to showcase the strength of the Dimitri legacy. With remarkable skill and coordination, Chris and his soldiers swiftly dispatched a significant number of Kronos troops. Observing the prowess of Roman's knights in action, Flora marveled at their effectiveness in turning the tide of battle with only a small contingent. From the ranks of the Kronos soldiers emerged a formidable adversary, a three-star aura knight, determined to confront Chris. However, before the knight could even raise his sword, Chris unleashed his flash technique, swiftly incapacitating the opponent with a single, decisive strike. The stage is set in the heart of the expanse of Kronos Empire, where the solitary figure of Roman stands as a defiant force against the encroaching Kronos soldiers. Count Fabius, a prominent figure in the Empire, watches in disbelief as Roman takes on the soldiers with unparalleled determination. Amidst the chaos, a messenger urgently approaches Count Fabius, bearing news of a perilous situation unfolding at the rear. Frustration etches Count Fabius's face as he commands the soldier to prioritize dealing with Roman, convinced that once Roman is subdued, the Kronos forces can swiftly address the looming threat at the rear. Little does Count Fabius know that Roman, sensing an opportunity, is already making his way towards him. As Roman advances, a sudden shift in the narrative unfolds. Gustavo, a seasoned commander and the leader of the Tenth Knight Squad of Kronos, emerges to thwart Roman's progress. Gustavo's reputation precedes him, ranked 78th in the continent and 35th within Kronos. His presence alone signifies the seriousness of the situation. The clash begins, with Gustavo utilizing his aura to create an impenetrable barrier, attempting to halt Roman's advance. Roman, however, seems undeterred. A momentary pause ensues as both warriors assess each other. Roman, recognizing Gustavo's strength, prepares for what promises to be a fierce confrontation. Gustavo, embodying the essence of a skilled knight, leaps into the air, brandishing his aura-infused sword. The battle unfolds with breathtaking intensity as Gustavo delivers a flurry of strikes, each imbued with the power of his aura. Roman, armed with his sword, defends against the onslaught with remarkable skill and agility. In a surprising turn of events, two Chrono soldiers attempt a sneak attack from behind, seeking to exploit a potential vulnerability in Roman's defense. To their dismay, Roman, in a display of incredible reflexes, spins around and swiftly dispatches the assailants with a single sweeping motion of his sword. The seamless transition from defense to offense leaves both soldiers incapacitated at Roman's feet. Gustavo, witnessing Roman's mastery over the situation, is taken aback by the resilience and skill displayed. The coordinated efforts of the Kronos soldiers, even under the command of a seasoned knight like Gustavo, prove insufficient to overpower Roman. In that moment, Gustavo recognizes the true threat that Roman Dimitri poses, a force to be reckoned with, more formidable than he had initially estimated. As the battle intensifies, Gustavo contemplates drastic measures. A growing sense of urgency grips him, and he entertains the idea of employing forbidden magic. The gravity of the situation prompts Gustavo to place his hand on his stomach, a precursor to tapping into a well of power that transcends conventional combat techniques. Roman, Observing Gustavo's peculiar actions, senses that something extraordinary is unfolding. The air around Gustavo shimmers with a distinctive yellow aura, signaling the deployment of innate energy. Innate energy, the life force one is naturally endowed with, remains beyond artificial accumulation. Roman's exhaustive studies across the continent unveiled no known method to harness this inherent power. The encounter with Gustavo, had it occurred a year prior, would have posed a grave threat. Gustavo's strikes aimed at Roman with full force, yet Roman deftly parried each blow, leaving Gustavo astonished by his skill. Employing the celestial evil technique, Roman executed the middle stage of the three-second stance, 
swiftly incapacitating Gustavo with a single precise strike. A dense cloud of smoke erupted, a testament to Roman Dimitri's overwhelming might, leaving Kronos' soldiers dumbfounded at their commander's defeat. Roman pressed forward, dislodging Count Fabius from his horse with a forceful kick. Count Fabius, sprawled on the ground, questioned Roman's audacity, reminding him of Count Partridge's esteemed status within the empire. Even amid the chaos of war, Count Fabius cautioned Roman about the repercussions of harming a noble of the empire, warning of a life forever shadowed by the empire's assassins. Undaunted, Roman asserted his awareness of the risks, silencing Count Fabius and sealing his fate. With resolute determination, Roman swiftly subdued Count Partridge as well, cementing his dominance over the battlefield. Meanwhile, in the rear lines, soldiers watched in awe as smoke billowed from the heart of the Kronos forces. Chris, radiating confidence, reassured Count Vanderberg, dispelling his fears of an impending catastrophe. Count Vanderberg, initially skeptical of Chris's assurance, noticed a green signal hovering in the sky, a beacon of Roman's triumph. The scene shifted to the opulent halls of the Cairo Royal Palace, where a soldier delivered pivotal news to King Daniel. Roman Dimitri had achieved a decisive victory over the Kronos forces in the Western Front. King Daniel's face lit up with a radiant smile as he received the news, his heart swelling with pride and relief. Without delay, he summoned Count Vanderberg via magical communication to glean further details. With a solemn tone, Count Vanderberg relayed the recent events in the Western Front. He recounted how, alongside Roman, they had successfully neutralized Count Fabius, a prominent Kronos commander, and apprehended the remaining Kronos troops. Curiosity peaked, King Daniel inquired about the toll on Cairo. Count Vanderberg's response painted a picture of minimal losses, attributed to Roman's strategic prowess and tactical brilliance. The king couldn't help but marvel at Roman's dedication and effectiveness on the battlefield, realizing that Roman had exceeded expectations and played a pivotal role in securing Cairo's safety. With a newfound sense of confidence, King Daniel resolved to handle negotiations with the Kronos Empire meticulously. He understood the delicate balance of power and the importance of diplomatic finesse in such turbulent times. Concerned about the well-being of Kronos Empire prisoners, King Daniel instructed his staff to ensure their safety, adamant about resolving the conflict without further bloodshed. The workers swiftly mobilized, heeding the king's orders with unwavering diligence. Meanwhile, on the western plains, Baron Noel approached Roman with humility and contrition. He bowed respectfully, expressing regret for his previous opposition to Roman's plans. Grateful for Roman's leadership and courage, Baron Noel sought to extend his apologies and gratitude. Roman, recognizing the sincerity in Baron Noel's words, acknowledged him as a man of integrity and honor. Despite accepting Baron Noel's apology, Roman imparted a crucial lesson on the dangers of blind trust and the chaos of battle. He emphasized the importance of diverse perspectives and opposing viewpoints in making informed decisions. Roman assured Baron Noel that his dissent had been necessary and valuable, fostering a deeper understanding between them. Baron Noel, moved by Roman's wisdom and generosity, shared news of Cairo's success in securing Kronos prisoners. He anticipated that this triumph would strengthen Cairo's position in negotiations with the Empire. However, Roman remained cautious, foreseeing challenges ahead. Drawing from his experiences and keen insight into the Empire's motives, Roman voiced skepticism about the likelihood of fruitful negotiations. In Roman's eyes, the Empire's history of aggression and expansionism suggested that negotiations would be fraught with difficulty. He warned Baron Noel of the Empire's probable insistence on unreasonable demands, especially in retaliation for the recent attack. In the intricate dance of international conflicts, the initial reasons for warfare may hold sway. But ultimately, it is the raw exercise of power that dictates outcomes. Roman's words cut through the tension, highlighting the stark reality that now faces the Empire. The fact that a comparatively smaller entity like Cairo has managed to defeat Kronos sends shockwaves through the ranks. Baron Noel, visibly shaken, turns to Roman seeking guidance on the next steps for Cairo. With measured resolve, Roman elucidates that to forge ahead, Cairo must confront the aftermath head-on. To retreat now would only invite further repercussions, so Cairo must brace itself for the next battleground, negotiation. Meanwhile, in the chambers of the Cairo Kingdom, Baron Charlton, a key figure in the Kronos Foreign Ministry, engages in a magical dialogue with King Daniel. Charlton, speaking with the weight of the Empire behind him, lays out Kronos' stance. He explains that Kronos' incursion into Cairo was instigated at the behest of Duke Benedict. However, 
With the fall of Benedict, Kronos had signaled its intention by withdrawing its forces. The actions taken by Cairo, however, exceeded the bounds of self-defense. The ruthless elimination of Count Fabius and Commander Gustavo, both esteemed figures in Kronos, painted a grim picture. King Daniel, while acknowledging Cairo's engagement in war, questions the morality of such brutal reprisals. Charlton, conceding the wrongful nature of Cairo's actions, demands recompense on behalf of the Empire. Yet, Daniel swiftly counters, reminding Charlton of Kronos's initial aggression. If fairness is to be discussed, Daniel implies, it must begin with an acknowledgement of Kronos's initial transgressions. He warns Charlton that Cairo will not shy away from international scrutiny should Kronos refuse to engage in reasonable discourse. Baron Charlton addressed King Daniel with a solemn tone, advising him to act as he pleased regarding the Cairo situation. Though acknowledging that Cairo might be holding prisoners, Baron Charlton made it clear that Kronos would not entertain negotiations. Instead, he presented King Daniel with a consequential choice. Roman Dimitri must sever one of his arms. Baron Charlton suggested that if Roman personally arrived at the Empire, offering his arm and kneeling in apology, the Empire would cease pursuing the matter. The revelation left King Daniel in a state of shock, grappling with the gravity of the decision before him. Baron Charlton, undeterred, emphasized that should Cairo refuse, it would escalate into a full-scale war between the two powers. Setting a 10-day deadline, Baron Charlton urged King Daniel to declare his stance within that time frame. Frustrated and contemplating the potential weakness of Cairo that subjected it to such humiliation, King Daniel found himself at a crossroads, with the fate of his kingdom hanging in the balance. As the magical call concluded, Count Bittner approached, bearing news that intensified the gravity of the predicament. Kronos' empire, it seemed, had shifted its focus to Roman Dimitri, deeming him a potential future threat. King Daniel, however, staunchly defended Roman, emphasizing his heroic stature and the deep loyalty he commanded among Cairo's citizens. The implicit threat against Roman struck a chord with the king, prompting a decisive course of action. In response to the unfolding crisis, King Daniel wasted no time. He ordered his workers to summon Roman immediately, recognizing the urgency of a direct discussion with the valiant warrior. The fate of Cairo hung in the balance and King Daniel sought Roman's counsel on navigating the treacherous waters of Kronos's demands. Two days later, as Roman stood before King Daniel, the gravity of the situation weighed heavily in the air. The king recounted the details of the Kronos negotiations, exposing the harsh realities of the ultimatum presented by Baron Charlton. With a sense of shared concern, King Daniel turned to Roman, seeking guidance on the next steps. Roman, his gaze unwavering, advised against accepting Kronos's proposal, highlighting the inevitable consequence of Cairo becoming a vassal state. Instead, he proposed a bold move, his personal journey to the empire to confront the issue head-on. The suggestion to send him as Cairo's envoy carried both a sense of determination and sacrifice. However, King Daniel hesitated, recognizing the dangers that awaited Roman in the heart of the empire. Kronos sought punishment for him, and in the worst-case scenario, Roman's life could be at stake. A palpable tension filled the room as the fate of Cairo hung in the balance. Count Parchus, seizing the moment, stepped forward with a thoughtful suggestion. Acknowledging the risks of sending Roman directly into the lion's den, he proposed an alternative. Someone capable of conveying Cairo's stance effectively could be dispatched to negotiate with Kronos, sparing Roman from the immediate threat. As preparations for the envoy to the Empire unfolded, King Daniel confronted Count Parchus with a critical decision. The king questioned whether Count Parchus was proposing to become the envoy himself. Count Parchus affirmed this proposition, expressing his readiness to represent Cairo and convey its stance to the formidable Kronos Empire. In considering Count Parchus for this pivotal role, King Daniel pondered the potential of this unexpected turn. Perhaps, he mused, Count Parchus was the right person for the task. Count Parchus, a prominent political figure in Cairo, possessed the acumen to read complex situations and make decisive decisions, a trait evident even during the time of Benedict. The fact that Count Parchus had aligned himself with Roman further underscored the authenticity of his capabilities. However, King Daniel, ever concerned for the safety of his subjects, voiced his apprehension. Entering the Kronos Empire held inherent risks, and the king queried whether Count Parchus was prepared to face such dangers. Count Parchus, with unwavering determination, assured King Daniel that he would exert every effort to execute the mission flawlessly. Turning to Roman for his perspective, King Daniel sought the warrior's opinion on this critical matter. 
The scene shifted to a corridor where Roman and Count Parchus traversed the corridors together. Roman, curious about Count Parchus's motivation, turned to him and inquired about the purpose behind volunteering as an envoy. Roman was keen to understand Count Parchus's aspirations and intentions in undertaking such a significant responsibility. Count Parchus's declaration to Roman was nothing short of candid. He acknowledged the inherent skepticism Roman might harbor towards a defector like himself. Yet, Count Parchus pledged his allegiance to Roman with unwavering determination. He made a solemn promise, asserting his desire to dedicate his life to serving Roman from that moment forth. Count Parchus saw the diplomatic mission as an opportunity to prove his loyalty, urging Roman to view his choice as a step towards cementing their bond. In a straightforward manner, Count Parchus made it clear that he didn't expect to be treated as one of Roman's trusted advisors. Instead, he sought to be utilized in a manner that would benefit Roman's interests. Count Parchus expressed a willingness to go to any lengths to live a life of power, wealth, and honor by Roman's side. His proposition was astonishingly frank, laying bare his ambitions and desires without reservation. Roman, initially taken aback by Count Parchus's candidness, couldn't help but feel a sense of admiration for the man's boldness. Count Parchus's request to be accepted as one of Roman's inner circle was a bold move, demonstrating a keen understanding of their lord-vassal relationship. Roman's smirk revealed his appreciation for Count Parchus's clarity of thought and purpose. Without hesitation, Roman accepted Count Parchus into his fold, assuring him that he would enjoy all the privileges and benefits that came with being one of Roman's trusted confidants. A few days later, as Count Parchus embarked on the diplomatic mission to Cairo, he found himself confronted by a family member's skepticism in a forest. The family member couldn't comprehend how Count Parchus could betray those he once served and still manage to survive. In response, Count Parchus offered a philosophical perspective on the nature of betrayal. He explained that there was a certain allure to betrayal, particularly when it involved aligning oneself with those in power. Count Parchus believed in serving alongside those who made bold sacrifices, even if it meant going against the hesitations of loyal subjects. To him, loyalty wasn't blind adherence, but rather a strategic alignment with those who had the power to shape destinies. The conversation between the man and Count Parchus took a reflective turn. The man suggested that strategically keeping defectors close and utilizing them could be advantageous. Count Parchus concurred, recognizing the potential benefits of seizing such an opportunity. He acknowledged that accepting a defector could be justified if it presented a chance to gain an upper hand. However, with a dismissive wave, Count Parchus halted the discussion, signaling an end to the lecture. Inwardly, Count Parchus contemplated his life as a defector. He admitted that living a life of betrayal was not something he enjoyed. He had chosen this path because he believed there was no one worthy of his unwavering loyalty. Yet, a flicker of amusement crossed his features as he considered the possibility that Roman Dimitri might be the exception to this rule. The scene shifted to the grandeur of the imperial capital, Alexander, where Count Parchus found himself in awe of the magnificence of the empire's castle. Led by a soldier, he observed the emblem on the soldier's armor shoulder, noting the remarkable spirit exuded despite the soldier belonging to the Seventh Knight Order, a testament to his strength surpassing that of Count Nicholas. Approaching the door of the Emperor's chamber, Count Parchus felt a wave of trepidation wash over him. As the door swung open, he felt as though he was stepping into a realm beyond mortal reach. Standing before the Emperor, Count Parchus was acutely aware of the gravity of the situation. He knew that a single misstep could have dire consequences. As Count Parchus's gaze met the formidable figure of the Emperor of the Kronos Empire, a weighty silence descended upon the room. The Emperor, his presence commanding, directed his attention towards Count Parchus, inquiring if he was indeed Roman Dimitri. Caught off guard by the intensity of the moment, Count Parchus found it difficult to draw a steady breath, let alone form coherent words. Just as Count Parchus gathered his thoughts to respond, the soldier accompanying him acted forcefully, pushing his face to the ground. The emperor, recognizing him as Roman Dimitri, confirmed the expectation that Roman was to present himself and offer his arm personally. Expressing understanding of Cairo's stance, the emperor wasted no time in delivering a decisive blow. He ordered Count Parchus to be taken down and declared war against Cairo. The weight of the emperor's words hung heavy in the air, casting a shadow over the room. In a desperate attempt to avert disaster, Count Parchus raised his voice, vehemently protesting that Cairo did not seek an all-out war. Count Parchus, displaying a bold front, humbly requested permission to address the Emperor of Kronos. 
He proposed that he would speak first and then willingly face any consequences the emperor deemed appropriate. The emperor, intrigued by this audacious move, cautioned Count Parchus to be mindful of his words, as failure to convince him might lead to dire outcomes. With this weighty understanding, Count Parchus embarked on a delicate speech, aiming to convey the legitimacy of Cairo's position while maintaining the dignity of both parties. Choosing his words meticulously, Count Parchus navigated the complex terrain of diplomacy. He asserted that the Kronos Empire's intervention in the civil strife lacked sufficient justification, emphasizing that five kingdoms, excluding Valhalla, stood in support of Cairo's stance. This assertion was not made lightly, as it carried the weight of multiple nations behind it. The scene then transitioned to a night where Roman shared strategic insights with Count Parchus. Roman foresaw that while an alliance with six kingdoms might secure victory in a frontal war, the real challenge lay in the aftermath, particularly in dealing with potential hostilities from Valhalla. Roman advised Count Parchus to highlight this concern, as it represented the most prudent choice for Cairo. Returning to the present, Count Parchus reiterated Cairo's pursuit of peace. He conveyed that if, under these circumstances, Kronos still desired war, the emperor could take action against him. Surprisingly, the emperor acknowledged the rationale presented by Count Parchus. In exchange for the release of Kronos' prisoners, he agreed to temporarily overlook the matter. However, the treatment of Roman Dimitri remained a separate issue. The emperor declared that an assassin would target Roman each night as a form of retribution for the deaths of Kronos' soldiers. This revelation left Count Parchus stunned, prompting a cascade of questions within his mind. Did the Emperor of Kronos harbor a hidden desire for an all-out war with Cairo from the outset? The Emperor of Kronos had a clear agenda to push Cairo into a corner by using the leverage of Roman Dimitri to secure the release of Kronos' prisoners, thereby restoring the Empire's prestige. This calculated move aimed to assert Kronos' dominance and regain lost ground on the political stage. The Emperor emphasized to Count Parchus that such tactics would no longer be effective in the future indicating a shift in strategy towards more direct and forceful approaches. Upon hearing this, Count Parchus couldn't help but feel a sense of disappointment. He had hoped to demonstrate his capabilities but realized that his efforts had fallen short. The realization dawned on him that the emperor's intentions had been far more complex than he initially perceived. The scene then shifted to Roman's office, where Count Parchus sought forgiveness for his perceived failure. To his surprise, Roman commended Count Parchus for his efforts assuring him that he had done well despite the difficult circumstances. Count Parchus, taken aback by Roman's response, questioned whether Roman had anticipated the outcome. In response, Roman explained that Kronos had always been singularly focused on Roman and that the threats against him were to be expected. Concerned for Roman's safety, Count Parchus inquired if Roman would be all right. Roman reassured him that he would handle the situation himself and advised Count Parchus not to worry. Gazing out of the window, Roman contemplated the perennial specter of assassination that seemed to weave itself seamlessly into Beck Young Hyuk's existence. In the recesses of his thoughts, Roman mused, pondering which agents of the Kronos Empire the Emperor would dispatch this time to carry out their ominous agenda. In the grand halls of the royal palace, a pivotal moment unfolded as King Daniel shifted the scene. With an air of gravity, he confronted Count Gregory, accusing him of jeopardizing the security of the Cairo Kingdom through his collaboration with the Kronos Empire. King Daniel, his regal presence undeterred, questioned Count Gregory about his involvement. Count Gregory, acknowledging his actions, pondered aloud whether his allegiance to the Kronos Empire was misguided. He pressed further, questioning if anyone in the kingdom was oblivious to his connection with the enemy. King Daniel, with a stern expression, declared that Count Gregory's admission alone branded him a traitor to the Cairo kingdom. Undeterred, Count Gregory retorted, suggesting that it might be the king who was gravely mistaken. He warned King Daniel that eliminating him on the spot would not go unanswered by the formidable Kronos Empire, whose emperor had already vowed revenge and blood. With conviction, Count Gregory urged King Daniel to reconsider his decision, proposing an alternative. Rather than face the consequences within the kingdom, he suggested that the king send him directly to the Kronos Empire, arguing that it would be a wiser choice for the safety of Cairo. As the tense exchange unfolded, King Daniel found himself contemplating Count Gregory's words. He acknowledged a thread of truth in the Count's assertions. Indeed, King Daniel had entertained the notion of executing all those with ties to the Kronos Empire. However, he now realized the potential consequences. Should Count Gregory face his fate, the wrath of the Kronos Empire might shift its gaze towards Roman Dimitri. In that charged moment, 
Roman interjected, expressing a pressing desire to speak. Addressing King Daniel directly, Roman revealed a chilling proclamation. The Emperor of Kronos had decreed that Roman would pay with his own blood. Yet, Roman swiftly diverted the conversation, emphasizing that this matter was distinct from Count Gregory's. Roman made a compelling argument, contrasting Count Gregory's significance with that of other figures. Unlike Count Fabius and Knight Captain Gustavo, Count Gregory held far less sway. Moreover, Roman asserted that the Kronos Empire's attention was already fixated on him. He reminded King Daniel that even if Count Gregory were eliminated, it would not alter the trajectory set in motion since the execution of Benedict. The era of Cairo's peace had come to an abrupt end. With conviction, Roman urged King Daniel to grasp the weight of the decision before him. The future of Cairo hung in the balance, as the weight of Roman's words settled upon King Daniel, a profound sense of indebtedness washed over him once more. Stepping forward, King Daniel conveyed the enduring gratitude of the Cairo royal family for Roman Dimitri's unwavering devotion. However, the gravity of the situation demanded a stern address. King Daniel asserted that Count Gregory's transgressions extended beyond mere collusion with the Kronos Empire, they tarnished the very honor of Cairo. Despite Count Gregory's attempts to interject, King Daniel silenced him, declaring that, as a traitor who had imperiled the kingdom, execution was the only just consequence. The scene transitioned to Cairo Plaza, where Count Gregory, reflecting on his foolishness, pondered an alternative course of action. Instead of attempting to win Roman over, he realized he should have treated Roman Dimitri as a potential threat to the empire. Undeterred, Count Gregory proposed to Roman that he still had the chance to pledge loyalty to the empire, emphasizing Roman's insignificance compared to the vast power of Kronos. He pointed out that Gustavo, the adversary Roman had faced, ranked only 78th within the continent, a stark reminder of the empire's formidable might. Count Gregory's voice carried a note of urgency as he continued to address Roman. He spoke of Valhalla, a realm where countless individuals possessed strength beyond even Roman's reckoning. He challenged Roman's belief in his ability to face these formidable adversaries alone, urging him to consider the consequences wisely. Even if Roman's dealings with the Kronos Empire concluded, Count Gregory warned, Valhalla remained a looming threat. He emphasized that if he were executed, Roman's ties with Valhalla would be irrevocably severed. Roman's response was unexpected. He calmly expressed anticipation for the impending confrontation. Count Gregory, taken aback, accused Roman of foolishness for willingly antagonizing the two most powerful factions on the continent. Thus, the stage was set for the downfall of Cairo's three factions. Meanwhile, within the confines of the royal palace, King Daniel turned his attention to Count Vanderberg. Praise filled his words as he commended the Count for his leadership on the Western Front Line, where he had successfully repelled the forces of the Kronos Empire. Amidst the chaos of the Kronos invasion, Count Vanderberg emerged as a beacon of valor, bringing honor to Cairo through his courageous actions. In recognition of his deeds, King Daniel bestowed upon him the prestigious title of Marquis, along with additional territory to govern. However, King Daniel's praise did not end there. He acknowledged the bravery of others who had fought tirelessly on the western front line against the Kronos onslaught. Baron Noel, Flora Lawrence, and Roman Dimitri were singled out for their remarkable contributions to the war effort. As a token of appreciation, King Daniel elevated their status and rewarded each with a generous sum of gold. Yet, it was Roman Dimitri's pivotal role that drew particular attention. King Daniel openly credited Roman and his family for their indispensable aid without which the royal faction might not have emerged victorious. The assembled nobles echoed their agreement, insisting that Roman deserved a more substantial reward for his invaluable service. However, few nobles hesitated. Despite Roman's undeniable importance, the nobles harbored concerns about granting him further power. Aware of the formidable strength already wielded by Dimitri's forces, nobles feared upsetting the delicate balance of power among the factions. Count Binner, sensing the tension in the room, intervened. With a firm voice, he urged the gathered nobles to cease their arguments and focus on the greater good. Count Bintner's voice cut through the murmurs of the gathered nobles, reminding them of Cairo Kingdom's painful history of betrayal. He cautioned against repeating past mistakes by selfishly pursuing individual gains at the expense of unity. King Daniel nodded in agreement, acknowledging the wisdom in Bintner's words. With a somber tone, King Daniel conceded that Roman Dimitri and his family posed a challenge beyond Cairo's containment. The war had unveiled the extent of the Dimitri family's power, surpassing even that of Cairo itself. Recognizing this reality, 
King Daniel proposed a shift in perspective. Rather than treating the Demetries as mere vassals, they should be acknowledged as allies, a nation in their own right. King Daniel saw an opportunity amidst the turmoil, an opportunity to redefine Cairo's image to the world. He envisioned a new era of cooperation and strength. To mark this historic moment, he announced that on the day the Dimitri family officially declared their dukedom, he would extend his personal congratulations. Thus, as the sovereign of Cairo, King Daniel bestowed upon the Dimitri family the esteemed title of duke, cementing their place as valued partners in the kingdom's future endeavors. King Daniel proclaimed the eastern region, encompassing the Dimitri's domain, as a dukedom. Thus, on this historic day, what was once mere countryside blossomed into the inaugural territory of the Dimitri's dukedom. The news rippled through the Cairo kingdom, igniting conversations far and wide about the remarkable deeds of Roman Dimitri. Not only had he quelled the factional discord that plagued Cairo for ages, but he had also defied the might of the Kronos Empire. Whispers filled the streets, pondering who could possibly stand against the indomitable Roman Dimitri. Even the king himself bore witness to Roman's prowess, leaving many to wonder about the extent of his strength. At an age where most struggled to leave their mark, Roman Dimitri stood on the cusp of unprecedented greatness. Speculation swirled, with many daring to dream that Roman, as a swordsman of Cairo, might ascend to the prestigious ranks of the top 50 for the first time in history. The magnitude of Roman's accomplishments reverberated across the continent, transcending borders and uniting people in awe. Regardless of nationality, all eyes turned to Roman Dimitri, a figure whose actions had rewritten the annals of history. As tales of Roman's exploits spread far and wide, even the wandering minstrels wove songs of his achievements. With each passing mention, the stature of the Dimitri family seemed to ascend ever higher into the boundless skies. Yet, the genesis of these rumors didn't emerge by happenstance. They traced back to a certain mansion nestled within Cairo. Within the confines of this mansion, a conversation unfolded between a butler and his master. The butler relayed news of the continent's burgeoning fascination with Sir Roman, noting how his renown was poised to transcend even Cairo's borders. The master, revealed to be Henry, expressed satisfaction at the unfolding events, deeming their plan a success. However, Henry's satisfaction was short-lived. In his eyes, their current achievements were but a fraction of what was yet to come. It had taken him two years to elevate a mere baronial family to the esteemed status of the Dimitri dukedom, but his ambitions extended far beyond Cairo's borders. Henry envisioned a grander stage where Roman Dimitri would be hailed as the hero of the entire continent. To realize this vision, Henry understood the need to amplify Roman's feats, ensuring they resonated across every corner of the land. Henry Albert reflected on the remarkable transformation his life had undergone. From the humble beginnings of gathering like-minded individuals interested in Roman's endeavors, Henry's influence had surged. Now, he found himself delivering lectures at the prestigious Cairo Royal Academy, an opportunity he could scarcely have imagined in the past. Teaching the children of esteemed families and receiving overwhelming responses to his lectures, Henry's household had shifted from fretting over financial concerns to basking in pride. At the Cairo Royal Academy, a pivotal encounter unfolded. The professor, deeply moved by Henry's lecture, confessed to feeling a surge of excitement within his heart. He credited Henry for shedding light on a crucial truth. It was the unwavering dedication of Cairo's heroes on the southern front line that safeguarded the city's populace. Thanks to Henry's insights, the professor gained a newfound appreciation for the sacrifices made by these valiant defenders. In a sudden flash of insight, Henry experienced a profound realization about life. The reason for the fervent fascination surrounding him was remarkably simple. People yearned to perceive Roman Dimitri through the lens of Henry Albert. Despite Henry's relative anonymity, his association with Sir Roman, particularly his communication with the royal family on Roman's behalf, elevated him to a status of greatness in the eyes of many. Henry understood that this admiration wasn't rooted in foolishness. Even esteemed figures like the professor from the Royal Academy held Henry in high regard. It seemed to be a primal instinct of humanity to seek connection and inspiration through those who championed heroes. Reflecting on history, Henry recognized that the legendary names known worldwide had gained their renown through the efforts of individuals like himself, ones who shared their heroic exploits with the world. From that moment onward, Henry's life mission crystallized before him to disseminate Roman's achievements far and wide, ensuring that his greatness echoed throughout the annals of history. Later, within the confines of his mansion, Henry contemplated the fact that he and Roman were not particularly close. Yet, 
For the sake of his own comfort and fulfillment, Henry felt compelled to shine a spotlight on the remarkable character of Roman Dimitri. Such was the way of life in this world, where destinies intertwined and choices defined fates. The scene transitions to the Dimitri territory, where Rodwell has returned to his hometown after an unspecified length of time. As he traverses the familiar streets, Rodwell reflects on the changes that have taken place in his absence. As Rodwell ventures into Dimitri territory, he settles into a quiet corner of a restaurant, observing the reverent chatter surrounding Roman's name. Amidst this atmosphere, Rodwell feels a sense of displacement, sensing that he no longer fits within the Dimitri fold. He grapples with the realization that he has strayed from his path. Contemplating his future, Rodwell understands that a decision must be made to either embrace his place within the Dimitris or to embark once more towards the western horizon. Abruptly, the scene transitions to Baron Romero's office, where both Roman and Rodwell have convened to meet their father. Baron Romero reveals the purpose behind summoning them, the impending succession of the Dimitri family. With the imminent transformation of the Dimitris into a dukedom, a new chapter is set to unfold for the family. Aware of the weight of their impending responsibilities, both Rodwell and Roman understand that the burdens upon their shoulders are about to grow heavier. Baron Romero was in a quandary about who should succeed the Dimitri family. Rodwell, his son, approached him with a surprising request. Rodwell expressed his wish to forfeit his right to succession. He believed Roman was better suited for the role. Rodwell made this decision thinking about the future of the Dimitri lineage. He asked his father to let him go. Baron Dimitri was taken aback by this revelation. Rodwell then requested some time for himself and left the room. Later, Romero Dimitri confided in Roman about how Baron Dimitri had once worried about burdening Rodwell too much. Coming from humble beginnings, the Dimitri family faced skepticism from other nobles. Baron Romero had noticed Rodwell's dedication to training with his sword, a sign of his determination to prove the doubters wrong. In the eyes of Baron Romero, Rodwell stood out among the rest, displaying exceptional qualities that hinted at his potential to carry the weight of the Dimitri legacy on his shoulders. Despite being in an age where most would indulge in youthful pursuits, Rodwell found himself burdened by the weight of his father's expectations. For Rodwell, who had dedicated his entire life to the service of the Dimitri family, this responsibility was both a privilege and a heavy mantle to bear. However, today marked a turning point. Baron Romero grappled with the difficult decision of informing Rodwell that he couldn't ascend to the position of successor. Though filled with regret, Baron Romero believed this choice was necessary for the future of the Dimitri lineage. Baron Romero confides in Roman, expressing his belief that Roman's ascension as successor would be the most fitting course of action. However, before Roman's eventual succession, Baron Romero humbly requests a favor. With a solemn tone, Roman urges his father to share his request. Baron Romero reveals that he wishes for Roman to take on the responsibility of caring for his brother, Rodwell, who has endured significant losses throughout his life. This poignant plea marks Baron Romero's final request to Roman, who is poised to inherit the leadership of the Dimitris. Roman, with a sense of duty, assures his father that he will do his utmost to fulfill this responsibility. The scene then transitioned to the Dimitri family's training grounds, where Rodwell was diligently honing his swordsmanship skills. However, a sense of dismay washed over him as he repeatedly missed his target. Despite his intentions to strike true, Rodwell found that his swings consistently fell short of their mark. At that moment, Roman entered the scene, observing Rodwell's struggles with a keen eye. He approached his brother with a gentle yet firm demeanor, explaining that simply aiming for the target wouldn't be sufficient in overcoming their adversaries. Roman pointed out that Rodwell's body movements had been ingrained through years of rigorous training, and the loss of one eye had altered more than just his vision. With empathy in his voice, Roman elaborated on the challenges Rodwell now faced, the distortion of distance perception and the uncertainty that stemmed from it. However, he urged Rodwell not to dwell solely on what he had lost. Instead, Roman encouraged him to harness the strengths he still possessed, emphasizing that adaptation and resourcefulness would be key in navigating this new reality. Rodwell's world was about to expand in ways he couldn't have imagined before. Roman assured him that with the right guidance, he could perceive a reality beyond what his eyes alone could reveal. This offer stirred something within Rodwell, prompting him to question Roman's motives with a hint of defiance. Why should I listen to you? Rodwell challenged, his tone edge with skepticism. He pressed Roman further, demanding to know why his brother cared so deeply for him, especially now that Roman had ascended to the position of successor. 
In a solemn conversation, Roman conveys to Rodwell that the Dimitri family has entered a new and precarious phase. They find themselves in disfavor with both Kronos and Valhalla, and the unpredictable nature of their intentions adds an element of uncertainty. Roman cautions Rodwell that the Kingdom Alliance's allegiance may not be unwavering until the very end, emphasizing the need for Dimitri to bolster its own strength for self-protection. Despite Roman's ability to navigate challenges independently thus far, he acknowledges the inevitability of reaching his limits with time. Contemplating potential conflicts, Roman expresses that if the Empire mobilizes its forces and attacks, he would be compelled to take the battlefield. In anticipation of such scenarios, Roman candidly suggests to Rodwell that, in his absence, he hopes his brother can assume leadership over Dimitri. This revelation leaves Rodwell momentarily stunned. In the southwestern expanse of the Salamander continent, the four kingdoms, Umberto, Redford, Odelia, and Frank, find themselves geographically adjacent to the expansive empires. Recognizing the need for collective security, they forged the Kingdom Alliance, a pact born out of the necessity for mutual defense. In the face of looming threats, they instinctively understood the significance of Roman Dimitri. A few days preceding the proclamation ceremony of the Duchy of Dimitri, the scene transitions to a conference room. Here, nobles from all four kingdoms have convened. Count Verdio, representing the Umberto Kingdom, addresses his counterparts gathered around the table. He recounted the recent turmoil in Cario, a rebellion of unprecedented scale, which Roman Dimitri had adeptly managed. Highlighting Rodwell's role in rallying the Southern Kingdom Alliance to brace for potential retaliation from the Empire, Count Verdio emphasized Roman's prowess not only in military might but also in strategic acumen. However, he cautioned that the stability of the Southern Kingdom Alliance was far from guaranteed. Count Verdio's voice resonated with conviction as he addressed the gathered nobles. He proposed a solution to secure the kingdom's independence, Roman Dimitri. Noting Roman's unmarried status, Count Verdio suggested the strategic move of arranging a marriage between him and the princess of Umberto. The king of Umberto pondered the suggestion but voiced concern about the princess's existing affections. Count Verdio, however, emphasized the urgency of the situation stressing that personal sentiments must be set aside in favor of seizing the opportunity at hand. Responding decisively, the king of Umberto bestowed Count Verdio with full authority over the matter, entrusting him with the responsibility of ensuring the success of the proposed union with Roman Dimitri. As time passed, the proclamation of the Duchy of Dimitri filled the air with jubilation, marking a joyous occasion for the realm. The festivities enveloped Dimitri in a vibrant atmosphere of celebration. In the halls of the Dimitri Palace, Duke Romero and his wife were greeted by Count Verdio. With a tactful yet assertive demeanor, Count Verdio broached the topic of Roman's marital prospects, suggesting that perhaps the time had come for him to consider marriage. With a twinkle of anticipation in his eye, Count Verdio proposed the idea of Roman marrying the Princess of Umberto. Known as the Treasure of Umberto, the princess possessed a rare blend of beauty and intellect, having graduated with flying colors from a renowned academy. Count Verdio envisioned a union between her and the finest scion of the Dimitri lineage as an ideal match. Suddenly, Count Ringo of the Redford Kingdom stepped forward, casting doubt upon the princess's supposed affections. He hinted at rumors suggesting her fondness for a man of lesser rank from a baron's family. Count Verdio, visibly taken aback by this revelation, questioned the credibility of such hearsay. Count Ringo then introduced himself to Duke Romero and his wife proposing alternative matches from Redford's noble families. Duke Martin of the Odelia Kingdom echoed this sentiment, triggering a chorus of suggestions from other nobles vying for Roman's hand in marriage. Amidst the escalating clamor, Duke Romero intervened, commanding attention with his authoritative voice. He declared his and his wife's disinterest in political alliances, preferring genuine affection over strategic unions. Duke Romero proposed a different approach, suggesting that rather than pressuring them, they should allow Roman to follow his heart. If a woman were to capture his son's affections, Duke Romero and his wife would extend their warm embrace to her, regardless of her noble lineage. The nobles exchanged knowing smirks as Duke Romero's declaration echoed through the chamber. Meanwhile, out on the terrace, Felix was approached by Baron Larson, representing the Kingdom of Franck. Baron Larson expressed the deep concern of Franck's ruler over the disappearance of the Phoenix Tower. He proposed a solution, suggesting that Felix consider returning to Franck, assuring him of full support henceforth. Baron Larson pledged his word once more on behalf of his kingdom. However, Felix met Baron Larson's offer with a firm rebuttal. 
He reminded the Baron of Frank's previous betrayal of the Phoenix Tower's trust. Undeterred, Baron Larson insisted that this time would be different and Frank would uphold its responsibilities. Yet, Felix remained resolute, rejecting the offer outright. He explained that the Phoenix Tower had found someone who valued their worth and had pledged their allegiance to the Dimitri family. With finality, Felix instructed Baron Larson to relay to Frank that the once strong bond between Frank and the Phoenix Tower was now severed. Inside the grand halls of the Dimitri Palace, Roman stood poised amidst the throng of guests, his gaze sweeping over the assembled nobility. His thoughts drifted to the noticeable absence of emissaries from the two mighty empires. Roman acknowledged the predictable reticence of Kronos, given their history of issuing assassination threats. As for the Valhalla Empire, Roman speculated that they likely wouldn't overlook the passing of Count Denver, especially considering their burgeoning ambitions for continental dominance. With the geopolitical landscape shifting towards an inevitable clash between empires and the Kingdom Alliance, Roman pondered the transient nature of their alliances with neighboring realms. He understood that while such partnerships served their current interests, ultimately, Cairo needed to bolster its own strength to withstand the encroaching imperial forces. In the midst of his contemplation, hence, the palace attendant entered the room, bearing news of an unexpected guest awaiting Roman's presence in the reception chamber. Surprised, Roman inquired if he had a scheduled meeting. Hans revealed that the visitor was none other than the prince from the kingdom of Hector. The scene transitions to the reception room, where Edwin warmly greets Roman. With genuine admiration, Edwin congratulates Roman on the establishment of the Duchy of Dimitri, praising his swift resolution of the rebellion in Cairo and his remarkable victory over the Kronos Empire. Roman, ever direct, cuts through the pleasantries, prompting Edwin to get to the heart of the matter. Acknowledging Roman's straightforward approach, Edwin admits that he hadn't anticipated their reunion outside the battlefield. Without preamble, Edwin reveals the startling revelation, there was a clandestine force behind the war between Hector and Cairo. He explains that Hector had initiated the conflict in response to years of failed harvests, a motive with no justification. However, following the war's conclusion, evidence emerged suggesting that the poor harvests had been deliberately engineered. As the land darkened and reports surfaced of an abundance of animal carcasses, Edwin somberly informs Roman of the ominous signs of a necromancer's curse. He emphasizes the perilous nature of delving into the realm of black magic, cautioning against humanity's involvement in such forbidden arts. Delving deeper into the matter, Edwin reveals that Hector's investigation uncovered a disturbing pattern. Hector's investigation has unearthed a startling revelation. A decade ago, the Kronos Empire experienced similar agricultural hardships to those in Hector. Edwin discloses to Roman that the Kronos Empire deliberately concealed this information, only to later confirm that these anomalies were the result of sinister black magic experiments. Moreover, the Empire harbors ambitions to fully subjugate the northern territories of the continent, initiating a formal campaign of conquest. Edwin emphasizes to Roman that this threat transcends Hector's borders. It could very well pose a future danger to the Duchy of Dimitri. To counter the burgeoning ambitions of the Kronos Empire, Edwin proposes a united front, urging Dimitri and Hector to forge an alliance. Edwin approached Roman with news of the Hector Kingdom's desire to align with the Dimitris. Roman, unsurprised, remarked that he had anticipated this development. Edwin couldn't help but marvel at Roman's foreknowledge, considering Hector's intelligence had only recently gleaned the information. Roman casually mentioned that his own sources had already hinted at the possibility given the clear advantage one could see in a conflict between Hector and Cairo. However, Roman questioned why he should entertain Hector's proposal. Edwin, taken aback, inquired if Roman was outright rejecting his offer. Roman clarified that his concern lay with Hector's capability to propose such a pact, given their current predicament. With Hector cornered and struggling to rehabilitate their arid lands, the limited aid from the Heavenly Palace wasn't sufficient for Edwin to fully address the issue. Cutting to the chase, Roman urged Edwin to skip redundant explanations and instead focus on why he should consider an alliance. With a penetrating gaze, Roman pressed Edwin to justify the merits of their collaboration. Edwin's expression shifted to one of surprise, then he countered Roman's skepticism by acknowledging Hector's current vulnerability. However, he couldn't grasp why Roman would engage in a war where Hector would merely be an adjunct to Roman's efforts. Edwin speculated that Hector's plan seemed to align too neatly with the Dimitri's agenda of forging alliances among kingdoms. 
Roman conceded Edwin's point, affirming that unity was imperative in the face of the common adversary, the Empire. Yet, he probed Edwin further, questioning his faith in the Kingdom Alliance and whether he could commit to it until the end. Roman hinted at his own ability to dismantle such alliances, likening them to fragile sand castles. In a philosophical tone, Roman reflected on the complexities of human relationships, emphasizing the inherent mistrust humans harbor towards outsiders, contrasting it with the trust they place in their own circles. Roman elaborated further, painting a picture of the Umberto kingdom's precarious position on the front lines, facing the looming threat of Kronos. He emphasized the toll of continuous losses on Umberto, destabilizing its internal affairs. With Umberto's vulnerability laid bare, Roman expressed his intent to exploit it, aiming to coax Umberto out of the Kingdom Alliance. He delved into the woes of Redford, where the king's penchant for gambling had depleted the nation's coffers. Even attempts by his vassals to salvage the situation had led them to seek aid from the Golden Bank. Roman hinted at the possibility that betrayal might be the only solution for the debt-stricken Redford. Roman questioned whether Edwin believed Frank and Odelia, the other members of the Alliance, were any different. Both kingdoms had long-standing grievances with Cairo, yet while Cairo had achieved stability by purging its factions, Roman doubted that Frank and Odelia could replicate such resolution. He underscored the vulnerability of the four kingdoms within the alliance, easy targets for Kronos aggression. Edwin's surprise lingered as Roman extended his analysis to include Hector. Yet, Edwin couldn't help but acknowledge the truth in Roman's assessment. The Kingdom Alliance was indeed fragile, its collapse imminent, like a sandcastle at the mercy of the tide. Roman asserted that unlike other kingdoms, Hector's intentions seemed genuine, driven by a desire for revenge against Kronos. However, he questioned whether Hector held any tangible value in its weakened state. Roman pressed Edwin once more, challenging him to justify why the Demetres should align with Hector. Edwin's response was laced with a mixture of resignation and acceptance of the grim reality. He acknowledged the cruelty of the situation, recognizing that Hector's internal decay was inevitable. However, he argued that Hector's determination for revenge couldn't be dismissed, even if they weren't fit to lead the charge. Edwin countered Roman's inquiry with a somber reminder that wars demanded sacrifices, even from the Demetres. In the harsh calculus of conflict, there would inevitably be those who served as sacrificial lambs to pave the way forward. Edwin made a solemn vow that Hector would always occupy the forefront of the impending war. He contrasted Hector's resolute stance with the superficial appearance of unity within the Kingdom Alliance, suggesting to Roman that an alliance with Hector, driven by a clear objective, would be more advantageous. Roman's response was a smirking acknowledgement, followed by a cryptic reminder for Edwin to recall the commitment he had just made. As Edwin departed, he reflected on his initial encounter with Roman on the battlefield, realizing he had encountered an unpredictable force that he had never encountered before. Despite his tireless efforts in the Heavenly Palace, Edwin recognized Roman as an unexpected variable, a status he aspired to achieve himself, Edwin harbored confidence that Hector would evolve into a force stronger than its current state. Meanwhile, Roman observed the burgeoning power emanating from Edwin, recognizing a significant transformation. Even if Hector contained only Edwin within its ranks, Roman deemed it valuable enough to integrate into his plans. A week later, the scene shifted to the Lawrence Palace, where Flora conversed with an elderly mage. She recounted the aftermath of the recent battle in Cairo explaining how Roman Dimitri had dismantled Benedict's castle to swiftly suppress the rebel army. Flora noted the risks inherent in Roman's decisive action, warning that prolonged conflict would have likely drawn in the Empire faction to bolster the rebellion's ranks. The elderly mage nodded in understanding, attributing Roman's bold move to the influence of the Phoenix Magic Tower. He emphasized the strategic imperative of quashing the rebellion swiftly, as allowing it to persist would only benefit their adversaries. Turning to Flora, he sought her opinion on Roman's choice to open the castle gates. In response, Flora questioned the necessity of endangering the western front line with such a risky maneuver. The old man concurred with Flora's assessment, acknowledging the perilous nature of Roman's decision. Nevertheless, he revealed Roman's confidence in his ability to vanquish Knight Captain Gustavo, 
underpinning his audacious strategy, the old man imparted to Flora a profound truth. War was a realm where experiences unattainable in books were forged. He explained that even perilous decisions or situations could sometimes be the catalyst for turning the tide of battle. He emphasized the thin line between recklessness and boldness, underscoring how, in this conflict, Roman Dimitri's prowess was instrumental in shaping the outcomes. Flora found herself taken aback by this insight. As the scene transitioned to the exterior of the castle, Count Lawrence approached Flora. He expressed his understanding of Flora's desire to learn war tactics and offered heartfelt encouragement. Yet, despite his support, Count Lawrence couldn't conceal his apprehension about Flora's decision to head to the Western front line. With genuine concern, Count Lawrence confessed to Flora that not a day had passed without him fearing for her safety. He pleaded with her to reconsider and return home. In response, Flora reassured her father, explaining that her time on the Western front line had enriched her with invaluable experiences. Each time the Kronos Empire breached Cairo's borders, devastation followed in its wake. Flames consumed the land, and lives were lost. In those harrowing moments, Flora felt powerless, compelled to witness the horrors of war unfold before her eyes. She realized that war had ceased to be a distant concept. It had become an undeniable reality. Determined to confront this reality head-on, Flora resolved to immerse herself in every facet of the conflict, seeking growth and understanding with each experience. She knew that she must prepare herself fully for the trials ahead. Turning to her father, Flora made her intentions clear. She intended to enlist in the Dimitri's army. The scene transitioned to Roman's office, where Chris inquired about Roman's intentions regarding Flora. Roman regarded Flora as a valuable asset, but he hesitated to integrate her into his army immediately. He instructed Chris to convey to Flora that if she participated in a week of rigorous training, and proved her suitability for the Dimitri's army, he would officially accept her. Chris acknowledged Roman's directive, but inwardly he grappled with the realization that this offer was tantamount to rejection in his mind. As dawn broke, the training grounds bustled with activity as Dimitri soldiers engaged in their morning run. Among them, Flora pushed herself to keep pace, incredulous at the hour-long duration of the run. She found the intensity overwhelming, but she held on to the hope that it would soon conclude. However, to her astonishment, the soldiers continued to run without respite. Chris announced that soldiers would be ranked based on their arrival order, urging them to give their utmost effort. Flora's determination surged as she braced herself for the demanding challenge ahead. As the soldiers and Chris picked up their pace, Flora found herself lagging behind, struggling to keep up. Pausing to catch her breath, she realized that the soldiers had no choice but to press on. After completing the run, Chris addressed the soldiers, urging them to abandon the notion that they would always enter battle fully prepared. He stressed the importance of pushing themselves to their limits every day, emphasizing that stamina training was essential for all, regardless of rank. He underscored the necessity of building endurance to navigate diverse terrains and endure until the end. Finally completing her running training, Flora couldn't shake the feeling that Chris's words had been directed at her. However, she took solace in the fact that she had already undertaken her own stamina training prior to joining the Dimitris. Enduring a one-hour warm-up run and a mountain run of equal duration constituted her basic training regimen. As Chris announced the next phase of training, sword sparring, Flora steeled herself for the challenge ahead. Amidst the flurry of sparring soldiers, Chris offering words of wisdom. He emphasized the importance of efficiency in combat, highlighting the pivotal moment when fatigue became an adversary as heavy as any chain. It was then, he declared, that the true test of skill began. Meanwhile, Flora found herself resting under the cool shade of a tree, observing the soldiers training with surprise. She marveled at the intensity of the Dimitri soldiers' routine, contrasting it with the belief that excessively harsh training breeds discontent. Yet, the soldiers before her seemed to exude enthusiasm rather than resentment. Despite her initial astonishment, Flora resolved not to falter. She acknowledged that adapting to the rigorous stamina training would take time, but she remained steadfast in her determination. Giving up was not an option. Days later, the scene shifted to the training grounds under Roman's command. As Chris reported to Roman, 
he praised Flora's unwavering determination to complete the training despite her stamina limitations. While her archery skills exceeded the average, Flora struggled in close combat and needed improvement in that regard. Chris also highlighted Flora's remarkable success in combat strategy training on the third day, where she emerged victorious in nine out of ten encounters, often employing unexpected tactics. Curious, Roman queried Chris about his perspective on Flora's value to the Dimitri faction. Without hesitation, Chris affirmed his belief that Flora Lawrence was indeed an asset the Dimitri faction required. Upon hearing Chris's confidence in Flora, Roman couldn't help but smirk, acknowledging the potential significance of her presence. Meanwhile, the narrative transitioned to the Dimitri Castle alleyway, where Thomas accidentally collided with a cloaked figure. Named Sierra, the Kronos commander and a Korch vice master, stepped forward with purpose. She instructed his subordinates to proceed with their plan that very night, urging them to remain discreet and gather intelligence on the Dimitri's security measures. Hidden in the shadows, Sierra's subordinates nodded in silent acknowledgement. The scene shifted to the Dimitri Plaza, where Sierra sat on a bench, assessing the formidable security measures in place. She hadn't anticipated the level of energy exhibited by the Dimitri's ordinary soldiers, likening it to that of knights. Sierra contemplated the risks involved, acknowledging the perilous nature of their mission. Survival within Dimitri's territory was far from guaranteed. One of Sierra's subordinates approached, reporting their observations of the iron mine. They cautioned Sierra that if their plans went awry, the Dimitri's security could be mobilized within a mere five minutes. Furthermore, they emphasized the presence of numerous skilled individuals within the territory, advising Sierra and his team to exercise heightened caution. Upon hearing his subordinates report, Sierra pondered the extent of the Dimitri's preparation in response to the Kronos Empire's declared assassination plan. She found the situation intriguing, contemplating the thrill of successfully bypassing the defenses to reach Roman Dimitri. Such an achievement promised an exhilarating experience beyond words. With resolve, Sierra instructed her subordinates to inform the rest of the guild members that the plan would proceed as scheduled without deviation. As night fell, all the guild members assembled, ready to execute their mission. Addressing his comrades, Sierra set a tight time frame of 15 minutes to infiltrate the castle. She asserted her leadership role, confident in their abilities. Despite Roman Dimitri's prowess on the battlefield, Sierra believed that her guild members were the true predators of the night. Enveloped in their magic artifact invisibility cloaks, Sierra and her cohorts stealthily advanced towards the entrance of the Dimitri castle, poised to strike. As Sierra spotted two soldiers patrolling nearby, she seized the opportunity to strike. Moving swiftly, she attempted to launch a surprise attack from behind. However, to her astonishment, one of the soldiers managed to block Sierra's assault with deft skill. In a swift motion, the soldier activated a magical signal, alerting others to the presence of intruders near the castle walls. Realizing they had been discovered, both soldiers prepared to engage Sierra in combat. Sierra stood frozen, stunned by the realization that their infiltration had been compromised. As Sierra's deception unraveled, she hastily commanded her underlings to dispatch the guards and flee the scene. However, just as the tension peaked, a figure emerged, revealing himself as Lucas, the master of the house sect. Sierra's mind raced as she connected the dots, recognizing the house sect as the renowned information guild operating in Cairo. With a mix of apprehension and curiosity, Sierra confronted Lucas, questioning his unexpected presence. Lucas, unfazed, calmly disclosed his knowledge of Sierra and her subordinates trespassing into the Dimitri territory weeks prior. He revealed his intricate web of connections, citing instances where Sierra had unknowingly crossed paths with his organization's members, the fruit stall vendor, the blacksmith, the iron miner, even the beggars, all acting as spies for the Dimitri. The gravity of the situation dawned on Sierra as she realized the imminent danger of remaining in Dimitri's domain any longer. Swiftly, she commanded her subordinates to create an escape route. But before they could react, their adversaries struck with swift precision, incapacitating Sierra's forces in a matter of moments. Sierra stood frozen, disbelief etched into her features as Lucas issued his ultimatum. With a calm demeanor that belied the imminent danger, 
Lucas granted Sierra a mere ten seconds to plead her case. Before Sierra could utter a word, Lucas surged forward, his movements fluid and lethal, dispatching her with a single, decisive strike. The scene then shifted to the inner sanctum of Dimitri's castle, where Ilya, known as the sword of the assassination guild Akorch, prowled with lethal intent. Ilya, a master of her craft, had successfully executed all her assigned missions, targeting influential figures with precision. As she stealthily entered Roman Dimitri's chamber, Ilya's thoughts fixated on her latest mark. Roman, the subject of countless rumors across the continent, lay oblivious in slumber. Assessing his rhythmic breathing, Ilya calculated that he had been asleep for approximately an hour. Contemptuously, she deemed him a fool, unaware of the impending threat. With a practiced hand, Ilya cast a spell, immobilizing Roman and sealing his fate. As Ilya poised herself to strike Roman, the unexpected happened. He awoke, questioning her intentions. Disregarding his inquiry as futile, Ilya lunged forward, only to find her attack effortlessly deflected by Roman's swift finger. Shock rippled through Ilya as she beheld Roman's sudden display of power. A formidable aura emanated from Roman, leaving Ilya momentarily stunned by its intensity. Closing the distance, Roman delivered a powerful punch, but before he could follow through, Ilya invoked her escape spell, conjuring a blinding light that granted her a swift exit from Roman's grasp. Outside, Ilya's thoughts raced as she sprinted away, recognizing the inevitable failure of her mission, even with the combined efforts of the Akorch Guild. Survival now took precedence. In her flight, she caught sight of Chris at the end of the street, his aura a deadly weapon as he effortlessly dispatched members of the Akorch Guild with a single strike. Seeing Chris, Ilya realized he was the figure the Guild had sought to avoid. The infamous Kairos Flash, a force to be reckoned with. Doubts crept into Ilya's mind. Had Dimitri somehow anticipated the Akorch Guild's plans? As Ilya sprinted towards an alternate escape route, her mind racing with urgency, she knew she had to evade capture through the path her fellow guild members had secured. Meanwhile, on the other side, Kevin stood poised against the remaining members of the Akorch Guild. With effortless skill, he swiftly dispatched each one until only Ilya remained. In a desperate attempt to overcome Kevin, Ilya launched herself into an attack, but Kevin's reflexes were too sharp. With a single, decisive strike, he incapacitated Ilya, leaving her to rue the guild's ill-fated decision to undertake such a perilous task. A week later, the scene shifted to Lucas's interrogation room, where Ilya found herself divulging information under his scrutiny. Lucas, understanding the gravity of their situation, chose to spare Ilya as a warning to the Akorch Guild about the repercussions of defying Dimitri. He revealed that Lord Roman had fled to the Kronos Empire a week prior, prompted by Dimitri's discovery of the Guild's base. Realizing the imminent danger facing her guild, Ilya's focus shifted to their survival. The scene transitioned to the Akorch Guild base. On the magical communication link, Braham, the master of the guild, found himself conversing with Baron Charlton of the Kronos Empire. The Baron's words dripped with skepticism as he mentioned the passing week, hinting at the possibility of mission failure. Undeterred, Braham implored the Baron to exercise patience, urging Kronos to maintain faith in the Akorch Guild. Reluctantly conceding, Baron Charlton agreed to withhold judgment, albeit warning of the dire consequences should failure be confirmed. As the magical call concluded, Braham's thoughts turned inward. No contact had been established with the Akorch Guild members dispatched to Dimitri, leading him to entertain the grim possibility of mission failure. Faced with the looming threat of losing Kronos Empire's support, Braham resolved to take drastic measures. He decided to halt all other missions and rally his guild members to concentrate their efforts on Roman Dimitri. It was a desperate gamble, but one they couldn't afford to ignore. In a twist of fate, as Braham contemplated his next move, Roman loomed ominously behind him, sending a shiver down his spine. The unexpected presence left Braham stunned and apprehensive of the impending confrontation. With a swift motion, Braham hurled daggers towards Roman, but his attack was met with an unexpected defense. Roman summoned his aura, weaving it into a protective barrier that intercepted the projectiles. 
Stunned by Roman's display of power, Bram hesitated, his hand hovering over the emergency button. Before he could react, Roman surged forward, seizing Bram in a vice-like grip. With a grim determination, Roman declared his discovery of the Accorch Guild's leader. Bram, reeling from the realization that Roman had breached the Empire's territory to apprehend him, couldn't help but marvel at the audacity of his adversary. In a daring move, Roman preempted Bram's attempt to summon aid by activating the emergency alarm himself. As the shrill sound filled the air, Bram warned Roman of the impending onslaught of assassins drawn by the alarm. He questioned whether Roman truly believed he could withstand such a formidable force alone. Unfazed, Roman calmly revealed the grim reality of their situation. With only 30 soldiers left at the Accorch base, excluding those on missions, their defensive capabilities were severely limited. Bram's apprehension deepened as he realized the dire straits they were in. Bram's shock was evident as Roman revealed his thorough grasp of the Accorch forces. Roman's declaration that he had neutralized the soldiers stationed at the base sent a chill down Bram's spine. With brutal efficiency, Roman hurled Bram against the wall, the impact leaving him dazed. As Bram struggled to regain his bearings, Roman seized the documents detailing the Accorch Guild's missions. Roman's keen intellect pieced together the Guild's intricate web of targets, revealing their allegiance to the Kronos Empire. Beyond mere assassination attempts against himself, Roman discerned the Empire's broader intentions from the Guild's list of targets, including Umberto's eldest son and the magnate of Redford. Recognizing the Empire's plans, Roman's gaze hardened with resolve. Meanwhile, the scene shifted to the Cairo branch of the assassin Guild Dante, where Ilya returned to find her subordinates. Urgency etched in her voice. She ordered an immediate contact attempt with the Accorch Guild via magical communication. However, their calls went unanswered, prompting a growing sense of unease within Ilya. Sensing that something was amiss, she braced herself for the unfolding crisis. If the Accorch Guild failed to respond, the next logical step for Ilya was to reach out to their client. With a sense of urgency, she directed her subordinate to initiate contact with Kronos. During the magical communication with Baron Charlton, the Baron's somber tone hinted at disappointment. He remarked that it appeared the plan had faltered. Undeterred, Ilya relayed the grim truth. Roman Dimitri had foreseen the Accorch Guild's scheme and laid a trap. Moreover, he had breached borders to assail the Accorch headquarters. Baron Charlton's response was blunt. He inquired if there was more to the report, leaving Ilya shocked by the implication.